you all here. It's fantastic to be getting back to doing these things in person, face to face again. So uh, I don't know about you, but I've, I struggled with, uh, certainly with the second part of lockdown personally. And it's fantastic that we're now, you know, I've been going to the cathedral this week for graduation ceremonies, which we, we've been robbed of for the last couple of years, and then we can do events like this today. So, uh, so welcome, and it's great to see you all here. Uh, just a few, well, you're all familiar with the building, so we don't need to do the usual church notices about fire alarms and, uh, and uh, toilets. If fire alarm goes off, leave the building, as we've been trained to do on many, on many occasions. Um, so there's a, there's a packed agenda today. Uh, I'm going to dip in and out. Please don't be offended if I disappear when you're doing your presentation. It's just the several other things. It's not that I'm not interested several other things in my in my calendar for today okay so we have a panel of judges at the at the back there who will be uh, looking at the uh, presentation so there is a, a competitive element to this all the presentations I think you know this anyway they are being live streamed uh, so the default is that your your presentation and your your presentation will be live streamed unless unless you say otherwise if you say otherwise it, it won't be but uh, if you remain silent, you're, you're broadcasting to the nations, okay? Um, fish and chip van at lunchtime is in the back car park, I think. I'm looking for a nod, is that right? Yes, so, so you all get paid for lunch. And we have over in the um, Higginson building in the atrium area there, I, I guess you all know it anyway, posters. So please, in the breaks and at lunchtime, have a look at the posters as well so that you can uh, update yourself with uh, what it is you're peers and fellow students are up to at the moment. Okay, so I don't think there's any, I don't think I've forgotten anything there, have I? No, nope. so I think we'll uh, hand over for the start of the first session. I'm not sure, I'm not sure who I hand over to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning. So please let's welcome the first presenter, Mr. Zhu Zhang. I appreciate you are listening to my presentation. Before uh, the presentation, I want to ask you a question. Why do you want to do research? How do you want to do research? To what extent do you think you are an innovative researcher? I know what you are thinking. That is not a question. That is a serious question. To be an innovative researcher, you should be a serious questioner, not a follower. But if, but even if you are a follower, it doesn't mean you can neither challenge authorities. I'm passionate, passionate about research work, and I'm always looking for innovative ideas to bring to my project. When I started my PhD journey, I have two ways to choose. One is to explore the existing model with new data. And another is to develop a new model. Developing a new model seems impossible because I was told there is no general physical model but my enthusiasm and self-motivation toward innovative research helped me to achieve that goal. The first model I developed has been published in a relevant HRD journal. Today I will introduce my second model. It is entirely original.
Oh, sorry. I just uh, feel it uh, exciting. Feel excited. Uh, my passion uh, motivates me to think creatively and produce striking results. And I hope you can achieve your goals and have a great journey at Durham University. My present title is a novel energy law separation model for green energy electrical steel. Of course, you will think that is an old model for green uh, uh, old, not, uh, not, uh, old energy law separation model. Here it is. The total energy loss under sinusoidal flux density and the power frequency can be divided into three components. Namely, the hysteresis, the static hysteresis loss, the classical eddy current loss, access loss. It has been shown that the access loss is responsible for approximately 40% of the total loss of geostills. Before you want to use a model to conduct your research, you need to prove it is correct, and you need to understand that model. First, I need to explore the old model. We can understand the first two components meaning from their name, but why did they call the third component access loss And I found different references gave different explanations for access laws. There's two famous uh, physics science, scientists, uh, Sir Joka and Batoti. They gave different fatal meaning for access laws. I don't think both of them are correct because they are completely different. What am I going to do about it? I need to explore the energy loss components, physical meanings. So I propose a new assumption that the hysteresis force results from the mag uh, magnetization coupling effect. Accordingly, the magnetic field is divided into three components. Hysteresis force, at current force, and the magnetization force. The hysteresis force is the <coughs> magnetization coupling effect at the reversal turning point, and the eddy current field is the counter field generated by the eddy current. The magnetization field is the force to push the demand wall and rotate the demand moment. And the magnetization force aligns the atomic magnetic moment in its direction. So the magnetic loss can be divided into three proportions. This raises laws and current laws and magnetization laws. The hysteresis field from the coupling effect of the magnetization and the magnetization itself will form a kind of energy to determine the hysteresis laws needed to be compensated to continue the reversal turning point. When the history field is generated, the history loss can be calculated. Uh, you use the uh, equation uh, WH and WE is uh, calculated for uh, eddy current loss and WM is a uh, magnetization loss. This equation are completely origin. I derived the, all the equation, and they have 
different physical mediums compared to the old model. The example is calculated for the geo scales and magnetic high scale at 50 hertz and the peak flux density at 1.5 tesla. We, we can compare the figures, it's completely different with the old model. Uh, oh, I, I, I didn't uh, uh, copy the old model's uh, figures, but the, 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 this is the uh, uh, proportions. But the figures we can see from here, the hysteresis is generated at the tips, and the, at the current is a, is a kind of oral figure. The energy loss component of it is worth noting that, like the old model, the new model is limited to low magnetizing frequencies. The energy loss components calculated for, for geosteels and magnetizing frequencies from 25 hertz to 100 hertz and peak flux density from 1 tesla to 1.7 tesla is uh, listed here. Then the following conclusion can be reached. The purpose of the derivation of a novel model of energy law separation in magnetic core laws is to facilitate the understanding of the physical mechanism of magnetization processes of ferromagnetic materials. The modeling results suggest a significant advance in studying the separation principle of geosteels and underpin a new theory describing the hysteresis, physical origin. So far, I have discussed the energy <coughs> law separation model for green artificial skills. Uh, I really appreciate your time to listen to my presentation. Any questions are welcome. The more the better. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy if I can continue my research. If I couldn't, I, I can do anything. I, uh, actually, it, uh, it doesn't matter for me, like, because um, I have a lot of hobbies. I, 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 I like, uh, <laughs> I like uh, <laughs> uh, friction, I like, uh, like uh, culture, uh, anthropology, and I, I like culture. Um, I'm, I'm teaching myself culture. <laughs> uh, I, I want to I do something else if I can not continue my research. So it doesn't matter. But I hope I can continue my research. At least I, I want to uh, uh, complete the, this theory. And uh, because this theory is completely new, and uh, like I said, there are a lot of famous scientists that they have different opinions about the uh, magnetic material theory. And I bring a new theory, and I hope someday some people can recognize it. And uh, I hope uh, all of you can have a big achievement uh, after you get your PhD degree and have a Bright future.
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Samira Guerrero. I'm going to present you my project that is the CFD analysis of the convection uh, heat transfer from a solar um, panels array. So first of all, the, um, the task for my project uh, initially was to find a cooling method for, um, well, to, I needed to improve the, or to find a solution for the cooling on a solar panel. So at the beginning, I, the proposal was using the passive uh, airflow that flows around any um, object. So uh, I found out that that was um, a topic that was highly researched. But something that I found out is that when you talk about the solar array, that is something that wasn't available. There was any information um, at, the, at the moment talking about the relationship <coughs> of the <coughs> convection on a whole array. So this is why I got into this project. So first of all, I'm going to uh, talk about the, these different points. The first, of, the first one is the introduction. Then I'm going to move uh, to my model that, I, that I'm proposing. Uh, the CFD results that I collect from this model and the analysis that I did for the heat uh, transfer um, uh, coefficient and the conclusions that I have uh, so far at this point in my project. So moving on, we have the introduction, something that we need to know and the importance of this uh, cooling that I am uh, proposing for my project is that a solar panel uh, efficiency decreases 0.5% for every degree that reaches the maximum temperature capacity that a solar panel has. So knowing this, it's really important to cool it, um, to cool down the solar panels, knowing that that will improve the energy that we can extract from, from them. Then, as I said, there are previous experiments and different papers that talks about the uh, heat transfer on the solar panels. But these, um, these papers or these researches focus on a single solar panel and what is going to be the effect if you use different uh, cooling methods. That is the next uh, point that, that I'm going to talk. The cooling methods that we have uh, are divided in passive, uh, cooling, uh, passive cooling and active, active uh, cooling. The active one, as the name says, it's uh, when you have an, an external energy source that helps you to decrease the temperature. It will be uh, water sprinkles, that is one of the most uh, used in, in the industry. And, um, and in the experiments that, that uh, some researchers have conducted, they use fans to cool down the solar panels and see the, the distribution of the temperature. But there's another, um, the other method is using the passive, uh, the passive cooling. That means that you are going to use the, the airflow that flows naturally um, on the solar panels. Um, in this case, uh, most of the studies that they, the, of the most of the of the papers they talk about uh, head fins as as, as a um, source to. Uh, this disperse the temperature that we are going to have on a solar panel. So knowing this, we can talk about what is going to happen when you have multiple solar panels in a whole array. In this case, my model uh, is proposing something um, like this, that you have a solar array in a, in a straight line, and what is going to be the effect of the uh, remaining airflow that is going to flow from the first solar panel to the rest. 
So this is um, the initial part of my research. I started using this uh, proposal that uh, Gleek uh, et al. proposed. And this is an experiment that they conduct on a, on a, on a scale in a um, wind tunnel. And this is what they found, that they are going to have different uh, layers that the uh, flow is going to um, perform or is going to uh, get affected by the, the solid of the, of the panels. And this uh, turbulence that is going to be generated by all of them is going to affect the, the following solar panels. Knowing this and understanding this concept, I proposed uh, my model. In this case, I have a solar panel that is affected by a solar uh, irradiance that, uh, in this case, I, I'm taking a, um, a heat flux in the, in the front solar panel. And, and I'm checking the um, uh, incoming wind flow that is going to decrease or extract the heat that I'm going to have. And um, next to this, I have um, to make it something that will be um, put in practice, I took the measures of a real solar panel. By this way, I can um, get a better understanding of what is going to happen in a realistic uh, way. In this case, in a solar array, that is usually the way that you can find uh, solar panels uh, working. That you have a um, solar farm or a solar array. And um, moving on, this is what I propose. In this case, I have four solar panels in the same array. Why, why I got four? Because at the beginning, as the other researchers, I started with a single solar panel to check what is going to be the effect of the wind. Then, uh, after I got these, um, the, the conclusions from that part, I added a second one. And I saw that the distribution from the first one and the second one the distribution of the temperature in the in the in the surface of the panel were, was really different, and this is part of my experiment of what I uh, got. So knowing this, I uh, I asked myself. So I know that the second one is going to be different from the first one, but what will happen if I have four, for example? And then this is what I got. I have first the mesh that is going to represent the domain in which I want to uh, check my, my analysis. Um, this is an hybrid mesh that, that I create. And this is um, an example of what uh, I got in this. Uh, for these slides, uh, the things that are important are the temperature, uh, sorry, the dimensions that I have for the founder that they um, follows the, the guidelines for, for this type of, of um, analysis where I have a natural environment with, without any uh, walls around it. And I have an inlet that is on the left side of you and the outlet on the right one. So uh, checking this, I have uh, additionally an inlet velocity that represents um, a velocity that will be possible in, in an environment um, that will be easily reached. And this is what I got from my CFD uh, results. In this case, we can check um, that we have the highest uh, temperature on, this, on the second solar panel. And this happens every time that I run the simulations. Um, doesn't matter the, the length of the, or the, um, yeah, the dimension that I have from one panel to the other. This is always the, the thing that I found. Um, the highest temperature is going to be this. You can check that the first uh, solar panel, that is the one that you can check here, uh, is going to have like um, an even distribution. The second <coughs> one will have this kind of um, uh, circular shape in, in that case. And the third one and the fourth one also are going to be different. So what is, the, what is the, the reason of all this? Well, I check in more detail, firstly, the temperature that I'm going to have in the different solar panels. I trace a line in the middle of the panels just to check 
what is going to be the distribution. The explanation of why I pick the um, middle line is because the maximum temperature is going to be just in the middle right here. And this is what I got. We can check that the first solar panel is going to have um, this, um, is going to follow this trend of the temperature. The second solar panel is going to have the highest temperature uh, on the panels. And the third one and fourth one are going to have less temperature than the first one. Checking this, we can check the in the mid plane the velocity uh, contours that we are going to have. As you can see here, the inlet is going to be this one. The first solar panel that we have right here is going to get impacted by this um, velocity, uh, the airflow that, that we have. And that is going to create a wake after this that is going to affect what we are going to have in the next um, solar panels. This is why they don't have the same distribution because the velocity and the airflow that we are going to have is going to uh, be different. And this is why it's important to understand the convection in a whole array because uh, this is closer to reality than just checking uh, a single solar panel. And additionally with this, we can check that we are going to have a higher uh, velocity um, um, like, um, spot right here because the lower area that we have down there and the remaining outflow that is going to um, um, like flow around the solar panels. We can check also in more detail what is going to uh, be the first solar panel, what is going to uh, generate after this, that is the wake um, that we are going to have, and all the range that will be in the middle will have uh, a lower velocity. In this case, we are checking the mid plane of the, of the whole array that we have. I also uh, check uh, different views from this, and uh, some of the conclusions that, that I got is that based on the geometry that we have for the solar panels, in this case, we have, we have the, the legs or the supports right here, but in detail, we have one, two, and three. So these legs that we have down there are going to generate uh, different vortex based on the geometry that we have um, in the in the legs. In this case, it's just a, a, a square shape um, uh, support that is something realistic, and that is going to generate all the distribution of the temperatures that we are going to have. So. Uh, checking in other details, we can check the turbulence contours that we are going to get. This is going to follow what we have in the velocity distribution. It's going to follow uh, uh, sort of the same pattern. And in this case, we can check that the highest turbulence is going to be generated after the fierce uh, solar panel. And that uh, turbulence is going to impact as well the convection heat transfer that we are going to uh, have on the different uh, panels. So knowing this, I uh, extract from the CFD analysis the, the trend the, or the curves that we are going to have for the different uh, solar panels in, the, in terms of the heat transfer convection, uh, heat transfer coefficients. So, we can check that the fierce uh, solar panel, that is this blue line that we can have here, uh, is going to follow a linear distribution that is something realistic and consistent with the information that we can get from, from other authors. The things uh, get weird after this fierce solar panel when we have the second one with this uh, distribution right here. In this case, we can check that we are going to have the lowest, um, the lowest heat transfer coefficient, and then the the other uh, the three and four uh, solar panel, they are going to have a different shape, but in sort of the same range of what we have from the initial one. The second one corresponds to something realistic that the the flow that we have is going to uh, get affected, as, as I said, by the fuel solar panel. That is going to generate um, um, V 
this um, this wind distribution that the second solar panel will get affected by all the um, the lack of turbulence that we're going to have here and the third and fourth one um, are going to be um, the heat convection is going to be improved because at, after this range after all the the um, the position the the how to say the length of the of the solar panel this dimension that we have from here to here the 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 flow is going to get more established at that point and the distribution will um, get improved the temperature distribution is going to get improved and the extra the extraction of the temperature is going to get um, like an improvement compared to the second one. So this is why we have all these effects. It's based on the turbulence that we're going to have, and it's going to base on the dimensions that we have from the first solar panel and the second one. Also, if I increase the velocity um, for my CFD analysis, I will check that the temperatures are going to be uh, much lower, the heat transfer convection is going to be higher, and we can check this relation. So knowing this, I also uh, check the nozzle and the Reynolds number that is going to explain numerically what we are going to have here. In this case, I analyze the four different uh, panels on the array with three different uh, velocities. So we can see that the lowest velocity, in this case is 3.6, that is something realistic, is going to um, follow this, uh, this path that we have right here. And then this is for as five uh, meters per second, and then for a ten meters per second. So we can see that the distribution that we are going to have for the numerical analysis is going to be um, following the linearity, and it's going to uh, be uh, increasing each time that we uh, increase the um, the velocity. Why is this numerical analysis important? Because with this. I can analyze different configurations mechanically of my uh, solar panel, and I can compare what are going to be the results for the different velocities, and in that way, I will get um, um, a better, uh, re re a better uh, conclusion of what uh, will improve the, the, the Reynolds, the nozzle number, and also, the, as I said, the heat transfer coefficient. So all these um, plots are going to help me to find the based on other different mechanical configurations what will be the the most um, beneficial uh, configuration for my the most uh, yeah for the most beneficial model for my project. So um, right now uh, we get to the conclusions. The first one is that um, the the first one that, that I uh, got inside uh, I start the, the the project is that the um, the objective that, that I have is to reduce the temperature on a solar array that it's possible it's something that I uh, found it's possible to get uh, an improvement in the heat transfer uh, coefficient also in the temperature uh, distribution that I'm going to have in the different phases modifying the, the geometry that I have for example, uh, of, of the legs, the number of legs, uh, if I add um, an, a different trailing edge, a different uh, leading edge, and that is going to help me to uh, find the best uh, solution for my project. So additionally, the analysis on a whole array is uh, it's really important because that is the most realistic uh, way that we can approach to the, to, to the problem. The, um, in a whole array and not just in a single uh, solar panel. And the efficiency enhancement is possible if I reduce the temperature, that is going to help me to improve the, the efficiency, uh, even if it's in a low um, degree, for example, one or two uh, degrees. Uh, analyzing the problem as a whole uh, solar farm, that is going to be a huge uh, improvement. So these are my conclusions. Uh, thank you so much for for your attention, and uh, thanks so much. If you have any questions, just let me know. Any question from the audience? Yeah.
Yeah, so you um, shared like, earlier on about the variation of the flow with the angle of the, um, of the array. Mm -hmm. So is that something you plan on looking at as a way of increasing the cooling flow? Or? Um, right here, right? Yeah. We can check that we have, uh, in this analysis, we have different angles that are going to uh, create, um, um, based on the, um, on the angle of, of the solar panel, the field angle, and additionally with the angle of the incoming wave flow that we have, we can check that uh, that is going to uh, create, um, or it's going to open to, to us different approaches for the, for the problem. I understand that one of the ways that the in literature they, they found um, to, to improve the convection is changing the tilt angle. Um, that is something good. But for my project, since I want to, to get a model for a, for a whole solar array, that is something that is not realistic uh, at this point. So I understand that that part is going to improve what I will find here but it's not going to be suitable for the aim of my project. So at this point, I'm analyzing, and I have different configurations of the dimension that I have from solar panels. I have different configurations from the trailing edge, uh, the leading edge and the trailing edge, that that will improve the turbulence, uh, not in the same way as, a, as if I change the field angle, but I'm trying to find a different solution without modifying a realistic model. Right. Any other questions? Um, yes, I've got one question. Um, what other solutions can be proposed to reduce the temperature on the solar panel? Well, uh, as I said, at this point, I'm, anal I'm trying to analyze uh, different uh, suitable uh, solutions that will be uh, modifying the trilling and leading edge, as I said, a different um, objects or solids in the floor that will uh, distribute the, the wind flow that I'm going to have for the next solar panels and how that, that is going to impact in the convection and the, and the temperatures that, that I will have. So it's, uh, it's kind of hard to, to find something that will improve a lot the wind flow that, that I have initially, but uh, at this point I'm finding um, some a small progress that will help me if I analyze or if I um, check the efficiency in a whole array and what is going to be the, the improvement in terms of the, of the energy produced, um, that will help me a lot. But at this point, I'm just checking uh, mechanical, uh, um, mechanical implements that I could uh, add to a solar panel without modifying what will have initially from the model, right? Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, so the question that I have is, is, is your simulations are all 2D? No, no, no. They are, are actually uh, 3D. So I have the model right here. It's a 3D model. In this case, I'm showing to you and the mid plane of what I have. This okay. is just a lateral uh, view of, of, the, of, the, of the model of the array that I have, yeah. but uh, it's a 3D. Are they scaled or are they real size? Uh, in this case, as I say, uh, I have the uh, right. realistic uh, dimensions okay. to, to check them, uh, what is going to be the, um, the, the distribution in a, in a realistic environment. And how did you, how did you what, like what dimensional number you use for Reynolds number? Like what is the graph <coughs> that, that you use? Again. What is the characteristic length that you use for Reynolds number? <laughs> <laughs> at, at this point, um, is it I, just like the length of the panel? Yes, and yes. I'm using the length of the panel okay. used to check uh, all of this because that, that is the way that I started um, to, to analyze my problem. Something yeah. close to, to what I, I got from the from the papers that I was reading, but that that was just my my initial uh, point. Yeah. I know that. There are a lot of uh, different things that I can uh, do at the moment for for my uh, project just to improve the, the the level, but I'm just checking at this point mechanical things, mechanical configurations that will uh, help me to check 
the, the temperature. So I'm just analyzing this part at this point of my project, and uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Um, may I ask, what happens when the array increases, and what could be the viability of the project in the solar farm? Okay, so right here I have uh, four different panels, right? And that, as I explained, I started with one, then I moved to two, to just to check uh, what will happen. In this case, in my mesh, I have these uh, four solar panels right here, but I also analyze what will happen if I have another four just next to this one. What will be the, the distribution of the airflow that I was going to have? And I found out that the 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 other array that I create right here next to this one was going to be just a mirror or what of what I have. So this is why I just uh, stayed with these four four solar panels just to analyze the the pro the, the problem in a, just in this same, and then we'll move on to to another uh, solution after this. But also since I since I found that the highest uh, temperature is going to be in the second solar panel. And the third one and fourth one are going to be uh, the the temperature is going to be lower than in the in the first one. This is why I stuck with this just to check um, how can I improve this second solar panel, and that will benefit the the next ones. Right. Yep. Are there any thoughts to do something about the profile of panels? I know this isn't your PhD, but you talked about tilt. Uh -huh. What about the actual profile of that second? The, prof the, the profile, uh, what, what do you mean? Well, the, going from a flat panel to a slight curvature. Ah, okay. Uh, that will be a really um, um, interesting uh, thing to, to cover. At this point, I'm just uh, stuck with the same sure. uh, array that, that I'm trying to, to check. But yeah, that, that, is full, that, will, be, that will improve. Um, Something and, and it's it's a good topic to, to analyze. So so yeah, you just do it for that second panel in a big array. Mm -hmm. You know, if you identified that that was uh, you know the, the one with the most serious issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I will try that just to to, to check uh, and what is going to be the <laughs> the distribution. Thank you so much for the for the tip. Yeah, there there are a lot of uh, approaches that I will take from from this, and I'm just sticking with the mechanical. Uh, implement. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for, <laughs> for the tip. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for, <laughs> for your attention and your And next, please welcome Tariro Gondi. Thank you. soiled in urban agro systems uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, this is just a part of a multidisciplinary uh, study. Uh, my name is Darbo Gwandu, um, and I'm doing uh, my PhD in environmental engineering. My supervisor is um, Karen Johnson and Steve Chivasa from Biological Sciences. Um, I was motivated to pursue this study uh, based on the quote by Latin Lau and Bob Stewart that says, uh, poor soils uh, make people poor, and poor people make soils worse, and desperate humanity does not care about sustainability and stewardship. Um, this quote um, and this picture shown here are a true reflection of the majority of smallholder farmers <coughs> who rely on subsistence agriculture for their survival. The people are poor. They depend on farming poor soils, getting poor yields, and are therefore trapped in a vicious cycle of poverty and hunger. Um, 
This picture is just a comparison to show that if soils are managed well, better crops and better yields are possible. I know some of you are wondering what crop this is. This is maize or corn. Uh, it is a staple cereal to many countries in Southern Africa, including uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, you find that in, uh, apart from increased food quantity, food quality, uh, which is denoted under the umbrella term nutrition, is also important for healthy living. Uh, you find that malnutrition is very common in Africa. Um, but this is also not isolated in Africa, as some vulnerable groups in developed countries also are susceptible to uh, malnutrition. For example, uh, pregnant women, children, and the elderly. And in most instances, these people cannot afford the uh, dietary supplements. So what is the issue here? Uh, the issue is on degraded soils, and what are these ones? These are soils which are characterized by very low soil carbon content. For example, in Africa, uh, less than 1% carbon content. Possibly, um, if we look, if we compare with soils in Europe, they can go as high as 5%. Uh, the degraded soils are also characterized by low soil nitrogen and phosphorus and the micronutrients, zinc and selenium, um, and are also characterized by poor crop yields. For example, for maize, you find that in Africa, uh, low yields is low as one ton per hectare, against possibly uh, greater than 10 tons per hectare in the Brazil and Americas. Um, so how can we improve uh, degraded soils? How can we make them work? Um, my focus is on sustainable use of aluminum water treatment residual in combination with compost to increase maize yield and nutrient uptake. Uh, we hypothesize that co-amending soil with aluminum WTR and compost and phosphorus fertilizer result in improved maize yield and nutrient uptake. Um, what is aluminum water treatment residual? This is an industrial waste product, which is a byproduct of clean water treatment. Uh, you find that the aluminum uh, WTR also contains iron and aluminum oxides, flocculated carbon, organic matter and clay particles. It is a waste, but also a valuable resource. Um, this picture is just showing the physical appearance of WTR under different uh, storage or processing conditions. Uh, this one here is, is showing aluminum WTR in landfill, whilst the middle one is showing wet WTR after dewatering. And this one is just the uh, dried and ground form. Um, how did I go about it? Uh, we used the uh, greenhouse. This is a greenhouse stud which was carried here at Zaram. And um, this is a field experiment which we did in Zimbabwe. Um, so I will start on talking about nitrogen and phosphorus uptake. Uh, this was measured in the plant. Um, these are results from a greenhouse study which was uh, done here at Durham University. It had 10 treatments, uh, which consisted of aluminum, WTR, and compost, uh, with or without phosphorus fertilizer. Um, my candidate here is this one, 10% uh, WTR plus 10% compost plus P, which I shall call the core amendment. Uh, I will start with P. Uh, if you look at the graph, uh, the core amendment compared better compared to this, the control, this is a Zimbabwean uh, sandy soil, um, uh, which was not amended, it had nothing. Uh, the core amendment performed better compared to standard NPK, this one. This one is a uh, common uh, practice whereby farmers use fertilizers for plant production. And also the um, core amendment per uh, performed better where we used the um, uh, 10% WTR plus P on its own without the compost. But for phosphorus, it had um, lower results uh, compared to 10% compost on its own. Uh, phosphorus drives all the energy processes of a plant. But let's look at nitrogen. You find that um, the candidate here, which is the co-amendment, 
gave superior results compared to all the other treatments, the control, the standard NPK, uh, the WT are on its own, and the 10% um, compost there, which is a plus because nitrogen is involved in protein formation, uh, which makes uh, uh, which improves the quality of the cereal that we get from from maize. Uh, we said, okay, because this is a food crop and we are using an industrial waste which contains the heavy metals, we needed to look at the heavy metal contents in the product. So we focused on aluminium, uh, nickel, and lead. Um, for, um, I'll start with aluminium. Uh, from these results, um, the results show that um, our candidate here was um, comparable to 10% compost and standard NPK. Although it had higher aluminum um, content compared to the control here and where we used um, the WTR on its own, we expected that because the WTR contains lots of aluminum from the aluminum sulfate that is used to treat water. And then looking at um, nickel, our candidate um, had lower nickel content compared to uh, uh, aluminum WTR on its own here. So it means the compost component enabled uh, our maize to, uh, it reduced the uptake of nickel. And then uh, going for lead, um, the core amendment yet uh, more or less the same quantities of lead um, compared to aluminium uh, to aluminium WTR on its own. But the good news from all this is that um, all the heavy metal levels were below the threshold toxicity levels of heavy metals as defined under the World Health Organization, and these are shown as broken lines there on the on the graphs. So we can safely say that we can apply our aluminium WTR into the soil to improve our soil health. Um, we also looked at plant height and leaf number um, just to check on the growth of the maize plant. You find that our um, the core amendment and 10% compost year uh, consistently performed better compared to the control and the rest of the treatments in terms of plant height and also in terms of number of leaves. Uh, this is just to show how the plants looked like in the greenhouse. Um, this one is the control plant where nothing is added. And then this one was our core amendment where we mixed the WTR and the compost. And this is a compost one. But all these plants did not receive any P fertilizer. Uh, we move on to biomass yield. Uh, we measured shoot biomass and root biomass. Um, the core amendment here uh, consistent, consistently yielded higher biomass, both shoot biomass uh, compared to the control, the standard NPK, uh, the 10% WTR on its own, um, but was comparable to 10% compost both uh, the shoot biomass and the root biomass, uh, which made us to ask ourselves why then should we bother to bother to add aluminum WTR in soils if we can get the same um, biomass as much as we can get using compost. Um, let's look at the quality of the product. Um, we looked at uh, micronutrients, zinc, copper, and manganese. Uh, these nutrients are required uh, for uh, growth, for, for our health. They are essential micronutrients. Um, looking at manganese, uh, the core amendment was comparable with 10% compost um, and our standard NPK, but was far better <coughs> compared to where we used it on its own and the control. But here, looking at both uh, copper and zinc, you find that our core amendment here, uh, which is shown by these big yellow arrows, uh, performed better compared to all the treatments. 
So it actually improved the quality of, of the maze. Um, in conclusion, our core amendment in, uh, improved uh, plant growth and dry matter yield of maize. It also enhanced maize nutritional quality, which could alleviate micronutrient deficiency in cereal based diets in Africa. We also speculate on going reduced fertilizer requirements for the core amendment to maintain yield stability. Um, and these are some of the published work from my study. Um, my name uh, is. Um, my name is uh, shown there in, in red circles. Okay, so just a food for thought. What would you want? Uh, supplements or uh, agronomic biofortification? You know, with supplements, you just have to remind yourself to take one or two tablets every day, or you just need to eat food that is rich in micronutrients already. Thank you. Just doing compost on its own, and like the difficulty of applying it. Like, is it worth? Is it worth the cost or the challenge of doing both treatments combined compared to just using the ten percent compost? Oh, okay, thank you for that. You find that uh, the WGR is freely available because it's a waste product. You can get it for free, and also um, we are having challenges of disposal. You know, it's currently just being disposed in landfill. So we are trying to find ways of reusing that product, which is a plus if we can use it to improve um, food quality. Then we can safely use it for land application, solving another problem. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, a really interesting, uh, really interesting presentation. Um, I don't know if you can assess. You know, you you see, for example. The much larger quantities, for example, of zinc and copper in the in the uh, end crop, but but also of course lots of other changes. How how, how much do you think that is due to um, the, the presence of the treatment increasing uptake of stuff that's already there, and how much of that is because you know is there some zinc and copper in with the in with the uh, the aluminium that you that you added? So my question is really how much is is the treatment increasing uptake of stuff that's already in the soil, you know, from the other things that have been added or in the soil already? And how much is it that, that actually that you added some extra things along with the aluminium? Okay. Uh, the soils themselves, they lack the micronutrients, like I said earlier on uh, the zinc, mostly zinc, selenium, and, and copper. They, um, they lay, the, the soils are deficient in that. So this aluminium WTR is actually rich in this. So from our exper uh, experiments, we are thinking our plants ended up taking these micronutrients from the aluminium WTR because the soils basically are empty; they have nothing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it's so yeah, the, the aluminium WTR is, is introducing a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there are means of doing that. Like for us, uh, in this one, we measured uh, the levels of the micronutrients in the, in the maize plants. It's a whole lot of laboratory work, you know. And then we end up getting how much of each is in the product. It's the upper region method, where you extract the metals from 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 example, and then you analyze them either using an atomic absorption spectrometer. Hi, um, amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about um, soil degradation. 
after Pankal. So how, what's the longevity of these, of the, the, of the meaning you're putting in over a lifespan of a farm? Um, so if you continue to grow plants on it, what's the deterioration of that material you're putting in? How long does that last for, for farmers and, and Okay, thank you for that question. We are yet to find out in my other object. So we still don't know. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay. uh, I have a question. Uh, do you have a pre-treatment for your aluminum waste or you just uh, use it as you get it from the, from the treatment water? Okay, for, for this one, because it was dried already, we took it from a landfill. We just had to grind it to make it a bit fine because it was in large flocks so that we can incorporate it into the soil. Otherwise, nothing, uh, nothing more. Well, like before we use it, we actually characterize it. We shape what's in there in terms of the physical characteristics, the chemical characteristics, and also the biological characteristics. Just one last question. Do you think these systems are sustainable going into the future? Uh, okay, thank you for that. Yeah, um, I think so. Uh, because uh, we find that even population in Africa is increasing, and therefore it means more water will be treated for, uh, and then it means uh, that's a guarantee for the continued supply of the aluminum WTR. So I think it's sustainable. Thank you. Today. So, next presenter is Michael Chen. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so, my topic is digital twinning and distributed learning for smart ways. And I'm uh, Michael. Uh, so, digital twin, uh, as the first presenter of digital twin, may I introduce what is digital twin? The digital twin is actually a virtual representation that serves as a real-time digital counterpart uh, of a physical objective or process. So, digital twin has been used in uh, aviation, manufacturing, healthcare, uh, automotive, urban planning, and uh, other related industries. So with digital twin, we can use mining kind of uh, uh, technologies such as artificial intelligence, such as Internet of Things, cyber physical systems, 3D technologies, this kind of uh, technology. So here is the, uh, um, uh, uh, the um, with the help of technologies, digital twins can provide firstly real-time state monitoring and analysis, secondly, virtualization, thirdly, predictions, and fourthly, uh, water operations, and finally, some uh, predictive maintenance. So the characteristics of digital twins including, uh, firstly, real-time data exchange, uh, secondly, strong interactivity, and thirdly, historical data traceability, and fourthly, uh, computer technology assistance, and closed-loop op optimization and modularization. So uh, this is the uh, distributed machine learning called federated learning. So federative learning is very useful when you uh, when, when it comes to when you want to protect the uh, privacy of the data because uh, instead of uh, uploading the uh, original data of your database, you upload the ways of your neural network. And then um, the uh, federative learning is suitable for non-identical situation and is suitable for supervised learning and when, you, when there's a large amount of data to be transmitted, so in this case, the, uh, digital twin can pro uh, provide some alleviation of the potential congestion. So here is an uh, algorithm of uh, federated averaging. So we have, assuming that we have one server, we have many clients, 
And so the server uh, initialized the global model and the global model will be sent to each client and the client train their data with their uh, local data, train the neural network and uh, at each round the server will collect some uh, some of the clients, uh, the weights of the clients and do the arithmetic mean here. Uh, so uh, this is federated learning and this is the uh, uh, actually a picture of uh, how uh, federated learning works. So we have a server, we have many databases and uh, the same as uh, the last PowerPoint. So this is a, a possible structure that I designed for the uh, digital twin for a microgrid. So here we have uh, some uh, data on the left side and uh, from the data we can generate some flexible loads and we can generate uh, photovoltaic final loads and then uh, with long term memory and federated learning we can make some predictions and the, with the DeepQ network we can do some control and uh, we have some battery groups so that we can store the surplus data into the batteries and then um, to do some scheduling to optimize the total carbon emission as well as the electricity cost. So that's that's my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, please welcome the next presenter, Kai Xuanzhou. I'm so glad to have the opportunities of making my presentation. The potato of my presentation is thermal electric heat pump with storage for heating. The contents is div are divided into four parts. First, I will make a brief introduction. Around 34, around 37 percent of final energy consumption in the UK is for heating. Therefore, it is necessary to find a sustainable and renewable energy source. The aim of my project is to develop a novel system to achieve net zero carbon heating in the domestic building sector by using renewable energy sources which are more cost effective, cleaner, and sustainable. The second part is materials and method, and I will explain in two modules. The first module is the basic principle of the solar or wind powered thermal electric heat pump with energy source system for heating. This is a picture of the TE effect. Three modules have zero ODP, zero GWP, higher levels of reliability, lower load working noisy, and lower cost. The second module is the experimental test. This is a picture that of a test bench that I set up. The test bench is an enclosed test space which is powered by the wind grid and heat generated by a thermal electric heat pump and a heat storage chain. Of course, with a data logging system. The third part is the result and discussion. The first is result without using storage heat in the storage tank. This is the result uh, shown in figure three to figure five, to which uh, 23 degrees heat sources is provided. And the running time taking in 20 minutes, data are taking every five minutes. The second is the result using storage heat in the storage tank. This is the result uh, as shown in the figure three to figure eight. So, when you're comparing the result in the subsection one and two, it can be seen that the heating performance of the one uses storage heat is much higher. The temperature increases in a shorter time and the COP it can be higher. So all in all, I will do a conclusions. It's a feasible to use T modules as a heat pump to provide heating for a simulated space. With the support of the historic tank, the TE heat pump can output higher temperature of heat and achieve higher COP. And of course, the time taken for heating a space is much shorter. Future work is planned to conduct more tests under different conditions. 
and perform more simulations using transit software. Thanks for your listening. This is my question. Sorry, it's my fault for not mentioning. Um, in every session, the part two is only three minutes and there will not be a QA and a session. Um, but last but not least, very fun. Hello, hello. Um, don't worry, one more and you get to your refreshment break. And I promise this will be short and sweet. Um, hi everyone, I'm Ray, and I'm here to present you my three minute thesis in a title of Tunable Structural Color, Next Stretch of Opportunity. And when you look at this title, you probably think, what is she talking about? Um, how about let me introduce you with the concept of maybe in the future you can have a fancy shirt and say, okay, I want my shirt to be green today. And you stretch it, it's green. And you want it to be red today. And you stretch it more, it can be red. That can, that is called structural color. And that is the ideal that we're trying to realize probably in the next two decades. Um, um, yes. So the structural color has the tendon, has the potential to re, to replace chemical dyes, and it can save the world of fast fashion and save the world of the um, impact that chemical dye and fast fashion has on the globe. So how did this come to our mind? There are two cute comedians, and they're. They're famous for their ability to change color according to the environment they're in. So researchers took a look at their surface, at their skin. So when the chameleons are relaxed, you can see the little pillars, the very, very small nanopillars on their skin, they're quite condensed together. And when they're excited, they expand their skin, so the center to center distance of the little pillars expand. And those little pillars have the ability to interact with light. And with the center to center distance change, they absorb different wavelengths of light. So the reflected color will be different. And now that is not a metasurface yet. That is a metasurface. So metasurface is an artificial <coughs> material. So researchers have built this kind of uh, metasurface to mimic the chameleons. And we can see the, how do I point? Yes, the little blocks, dark blocks on top are made of aluminum and the substrate is made of stretchable um, materials. But conventionally this, this type of metal surface only uses metal or dielectric. And we want to combine those two materials to combine the advantages of both type. And uh, the problem would be the, uh, the overall parameters influencing the color would, uh, vary, would be very huge. So there are materials that influence it, the diameter of the little nanopillars, the substrate, the geometry, the height, the size. And if we're going from a forward, designing point of view, it would be based on my initial guesses that I would have a really good intuition of what parameter pairs good with what. So we thought an idea of um, what if there's a machine that can design it for us. So um, we plan to put this all in a machine learning algorithm and in hopes that once we train the algorithm, we plan a color coordinate and the machine will do the design for us. And after the parameter is optimized and validated, we will take that into uh, experimentation. So at the end, I would like to finish with one of my favorite quotes from one, one of my favorite person. And uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation.
Guess what, guess what? It's time for refreshments. <laughs> so there are some refreshments in the coffee bar and as well as the post and Q&A session. So please ask lots of questions and enjoy a lot of refreshments.
so for this session, we're going to start with uh, a 10 minute presentation by Rigoberto Ortega. He's going to talk about formation and evolution of swirling water streams. Hello, welcome back. Well, today I'm going to speak about Surly Morphe Stream. And, well, I'm Rigoberta. My supervisors are Dr. Yangan and Dr. Phil. Uh, well, the aim of my research is to study how the additional swirl will affect the evolution and formation of vortex rings. I'm pretty sure that all of you have seen a smoker doing smoke rings. Even dolphins can do water rings. So vortex rings, are quite uh, we can see a lot of vortex rings in nature. And even not only in mind, but also in your hearts, we have vortex rings. So they are quite important. What are the characteristics of a vortex ring? Well, we have, they have a self-induced velocity. They have a relation with high vorticity, that is a core. We have a relation with low vorticity, that is the vortex bubble. And we have the trailing jet. Just remember, vorticity is the rotational of the velocity field. And well, some important parameters that we need. The first one is the stroke ratio. That is basically how much fluid you are discharging. The second one is the stroke number. That is only the ratio between the asymmetric flow and the actual, no, the asymmetric velocity and the axial velocity. At the inlet, we have, of course, the Reynolds number that we can use the axial velocity to define the Reynolds number. The dimensional time and the formation number and you can see here, the formation number is just one of the stroke ratio. But it's important because if our stroke ratio is below this value, then we will have an isolated vortex ring. But if the stroke ratio is higher than four for this case, we will have a vortex ring plus a trailing jet. Okay, what is the effect of the stroke in vortex ring? So far, we know that the additional stroke decays the self-induced velocity, also the generation of negative asymmetric vorticity, as we can see in blue here in the isosurface, and the decrease in the formation number. And well, this, this is a numerical research. We are solving the Navier-Stokes equation using large shell simulation via open phone. And well, this is our computational domain. And we are working with two cases. Case A is basically the inlet the, the, between the inlet and the tank, there is this little gap. And case B is without the gap yet. And, well, the validation, we already compared our work with a previous work with the same setup. And we can see that our data match really well with the previous work. And, uh, well, as we expected, the velocity, self-induced velocity decreases with the stroll. Yeah, the marks are for case A and the lines are for case B. So it's only a, a weak difference between those cases. Ah, well, we can explain that using the Sapman model. The first term is only a ratio between the ring radius and the core radius. This term is only is related with the vorticity distribution in the core, but this one that is negative is related with the asymmetric velocity. So according to this, if, if we increase the asymmetric velocity, then you said has to decrease, that is the self-induced velocity. And well, also the additional stroke increase the ring radius. Yeah, as we go. And why this happens? Well, because we have a phenomenon similar to the vortex breakdown. For example, for zero stroll, we, we can identify a stagnation point here. Here, we are using a frame of reference moving with the vortex ring. So here, the velocity is zero. But if we add stroll, this point starts to move upstream. Yeah, as we can see here, and also here. And of course, that will change yeah, the propagation of the vortex ring, increasing its ring radius. Ah, well, the uh, asymmetric velocity inside the vortex core, inside the vortex core, comes from the roll-up process. And there is a difference between case A and case B. We can see the black line here for case A, and this one is for case B. There is a big difference, but it's related with the gap, because in, at the gap at the beginning, we don't have rotational flow. But at the end, after some time, the velocity profile are quite similar. 
This is important because in previous numerical work, they didn't include the formation, and they just say, okay, we have a Gaussian distribution of azimuthal velocity. But here we can see that never is Gaussian distribution if we include the formation process. Another interesting thing is that if we increase the throw, uh, ah, in this one, if we increase the throw, that would affect, of course, the asymmetric velocity inside the vortex core. But if we use the ring radius to create this, to make this dimensionless asymmetric velocity, then the, the points collapse. Yes, so the ring radius is important to define the asymmetric velocity in the ring score. And the same happened with the vorticity. If we use the ring radius, here, all the points collapse in a single line. For case A, the vorticity is higher because we have a stronger boundary layer. But what's important here is that the ring radius is an important parameter to, to understand this evolution. And also another important quantity is the circulation of the ring. Before six, that is our stroke ratio, you can see that it's pretty similar. Just it's a little higher for S equal one, that is the green uh, triangles. But after that, the, for S equal one, it starts to decrease. But, and why we have that decrease? Well, because we have the formation of negative vorticity. We have identified three uh, sources of negative vorticity. The first one, A, is related with the wall effect. B is related with the velocity profile. And C, that is the one that we're interested. And also here you can see, this is the negative uh, circulation and how that increases with the throw. Well, according to a previous work, this negative vorticity comes from a secondary flow similar to the dim vortices that we can see in a curved pipe. So basically, they say that this is related with asymmetric velocity inside the vortex core. <laughs> But if we compare the D number that they got is 640, and in our case, it's around 40, so it's a big difference. But in our case, the asymmetric, the negative vorticity is higher than there. So there is another reason. And then Brown and Lopez, well, Brown Lopez say that for uh, if we have vortex breakdown, the formation of negative vorticity is a necessary condition, yeah, and then Darmokol, well, they, he say that this is because we have the tilting of the vortex lines. Just imagine, for a zero throw, throw ring, we only have a component of the, uh, of the vorticity vector that is the asymmetric. But if we add the throw, we have three components, U R and U Z. So they say that part of U Z and part of U R becomes in, in, a, in negative asymmetric vorticity, and we can study that using this equation. Then, for a axisymmetric flow, we can see that the, 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 the axial vorticity and the radial vorticity depends on the asymmetric velocity. So, if we combine this, we can get this expression. So, we know that the evolution of the asymmetric vorticity depends on the square of u theta. And if we use this, in our dimensionless, to dimensionless this negative circulation, we can see that most of, most of all the cases collapse. Yeah. Here, the, the problem is that it's, for this one, the swirl is a quarter. So u theta is pretty weak. And most of the negative vorticity here comes from the velocity profile, not for u theta. And well, the formation number. To find the formation number, we only need to find the intersection within the ring circulation, maximum ring circulation, and the total circulation, and that will be, the, this dimensional, dimensional time will be the formation number. And well, our results are pretty similar to the one that he got. And well, we can see here, if we add throw, the formation number decreases. But why that happens? Well, we have to, we have two reasons. The first one is related with the kinetic energy of the ring. We know that for a isolated, a stable vortex ring, the kinetic energy is 0 0.33. Yeah? And imagine the nozzle. If we study the, the kinetic energy from the nozzle, it has this behavior. 
it decays with the time. This is time. So for zero throw, the intersection, let's imagine it will be here. So this will be the formation number. But another model says that this, uh, this uh, dimensionless energy depends on this, this epsilon. And uh, this epsilon is just the ratio between the ring's core, no, the radius of the core and the ring radius. And we know that if we ask throw, this radius increases. So we're expecting that epsilon decreases with the throw, and then the alpha, the kinetic energy of the ring increases. So that means that if we have throw, instead of here, we will have an intersection here, for example. And of course, this value will be lower than this. And remember, those, these are the formations numbers for every soft case. And the, the last reason is because we have the formation of a secondary ring. We know that the swirl improves the instabilities in the trailing jet, and those instabilities, instabilities can grow and form secondary rings. So what happened here? The vorticity flux, instead of going to the main ring, start to go into the secondary ring, stopping the growth of the, of the main ring. And we can see here that we plot the different fluxes for different points, here, here, and a circle. And in all the cases, it start to decrease at dimension as time six. Why this time is important? Because it's the end of the piston stroke. And then at this point, we can start to see the formation of a secondary ring. So there is a big decrease here. Ah, well, those are the two reasons why the formation number decreases. So in conclusion, the ring radius is the most important parameter to describe the evolution of a surreal vortex ring. The, the generation of the negative vorticity is related with the asymmetric velocity, but not in the ring core, that is pretty weak, but it's related with the asymmetric velocity in the swirling jet. Yeah? And the decrease in the formation number is because the dimensional kinetic energy increases with the throw, and also because we have the formation of a secondary ring in the trailing jet. And well, that will be all. I'm happy to answer. Any question? Thank you. Any questions? No? Uh, so I have a question. Uh, you said that you studied two cases. Uh -huh. And uh, so for those two uh -huh. cases, first, so first of all, why did you choose those, those two cases? And secondly, are the entry distance for these two cases are similar. And the second question that I have is, uh, why the stagnation point uh, goes upstream when you have more swirl in your, in your, in your problem? OK. Well, for the first one, we choose that because we know that the distribution of, asymmetric velocity, for, uh, of the asymmetric velocity inside the core will change. So basically, we want to know only if the distribution, if we, well, let me think about the question. OK. <laughs> it's because, as I say, in previous work, they use a Gaussian distribution. And we want to know is it's really important which distribution you use. And we, we identify here that it's not really, not really it's not really important because at the end the asymmetric velocity here is pretty weak. All right. Yeah, in comparison with the other velocities. So here is different at, the, at, at, at least at the beginning, but that doesn't affect, for example, the the uh, the velocity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see in that plot. There is a difference, but it's pretty weak. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, for, I uh, know, where is it? Uh, yeah, this one, yeah, this one. For this one. Yeah, it's because we have the roll-up process, and thanks to the roll-up process, we have these gradients. All right. Yeah, and then for those gradients, we have a weak, let's say a weak negative vorticity. Mm -hmm. And then the same negative vorticity induces a negative axial velocity. All right. And for that reason, the stagnation is like a, so you push back the stagnation. Yeah, push back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
the start with the start with this gradient, generate asymmetric velocity, and then the asymmetric velocity that the the negative uh, asymmetric vorticity, sorry, induce the negative axial velocity, and that increases the uh, this gradient, so it's a process that is growing. Have, grow. like, have, have you provided graphs that shows the stagnation point location compared to the amount of the swirl that you have? Yeah, is yes, is well, I think it's this one. Okay. So this distance set is just the distance between these points and the core center. Okay. And even for swirl one, we can see that it's even below zero because it's behind the the core That's center, right, yeah. and that will affect. It's pretty similar to the to the vortex breakdown. All right. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? No. All right. Thank you so much, Rigo. Yeah. Uh, our next presenter. Will be with Von Erken. Uh, he will have a 10 minute presentation and he will talk about the role of asymmetric material properties on multifunctional device applications. Larger than this, the universal value, value of the 1.3, because 
um, because the main, the main parameter is the differences between the junction resistivity and the material resistivity. Because when we compare the resistivity between uh, junction and the nanowire or stick resistivity, uh, it's quite different. Uh, also, because uh, also the bandwidth density of the nanowire connections increases, produce the extra and this uh, much more resistivity, and it results in the uh, different exponent numbers. In, that, in, in, in addition to this, there is not a, a detailed study about uh, semiconductor uh, me uh, materials such as semiconductor nanowires, but in the elongated semiconductor materials. This is the uh, other part of the study uh, when I compare with my calculation. And there are two main rules of this stick percolation. One of the rules is the uh, it must be an isotropic percolation. Uh, when the people cal uh, calculated the isotropic system, they calculated the universal percolation uh, threshold, the critical percolation. But in another parameter, uh, this parameter uh, is the stick percolation falls into the uh, lattice percolation because all the uh, percolation study is based on the lattice geometry and it is numerically uh, pro uh, proven and uh, when we create a model and this model had to match with this uh, lattice percolation and uh, in two dimensional system there are uh, various uh, geometries possible hexagonal or um, square or the triangular lattice and when, we cal when I calculated this uh, per percolation experiment it will give idea about the geometry of this uh, junction so uh, two experimental parts of the, the numerical experiment part of the series, I am using the Monte Carlo analysis to create this statistical data, and uh, I'm repeating the uh, 10 over 6 times for each data point to get some statistical results for my calculations. And this critical parameter is the uh, stick density and also the system size. The system size is with respect to the speed length and the, the size of the uh, uh, asymmetric cells. Uh, however, for the exponent and the calculation for the percolation exponent, it needs to be uh, converted to the arbitrary stick density number because uh, when I compare when I calculate this stick uh, density as the percolation parameter, and all the percolation, all the calculation needs to be on the, this stick density and. Uh, when I use the position distribution for this the stick number and I can convert to this the stick density function. So this is one of the examples how I can calculate this critical uh, stick density for a given condition and the critical um, critical probability number. And when I, uh, when I analyze it, actually I didn't put so much more statistical details uh, because it's uh, complex of good work. Uh, when I getting the, the uh, differences between the probability for each step. I, I, after I do some Gaussian distribution, I can calculate the critical stick density, and, the, and also I can calculate the uh, critical uh, probability function. This, this is giving idea of the geometry. This is one of the ways to monitor the geometry of this or sticks uh, or junction. Uh, because there, as I said, this what is uh, percolation has already been studied, and this uh, side percolation number when uh, equal to the open source distributor, it is one of the sign of this, uh, this junction connected with the square uh, like structure. And also, I calculated some percolation parameter I mentioned in the, the studies, and I uh, these numerical studies help to calculate this. Uh, some percolation, uh, the uh, system size exponent, and also the cluster exponent. So when I compare these numbers with the literature, and it says that it's also the uh, the uh, the, you know, the junction distribution, also the connection distribution, it has a square uh, square lattice in two dimension. So uh, this data points shows that this is the cluster uh, data of this the only one system size. And this graph shows that the, uh, this number of connection of each stick, it means that uh, each stick has a bond with the other uh, sticks, and it shows the average number of the uh, stick uh, junction connection. And this number actually is 
uh, not a big surprise, and it's increasing with the increasing steep landscape. However, when I look at the, the <coughs> north uh, distance, actually the north distance is the uh, junction distance is in my case, and the uh, so then we look at when we consider the north distance, the north distance is sharper degrees of up, uh, up to some point, but up to some point it's uh, continues gradually. Actually, it's almost it's capable almost of all point. Uh, 15, and uh, it means that uh, even though we increase the speed density, uh, these the north differences and the drop distance is almost stable. Um, uh, also, the uh, uh, cluster analysis say that uh, when we increase the speed density, the, the number of the cluster increase uh, first, but after some point, these clusters uh, start merging again, and then the number of clusters is decreasing. So um, average north distance again uh, becomes uh, stable, uh, but uh, by the number of the bonding increase, it's important information to produce some geometry. And this uh, this figure shows the connection between the uh, nanowire nanowire junction. So uh, because I simulate some uh, critical data such as PC is the um, average number of the uh, steep junction. Also, the, this is the number of the uh, number of the, uh, the clusters. I can create the ge these geometries uh, because I know the uh, I know the how many connection each square uh, can do and how many clusters it is. So also I know I know the the, uh, north, the junction uh, distance. So by doing this for each parameter, um, I can. Uh, I can build the model. I can build the geometer for each parameter, and uh, for uh, in the next steps, uh, I can uh, measure the uh, conductivity depending on the parameter, and this will help me to uh, to analyze the conductivity in uh, transverse and uh, in in plane and out plane direction. Uh, this this part of the study shows in in out plane direction. I also think the in plane direction. Time. When I produce this geometry by using these nodes uh, into the system, I can uh, analyze the conductivity. Also, each project will uh, use a huge amount of nodes data, which is impossible to analyze each of them because each time uh, I produce uh, uh, 10 over 6 times data, it, it is really impossible to analyze each of them rather than these things. I'm doing the statistical analysis and creating the geometry for each parameter and then uh, analyze the uh, conductivity. So in the next steps, uh, I will integrate this to the multifunctional uh, device as well. Thank you. Thank you, great presentation. Uh, any questions from the crowd? What uh, what devices will these nanowires be used for? Um, actually, yeah, many devices. Actually, the main devices I try to achieve is the tactile sensor, uh, the pressure and sensor for in the case. Um, uh, but also, I am trying to integrate these the same structures in uh, some uh, memory uh, uh, memory device properly. But uh, but the first aim is to produce the tactile sensor. Yeah? Any other question? No? Uh, I have a question. Can, can you please go back to one of those slides that you had, the stick density graphs, uh, that gets to account? Yeah, that, that one. Yeah. Uh, so, so here you, you tell us that as you increase the cluster size, <laughs> there will be a size that it doesn't matter if you increase the stick density and, and afterward the average bonding will not change anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so where, where's, where's that point? I'm, I'm just interested in that that, that point that afterward. Mm -hmm. Like what is that what what is that point representing? Yeah, this point is representing for example when we is a small uh, nanowire density, this node separation is three times is larger than the uh, after the sun point. Uh, because it is the important uh, the junction junction resistivity is the main um, parameter that we analyze the device and maintain. Uh, it's like a golden golden ratio and something like that. Um, no, <laughs> I cannot <laughs> feel that. Uh, it's for my calculation. It's important because uh, to know that each junction junction uh, point 
uh, is the main uh, part of the contact information because of the high the junction point. All right, great. Any other question? No? Thank you so much. Great presentation. <laughs>
Um, just a single one of these will provide half of all the electricity required for residential demands in Durham per year. So they are really significant in what they can do. Obviously, you just need fairly consistent wind. Um, but you can get that offshore more than you can onshore. Now, in terms of this really fast technology that's growing really quickly, and I showed you some of the data that are jumping up, what's really happened and what's really driven some of this is this kind of transition before 2016. These kind of um, where I've highlighted here, so the squirrel cage induction, the SCIG on DFIG, doubly fed induction generator, these are electrically excited machines. We have electromagnets in these, um, and they tend to be geared as well. And you can see it's We've kind of really grown in the offshore kind of region. We've moved and transitioned to these geared and mainly direct drive permanent magnet synchronous generators. Now, synchronous generators are used generally in the UK in large power stations, but they're electrically excited. The great thing about permanent magnets is, is you don't need what we call brushes and slip rings to transfer electricity to our rotor, our rotating part. Um, so in kind of the eyes of developers and people investing in the technology as well as the engineers developing this, that's a great thing because it means the further we are offshore, the less we want to go out for repairs and send out the boats to change, like update things, make sure it's all working or fix things. So it improves our mean time between failures, mean time between repairs as well. Um, however, <laughs> it sounds all great, especially direct drive, you don't have a gearbox either, uh, but we've got this problem, and it's starting to get worse, um, and it's about these magnets that I use. They're called neodymium ion boron. They are rare earth magnets. Um, anyone doing medical stuff will know them from MRI machines. They are incredibly strong. But there's a lot of problems with them, and particularly the fact that um, certain countries have a huge dominance of manufacturing them. So if there's any geopolitical issues, um, and in 2011 there was with China, where they had a 95% dominance in the market, uh, and export prices shot up, as you can see that here, the average price absolutely boomed, and it made everyone kind of working with uh, electrical machines or any other applications these magnets go, ah, damn, okay, this is volatile. And we're getting to the point where the global demand's going up, not just because of wind, but also the use of electric vehicles, um, also medical devices, and again, the average price is creeping up, uh, we could be coming up to a market crash soon, and uh, in a, particularly in the US, they're getting very worried about this. Um, and I'm talking about, we must open our own neodymium mines. Um, rare earth, meaning it's distributed very thinly throughout the earth. So you dig up, dig up a lot of earth to find very small quantities of this magnet. Um, so it's not like you have a big deposit of it. So it's highly costly, as well as the material being quite rare. And it's also not good environmentally. If you look at the figures for like the life cycle analysis of this material, it's very bad. Um, so should it be used in this ethical, what we consider anyway, a more ethical generation technology? Um, another issue is these older, um, well not older, they're still implemented on onshore, and they're still very good, electrically excited machines use something called a partially rated converter. Whereas these ones, uh, like the direct drive PMSG, because it's a very high pole machine, high di um, very large diameter. To get that connection to grid, you need a fully rated converter. And these have a failure rate about six times higher, if you combine the whole drive chain of the PMSG and the fully rated converter, compared to the DFIG. So they're starting to notice this more as a problem at far offshore. Yes, the generator itself may not have as many problems, or may not need as many repairs, but the uh, whole dry chain, including the converter, is becoming more of an issue, and it requires water cooling, and incredibly expensive. So I don't think the PMSG will be lasting forever, especially given that this is still quite a new technology. So this kind of brings me to what I've been doing, is what's gonna come after the PMSG, and how can we, in an open access way, there's a lot of this research on uh, large wind turbine generators is very, very locked down in industry. There's very little information available. But it's just kind of thinking, what could we try instead? Because really, these are all quite conventional technologies. But what about other ideas and other kind of wacky machines? Could we bespoke design the generator for the wind turbine instead? Um, but how can we also compare these fairly? How can we design and compare these? Um, so that's kind of what I'm considering for my PhD. 
So a huge part of what I've been doing is looking at all the different types of electrical machines and thinking which ones haven't been considered for wind, can I test them within the time frame of my PhD and compare them against each other? And how can I do this when I have very little data and I'm not testing something that's been built before and I'm trying it at very, very high powers, multi-megawatts. So, um, yeah, I've had to kind of build a methodology for this because very, very many kind of comparisons of electrical machines is all qualitative. It's all about, um, I have this much experience and I'm going to compare two completely different papers and I think this one's better. Whereas no one's really gone quite back to basics and overarching view and gone, if we model things in the same way and keep things consistent, then how does it compare? So I've kind of built a model um, where I can say what uh, rate of power I want to use, what turbine I want to test, I can change some of the materials and give the designer flexibility in what they want to test. And I've implemented that using the genetic algorithm to optimize these geometries as well. So we can also design something still using quite steady state, simple, fairly uh, static design, um, but making sure that it is also going to be competitive in terms of its mass and efficiency, which are the two real core things. And then later on, you can pick this up and look at dynamic modeling and how it behaves then. This is more for the design side that I'm looking at and the more basic overarching comparisons. Um, so yeah, I've kind of built this in MATLAB um, and it allows me to kind of also control um, via VBA my finite element analysis software, which I can use to pick up some of my magnetic flux densities um, as well, and also do some more testing through the motion afterwards. So this is kind of, again, my kind of methodology, what I'm doing here. Um, because I'm doing study state stuff, I've realized how great um, these uh, electric equivalent circuits are. Very simple. If any of you have done electronics or electrical engineering, um, one second, let's skip ahead you might recognize these. Um, so, but they are just great for looking at your kind of parameters within a machine and thinking about your losses um, and your inductances. So I'll skip back again. This is a bit where I'm probably gonna jump around a little bit. How much time have we got left? <laughs> Uh, you're at 11 minutes now. Oh, damn it. Okay, well, I, I will round off that. <laughs> but just really quickly, I'll just say, um, so one of the machines I have been focusing a lot on is this uh, Russia's doubly fed induction generator um, compared to the PMSG. And it's really looking like a good competitor. I've got some nice results for it somewhere, which is showing that... Oh, go back to here. That... You actually, it's not too bad if you run it on a proton front in terms of uh, when you can use it with, say, aluminium rod windings. It doesn't have any permanent magnets. Uh, you're kind of looking at much lower masses, I guess, because it is a smaller generation of gearbox. Um, but yes, and generally, because of the way that the field modulates this very wacky design of the rotor, you're looking at uh, less copper losses generally in the machine overall. Right. I've run out of time. <laughs> <But> thank you. <laughs> Let me know. Great presentation. Thank you. Any questions? No questions from the panel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I would like to know when you are talking about permanent magnets, it's very costly, right? Like how much is cost compared to, I mean, how much is the current cost for that transfer from a magnet to this generator? So, I don't have those figures at hand, but I am doing a cost analysis and a breakdown. Um, not full um, levelized cost of energy, not full life cycle analysis, um, but yeah, compared to other elements of the drivetrain. Um, so, generally, uh, your kind of most expensive materials in terms of the generator itself, just considering that for now, um, are your windings and depending what you have and what material you use uh, but otherwise I mean you're still your magnetic steel it's all quite expensive you are still looking at like millions of pounds for these things because they are going back to the size of the blade these are massive these are like up to well 10 well it can be up to like yeah a radius of like well no diameter of about 10 meters across for the generator itself so really huge um, but yeah, in terms of the cost price of these magnets, they're incredibly expensive. If anyone's ever bought, like, you can get them on, uh, like, 
I don't know, sometimes people buy the, the ones which kids can play with. They're quite dangerous actually because they're so strong. And I mean, even if you buy like some of those or you've done any experiments in your uh, research fields with them, just like the small ones, it's still like looking at just a huge amount. I can't remember, I should have put the figures in actually of how much they cost, but it does, it is starting to become a much larger cost of the generator. So when I have looked at the cost breakdown between these two, uh, this is more expensive, basically. Problem is, um, it does produce a really nice strong field in your air gap. When you try the machine designs, it is quite hard to kind of get the power density of this thing. But generally, the price of these going up so much that it doesn't matter if you increase your overall kind of your copper, and it might be more manufacturing costs. You might have more uh, magnetic seal. It's still going to be kind of more expensive, which is why I think it's the time to transition. And if you can move from this one, which is fully rated inverter, this one to a partially rated inverter. That also cuts down your costs in that part of the dry train massively as well. So, yeah. What are the disadvantages of your brushless W fed generator compared to the one they use up now? Yeah, so this is uh, just one of the ones I've been looking at kind of more in depth. Um, but I've been trying to look at ones which, because there are just endless types of weird and wacky electric machines. But this one I think slots in well. Um, it's also, so the good thing is, is I wanted to find something that wasn't taking them too much of a step back. It does use a gearbox, but it also has a bit like the PMSG, no uh, brushes or slip rings, it's a passive rotor, so that's a good thing. Um, it's got, generally in terms of its dynamic performance and considering transients, it's got a really, really good uh, low voltage ride through emergency, so that's a great thing to meet grid codes, um, to make sure we don't have a 2020 incident of a wind farm knocking off. Um, it uses this partially racing converter, which is, even though I'm focusing on just the, more of the generator and the electromagnetic design, uh, that is really a huge thing about it, and it doesn't use any permanent magnets. It's only focused on uh, winding because it's electrically excited. Um, I think it's quite clever because a bit like, so if anyone knows doubly fed induction generators, um, it's kind of looks similar in structure. You have one of these sets of control windings on your rotor and your power under stator, um, but then you need brushes and stick rings to connect them, and you get this kind of cross-coupling, whereas this one, it is a bit weird and it's kind of been difficult to model um, because you have to basically, when you have your fluxes that link through, you need them to couple with these what they call like nested loops, your like kind of solid conductors on your rotor and link back to the power windings without direct coupling, otherwise you won't get flux moving through the machine. So it creates this weird kind of modulation effect in your air gap where you have, you're looking at kind of three waveforms for your flux, and you've got to make sure that it's set correctly so that you're, and you're supplying the correct frequencies to these, which should be controlled via your converters um, as well, and that then you're kind of getting nice flux flows within the machine. So that's why this one's particularly important to look at with FEA, because I'm kind of, where is it? Looking at, um, so you basically, it has these two, so, what I've got here is this I here is like your pole type. So you've got your control windings and your power windings. It creates two equations for everything. So when you're looking at your flux densities, you've got to consider it for the flux densities you're producing from your power windings and the flux densities you're producing from your control windings. And then you've got to kind of summate them uh, because of that modulation effect. So it makes, them re it makes the machine really powerful. I keep jumping around. So that's why it's good. It is also high, it has a high power density, like the permanent magnet synchronous generator. It's just a little bit more complicated. You still do have a gearbox, which is a bit of a drawback, but with how good the medium speed gearboxes are now, it's not really that bad. Um, but yeah, it's very powerful. The only issue is trying to overcome some of the noise and harmonic issues because you have all these kind of, a lot going on in the air gap, let's say. Um, with all this kind of, it's more complicated than just a standard kind of sinusoidal um, flux density, flux pattern, basically, that you would get in here. You've got lots of overlapping ones and harmonics from here, which is why it's noisy. So yeah, sorry, I've gone on for quite a long time. That's good. Okay. Uh, more questions? No? I mean, I have a question yeah. uh, regarding this new machine. Is it is it built yet, or is it just a model? So um, it's only been, I'll, I'll, I'll skip ahead again, not like a photo of it here. So it's only been built, from what I understand, up to 250 kilowatts. Uh, whereas, um, and there's some experimental stuff going pushing 6 megawatts, whereas I'm trying to test it for 15 megawatts and 20 megawatts. 
much more competitive than what's actually out there at the moment. Um, obviously, I'm not building <laughs> that thing, but it's trying to kind of start the considerations for it. But yeah, this is, I think, I don't, I think this is actually one of the small ones. I think this was a five kilowatt model. But yeah, the largest they built, and it was uh, Richard McMahon's team in Warwick and Cambridge. Um, between the two, the 250 kilowatts worked pretty well. Again, it's just issues with noise and harmonics. It's difficult with electrical machines because of the cost, um, and you have to have the resources to build these things. You don't know, like obviously as you, as you upscale, you're, and you kind of figure out what's the best way to manufacture these things, uh, then those costs will drop down again. It's just trying to prove a point of like research and development without being so conservative in terms of design, because we really have only looked at four, maybe five, if you include the electrically excited, uh, synchronous generator types of uh, wind turbine generator. It's quite conservative in terms of technology selection, and things aren't considered positively, which is what I'm trying to do with all of this. See where these things kind of fall and compare to each other using consistent methods. So. All right, great. Yep. More questions? One more. And so uh, I think it's maybe too, uh, this too much parameters in that uh, two machines like a different number of the two and it's a different way to go in the line. So when you do the simulation, uh, you mess up on these two machines. Uh, how to consider this impact? Uh, like, uh, just a guess, uh, is there any possible that the simulation is like if I use the, the four tools, uh, four tools test, so the uh, PS2. PSMG is better than the double the double feed. And if you increase the two number like eight two, so maybe the double feed is well better than the PSMG. So go in the situations uh, get to conclusion like uh, which one is better. Because you got the same output power, right? Yeah, so I'm setting the output power and there's a lot of other parameters which will be uh, preset. Um, if I'm setting the output power and I know whether it's generator or not, the way I built my model is it will kind of make these assumptions kind of offhand uh, to know what it's kind of, if it was going to slot into a wind turbine. Just generally, it's hard when you don't have many starting parameters, what its kind of minimum wind speed would be and its maximum wind speed, given the kind of gyro chain setup and your kind of uh, blade structure. Um, and then you were talking about pole, you were talking about your pole numbers between power and control winding and trying different ones. I think that's what you're saying. Um, yeah, and so you, you are right, like how can you exactly tell what's better? I mean, my main kind of things I'm looking at are just some of the more like basic um, kind of losses and mass and then the costs following that. So I'm kind of digging quite deep into uh, core losses and permanent magnet losses and then uh, just generally what your drop is across your electrical equivalent circuit. Um, looking at how much flux you can actually get in here, and then doing an uh, analysis of your uh, using a Fourier transport of, of your harmonics as well gives you a bit of an idea. It's all I can really do at this stage in terms of kind of steady state static for comparing them, but at least it's kind of a way to compare them without just make jumping to conclusions and saying I rate this one six out of ten, and I'm like I read the paper, I'm like well, what does that mean? So I'm trying to actually kind of break this down a little bit more. I mean, obviously you are right, there's a lot of parameters that go into this, which is why I have kind of a preset number of uh, free parameters. And then for some of the other machines, when I'm running it through, I have optional other ones um, as well. So like considering what's going on, if you have your two sets of winding, what's going on, your control will need to do, um, and then optimizing for that. Um, but generally I stick to geometry and keep it quite simple. So air gap radius, your stack length, so it's your axial length of the machine. Um, and other parameters, so your know, height, your tooth width, um, and you're actually optimizing as well for the turns of your windings. It's spelt, I've spelt that wrong. I've only just realized that now. Oh well, I can fix that later. So, um, uh, yeah, so, and then I've obviously like, as well, when you're running something like this, you need a lot of constraints uh, to make sure you're not, doesn't just go crazy. Because this is a problem with electrical machine design. It's an indeterminate problem. Uh, you're kind of reverse engineering it in a sense. Um, so I'm trying to find, look for rated operation between the two machines. Uh, for the BG fake, I'm just testing. Um, there's certain pole uh, numbers between the two that are acceptable and aren't acceptable. Um, they cannot be the same, and there's lots of other rules that apply. So that's kind of in the design input stage. And I can run its rate. So even though here is kind of showing my uh, user interface, I just kind of added in. MATLAB, just so more user friendly for me and I can show it to people, um, is I can then as well basically 
run it through a number of times, just exporting the results out of Excel, testing for different ones, and save it, export all the results, save and compare. Um, so there are, but there are certain, if you're gonna, I know I'm going for a certain power, I'll probably only try like three different poll combinations. Yes, there are like a huge number more, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just kind of what I can do at this stage, and I'll see how far I can get with testing other ones, because I have got other machines I want to test as well. Um, so I'm also testing things like the uh, W salient permanent magnet machine, uh, which kind of works almost as a synchronous reluctance principle. Um, and I want to do some more flux concentrated stuff with my permanent magnets as well, and see if you can put uh, ferrite magnets, which are like not as bad as uh, rarer permanent magnets, and see if you can insert them in places in electrically excited machines to help with uh, producing a stronger flux, so they're more effective. Great. Sorry, Thank you so much. <laughs> no, that's all right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, the next presentation is going to be given by Hugh Thomas. Uh, he will be talking about peer-to-peer -peer trading for enhancing domestic electric vehicle charging with renewable energy. That's a great topic. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you to Sophie for leading me into the topic of um, renewable energy. Um, so, but I'm going to be focusing more on domestic solar PV panels and how we can encourage more renewable and energy charging of electric vehicles at home. So I'm going to be talking about one of the papers that I've written, um, which got published last year, um, called Plus Energy Matching, Improving Peer-to-Peer -peer Energy Trading Auctions for Electric Vehicle Owners. Um, so apologies if you came to my um, engineering seminar that I did, because it's going to be the same presentation, so try not to look too bored. Um, but let's get started. So, the scenario that I'm focusing on is one where we have a number of households in, say, a small residential area. Um, the households may have an electric vehicle themselves, um, so therefore have an electric vehicle charger at their house. Um, the household owner may be away for work during the day, which leaves their driveway vacant, their electric vehicle charge point vacant. Um, so it's kind of like, how can we use that resource? to basically get more people driving electric cars and improve the ability for them to charge. So, I mean, if you've ever visited like a big city or anything, you know it can be quite hard to find somewhere to park. The parking can be quite expensive. If you've got an electric car, finding charge points that work can be quite difficult too. Um, so it's kind of being able to use all of that together to basically get more people driving electric cars and increase the amount of renewable energy that is used. So here's a little diagram of the system we have. So the households may have solar panels on their roof, so they produce some energy. So during the middle of the day, when the owner is away, their domestic base load is going to be lower, because there's going to be fewer appliances on at the house. Um, but it also coincides with the time where solar generation is the highest. So we've got this green stripy area of the surplus solar energy generation. So that's energy which is being generated um, by the solar panels, but is not being used by the house. So one possibility is to sell that back to the grid. Um, so you get feed-in tariffs and smart contracts which allow you to sell energies back to the grid. But that's typically for quite a small price. So I think like at the moment you can pay about 18 pence per kilowatt hour for electricity, but you can only sell it back to the grid for about five or six pence. So you know, you're making some money, but not making a lot. So what can we do instead with electric vehicle charging to make the most of that energy? So I'm looking at an auction-based system where we have the EVs that arrive, who want to find somewhere to park, they want to charge up, so they're going to be putting bids into the auction. So the bid basically consists of a price they're willing to pay for the electricity, how much electricity they actually need. You know, different cars have got different sized batteries, some will be more charged than others. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so the energy requirements, and then also the departure time. So are they going to be there for the entire day? Are they just going to be there for a couple of hours? Um, and then on the other side, we've got the houses which produce asks. So it's basically like the bid, which is for selling energy. Um, so they're asking for a price that they're willing to accept for selling that electricity. So how many pence per kilowatt hour do they want to accept? Do they want to accept five or six pence? Or do they want the car to pay them 12 or 13 pence for the electricity? And then also how much surface energy they have available. So we're assuming that they can predict fairly accurately what their solar energy generation profile is going to be for the day. Um, and yeah, so then it goes into this auction system. So the key part of the auction is how do we match each house with a car to charge? You know, each house has only got one electric vehicle charge point. So we're assuming for the purposes of this study, 
then it's going to be a one-to-one -one auction matching. So each house can only be matched to a single car, and the car can only go to a single house. Whether this is a realistic scenario in real life is debatable, but it makes it quite interesting to study because the how good the matching is in the auction depends very much on the results of it. So how much energy is sold, how much the electric vehicles get to charge, um, it makes the matching very important. So here's just a basic introduction to double auctions. Um, many of you may have come across this sort of thing already. So you've got um, the price on the left axis, your quantity on the x axis, um, then you've got demand. So this is how much energy is being um, asked for by different cars. So each of the flat lines represents a bid which has been placed by an electric vehicle. And then going up, you've got supply. So this is how much energy is available from the different houses, where again, each flat part of the curve corresponds to a house with energy available. So you end up from an intersection point, at which point there's, the demand is um, like falls below supply um, for a price. So basically at this point, um, the next person who wants to buy energy is not willing to pay as much as the next person who wants to sell energy. So in theory, no more trades can take place. So what I'm looking at is a matching mechanism to determine which of the houses um, should be matched with which of the electric vehicles. Should necessarily be this one matched with this one, and that one matched with that one, or is there a better way of matching them together to basically get a better outcome? So I've compared four um, auction mechanisms which have been found in literature. So the first being cheapest ask. So that's just basically the case of like you match all, you pull the bids in order from highest to lowest. You put all the asks in order from lowest to highest, and then the EV with the highest bid gets matched to the house with the lowest ask, and we keep on going until no more matching can take place. Um, then building on that is called like sufficient energy for cheapest ask. So it's the same principle, but you're basically for every electric vehicle it has so much energy requirement. So you're only going to put the houses which can match that energy requirements into the auction um, to match that particular EV. So basically the EV is guaranteed to get the energy that it asks for, which isn't necessarily the case with the cheapest asset mechanism. Thirdly, we've got minimized cost. So this is an optimization problem where it basically looks at the different possibilities of trades within the auction and aims to minimize the total cost to the electric vehicle owners. So which house should match which EV to minimize the cost of the energy being bought. So the pi is the cost of energy from either the trading in the auction or from the grid. And then the fourth one was buyer and seller utility. Again, it's another optimization problem, um, which has been found in literature. So it basically takes into account the amount of energy that the electric car needs compared to how much it would get from, like, from being matched in the auction, um, plus the difference in price between what the person is asking for and what the trade price in the auction would be. But can it be improved? So we have a scenario here where we've got two houses and two electric vehicles. House A has got 20 kilowatt hours of energy available during the day. House B has got 50 kilowatt hours. They've got slightly different asset prices. So house A is asking for 11 pence per kilowatt hour. House B is asking for 10 pence per kilowatt hour. Then we've got two electric vehicles. So electric vehicle one arrives at 10 o'clock in the morning and it's got a 15 kilowatt hour battery or it requires 15 kilowatt hours of energy and it's willing to pay 12 pence per kilowatt hour. EV2 arrives an hour later, that's 11. It's got a 30 kilowatt hour battery, and it's willing to pay 12 pence per kilowatt hour, the same price as EV1. So, based on the four auction matching mechanisms that I've just shown you, what happens when EV1 arrives is it's going to be matched with house B. Um, that's because, for instance, like the price, it's willing to pay 12 pence, but that one only asks for 10 pence compared to 11 pence. Um, and yeah, so in all of the other four matching mechanisms, that's what happens. But then when EV2 arrives an hour later, it requires 30 kilowatt hours. But house A, the only one available, only has 20 kilowatt hours of solar energy available to charge that EV. So EV2 doesn't fully charge. So if we swap the matching around, and EV2 <coughs> matches with house A, um, house B, sorry, and EV1 matches with house A then we find that both EVs fully charge, and there's not so much difference between the cost that they pay. So this leads me on to my um, proposed closest energy matching mechanism. So this one basically is very simple. You look for every EV, you look and see how much energy it requires, and then you have to find the house which can offer the closest amount of solar energy to that EV. So if an EV requires 18 kilowatt hours, and there's a house which has got 20 kilowatt hours, 
then those two are match. If it was another house which had 25 kilowatt hours, then because 20 is closer than to 80 when the 25 is, that one wouldn't match. Um, so basically, it tries to make a more optimal decision at the time um, when you don't know what the future information is going to be. You, know, you don't know what other cars are going to arrive later on. You don't know how much energy is going to be needed. So it's trying to make the best use of the available information at the time and making a more efficient allocation. So that brings me on to the results. So we've got the four mechanisms that we discussed earlier, plus number five, which is the closest energy matching. Um, so this first graph, graph here um, shows the departure charge of the electric vehicles. So the blue bar is the percentage which would depart with 100% of their energy requirement. And then green going down is like less and less of the energy fulfilled. Um, so as we can see, there's significantly more electric vehicles that would depart fully charged with closest energy matching compared to the other auction mechanisms. Um, we get fewer EVs which depart with significantly less energy than they asked for. Um, so overall, it basically improves the amount of energy that the electric vehicle is getting and improves the state of charge they get when they depart. And then up here, that's just the same thing, but in numerical form. So you can see that the mean charge um, is a lot higher with mechanism five. Um, and then again, like the number of EVs that would depart with say less than 50% of their full charge is significantly lower. So then we look at like how much of the demand is satisfied with solar energy. So obviously EVs are good to a point, but to make full use of the FBM green credentials, you need to try and increase the amount of renewable energy which is used. Um, so this is again shown with five different auction mechanisms. And we can see the like, mechanism five, um, you know, you're getting about 95% of medium as the demand of the energy which is supplied by solar renewable energy um, compared to something which is a lot lower for some of the other auction mechanisms. So we're getting much more green charging for EVs. Um, last day of results, we've got a comparison with the grid energy required to fully charge the EV. So if the EV can't fully charge based on the energy they get in the auction, they're going to want to be able to use the grid to make sure they can depart with the full charge. Um, so this is comparison, oops, oh my gosh, what did I do there? Okay, um, right, so this is the comparison between the five mechanisms. Can you click it again? Yeah. Thank you, Martha. Um, so yes, this is the comparison which shows the, um, how much energy is required from the grid to fully charge those electric vehicles. Um, so in this case, the lower the better. And we can see that it uses about a third of the um, grid energy to make sure these cars are fully charged when we depart, um, which is really good for in trying to increase the number of electric vehicles which can be hosted in the grid, um, given the current constraints on the grid. And then finally, we're just looking at this is the economic analysis. So we can see the buyer cost in the blue bars and the seller profit in the red bar. So we can see there is, um, it's similar between the mechanisms, but there is a small decrease in buyer cost and there is an increase in seller profit um, because the sellers are selling more of their renewable energy, so they're getting more money from it. And also because the buyers are getting more money from the auction at a more profitable price compared to buying from the grid, um, again, there's a decrease in the buyer cost as well. So basically, just to conclude, like, this process energy matching mechanism is working for one-to-one -one matching of households and electric vehicles, and has been shown to improve the amount of energy that the EVs can get from renewable sources and also decrease costs. So thank you very much. Any questions? Sure. So um, I mean, that's quite a tricky thing to do because obviously you have no idea necessarily how many cars may arrive. Um, it may be possible to predict based on like previous usage patterns, um, but there may be more efficient ways of doing it based on the current information. Um, but if you don't know how much demand is going to be in the future, it's sort of for the system to work overall. You're relying on there being enough cars and enough houses. Um, we find that as the number of cars or houses decreases. Um, the system doesn't work so well anyway. 
Um, so I think that in my studies, I was using about 50, 40 or 50 cars and houses. Um, and that number sort of seems to be the sweet point in terms of you know, getting it to work based on the future information. Um, I mean, one thing that you do notice is that because um, it's based on closest matching, um, if this EV2 didn't turn up, then it has to be, because it's got 50 kilowatt hours of energy, you know, that may not get to charge. So if you have lots of houses which have got lots, uh, which will produce huge amounts of energy, then they're the ones which are least likely to match in the auction. Um, so you're relying on more electric vehicles coming into the market than there are houses, really, to ensure that the houses which have got really big energy um, supply can actually be matched and will trade. So I'm not sure if I really answer, answer your question, but yeah. Great. Yeah, next question. Um, thank you. That was a really good um, presentation. Um, I'm just wondering about whether, are you assuming that the houses have solar panels or is this an incentive for people to get solar panels? And I just, I just ask that because obviously most of the houses that are getting solar panels now aren't private housing estates. They are um, houses built for like social, social housing. Type. Sure. And if this would be something that could be used on a social housing scheme, but then I wonder how that would work because social housing schemes usually put solar panels, or it's, it's a good thing they put solar panels because they, the people who live in the houses don't pay for them, they get put them on private. And then I'm wondering how that would work because if it, they're getting a solar panel for free and selling the energy, how does that interrupt? Have you thought about that kind of thing? Sure, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think to answer the first point, for the purpose of the study, we are assuming that the houses do have solar panels on them. Um, you know, we're assuming they're privately owned, they own the electric vehicle, they own solar panels. Um, I think that it would be an incentive for people to get solar panels as well. Um, you know, we can see that they're getting higher profit than they would be if they were, you know, they'd be in, if they didn't have solar panels, you know, they wouldn't be making any money. Um, so this is another revenue income stream for those houses should they decide to put solar panels on. Um, in terms of if the houses were, um, if the solar panels weren't necessarily owned by the house owner, um, I mean, that's an interesting point. I think that you know there has to be some sort of sharing scheme set up. Um, so whether the homeowner did benefit from the income they were getting from EV charging at that point, or whether it be whoever paid for the solar panels to be installed in the first place. Um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, if, if the homeowner didn't have a battery to store the energy in during the day, then that energy is going to be lost to them anyway. So, you know, even if it is just a way for the person who paid for the help, the solar panels to get some extra income, you know, it's no detriment to the homeowner. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, really interesting, uh, really interesting piece of, piece of work that poses lots of questions. So uh, maybe I was a little bit of a devil's advocate on, on this scenario. I guess um, you, uh, this would essentially be some kind of a business that was essentially a competitor to the to the existing traders in the market of energy upon the basis that essentially your your energy distributor doesn't give you a very good deal at buying back electricity at one price compared with what it, it sells to you at. So I guess this is an alternative company that would then be more attractive. And I guess I guess what I could see if I was the driver of EV1 and your company was going to match me with house uh, with house A. I guess I'm going to look for one of your competitors who will turn around and say we guarantee that we'll match you with the house that gives me the that gives me as the driver of EV1 the lowest price. And uh, so I'm immediately going to defect from your company to another company that offers me a different uh, a different deal. So you've got a sort of a game theory problem, I guess. There. Sure. I mean, you're completely correct. Um, house A, you are paying a little bit more for your energy than you would be um, with House B. However, if we go back to the results, um, we do find that um, you know the buyer cost is still the lowest um, compared to different across all the buyers. It, it would yeah. be it would be good, but for me, as an individual customer, I, I guess it depends how often you use the scheme. Right, you know, because the more often you use the scheme, the more chance you've got of like on average lowering your cost. And maybe if they're on a one-off, there may be a cheaper alternative. But it depends, like you know, you're not doing your part to benefit the others. Then, so I guess it depends, kind of like how you know how self-centered you want to be. You know, do you care only about the profit for yourself, or do you care about kind of helping your fellow EV drivers? <laughs> Yeah, most people, if they buy petrol at the pump, they go to the petrol station that sells it to them the cheapest. Yeah. Whether, uh, yeah, whatever the other implications of using one supplier or another are. 
Sure. I mean, it's a good point. And I guess it depends how it would be presented to the person. It's like, instead of it being a company, it'd be individual homeowners who will sign up to the scheme. So it depends whether the person in the EV could see the different prices or whether they were just matched and they were told what the price was going to be. And the price is lower than the price that they're willing to pay. So, you know, whether it's two pence lower or three pence lower, you know, it's still lower than what they were willing to pay. But yeah, no, thank you, it's a good point. I'm giving you a hard time on Yeah. <laughs> Right, great, thank you so much. Oh, great. Oh, we got another question. Yeah. I was like, have you considered uh, battery storage as well? Because a lot of now uh, homeowners who use photovoltaics have um, are starting to install their own battery systems. And with that as well comes an issue which some people have been starting to report of um, kind of almost parasitic issues where if there are kind of interesting flooding, even like they're requiring a little bit for the grid, even if they're exporting a lot throughout the day, they're still kind of getting very high tariffs. Would that impact the scheme at all? Yeah, I mean, I haven't considered battery storage. Um, this has only been about trading of the energy as soon as it's been produced. Um, I think in reality, what you'd also do is instead of only selling to one EV, you would enable the houses to be able to sell back to a grid and they could benefit all the EVs. Um, but that's not one. That's not why I wanted to study because I found the problem of one-to-one -one matching quite interesting. Because as I mentioned at the start, you know, the important the how the uh, matching algorithm works really differs in the outcome of it. Um, but yeah, you could do there are probably better implement, implementations in real life where you would use battery storage and you would be able to trade to other EVs rather than just the one as part of your house. And is, it, is this part, is your PhD partnered with anyone, say like the business school for setting up this scheme? I was just wondering, if, or is it just kind of the, the theory of a scheme rather than it being implemented? No, it's more just kind of like background theory to yeah, it. So yeah. this is the first part of it. What I'm looking at now is more from like the grid operator's point of view. So how many electric vehicles can be charged within the network? All right, thank you. Thank that you was much. a great presentation. Uh, all right, you're 15 minutes late, so uh, hopefully you can get on time to lunch. All right, our next presenter will be Aidan Duffy. He will be presenting. He will be presenting predicting leading edge erosion progression on a wind turbine blade. Lots of wind turbine stuff. <laughs> this session. Yeah, you're done. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, so I'll start off from here. So it's looking at predicting um, progression of erosion on wind turbine blades. I'll come on to why that's important in a bit. Um, but first, just a bit of sort of background. So Sophie actually covered quite a lot of um, the kind of the growth part of this. Uh, but at the top right there, there's a graph showing the growth of installed capacity of offshore wind turbines from 2017 to 2021. So you can clearly see on there there's, there's an increase. Um, a lot of that's dominated by China, but the next biggest sector of that is, is actually the UK. So there's a huge amount of UK growth in offshore wind there. Um, and what that means is there are more turbines, which means you need to conduct more repairs and more maintenance. And the maintenance costs are a significant portion of total cost of offshore wind. So this plot at the bottom there says about 18.9, 19% of total cost goes towards maintenance and repair. Um, so the more you have, the more absolute money that that's going to cost. And the need for more turbines means they're being located further offshore. So with an increase from 15 to 100 kilometers offshore, you might be doubling those maintenance costs, and that's a big um, drop in the actual profit that the uh, suppliers, sorry, not suppliers, the owners of the wind farms are having. That's less money to reinvest to help growth again. Um, and on the flip side of this coin, there's lead edge erosion of wind turbine blades. So this is impacts of particular matter, such as rain, um, and the wind turbine tips are going at very high speeds, up to about 200 miles an hour. So there's a lot of kinetic energy and that causes erosion of the turbine blades and a reduction in the aerodynamic efficiency and therefore less energy being produced by the wind turbines themselves. Um, so there's a cost incurred from that. And the point of this is there's some balance point where the cost of repairs and maintenance will be outweighed by the loss of profit from energy. 
So on this front, the plug part that's kind of missing here is the, the Y. Why looking at making this model to predict the progression of erosion, and that's because there's a huge gap in literature for accurately modeling this progression and where on the turbines that actually covers. Um, and that's important because where it's located and the amount of the turbine leading edge that it's located over will affect the amount of energy which is lost. So in terms of accurate re-predicting and analyzing the energy losses, it's really important to have an accurate model of the coverage and the progression of the erosion. Um, so the first step of this is looking at the damage rate, so how quickly the erosion progresses on the wind turbine blades. Um, and this was done as a recreation of an industry standard model. So one of the partners I'm working with, uh, Siemens Gamisa Renewable Energy. Um, and I have some access to the original model later on. So I was able to use uh, realistic values for material properties um, in order to get, again, better, more accurate results on that. Um, and here you can see on the plot, it's a function effectively of the impact velocity. Uh, so that's going to be partly because of, partly due to the size of the particles, so the rain, rain rate, or the intensity, and also where on the blade that is. Uh, so further towards the tip, it's going to be faster, and therefore the impact speed will be higher. Um, so you can see as the rain rate increases and the impact speed increases, there's a significant increase in this rate, so the damage occurs faster and the erosion progresses more quickly. Um, now the second part of this, which is completely novel, so this was produced from scratch effectively, um, is where on the turbine, or where on the leading edge, this erosion occurs. Um, and significantly in a lot of literature studies, it's just taken as, for example, between the front 4% of the leading edge on both the top and the bottom surfaces. Um, in reality, this isn't the case because the blade operates at a positive angle of attack for the majority of the time, which means that okay, oh, well, well it means that the impact of the particles, generally speaking, is on the lower surface. So where you've got the kind of the lighter colours on these plots, that's where you're going to get the highest levels of erosion, the highest rate, and you're going to get the most damage, and it's going to progress sideways from that. Um, so all of this coupled with a wind uh, resource, which was taken from a wind farm itself over two years, so it has a seasonal effect in there as well. So obviously you've got generally higher winds and more rain, etc. in winter, so it accounts for that too. Um, and it's all kind of coupled <coughs> together to get a distribution and an intensity of where the particle impacts are going to occur. And the third part of this one is the distribution of the roughness elements themselves. Um, so the parameters for this were derived from data from rain erosion tests. So it's an example of a rig on that. And effectively, you have a fast whirling arm. Um, so we're going at much higher speeds for accelerated testing. And then a simulated rain field, which is tightly controlled to represent a certain a rain rate on that. And you get particle impacts on the surface of a test sample and you can simulate over a certain amount of time and then you get parameters such as the depth and the distribution of the elements. And this was all incorporated into this model along with the coverage and the damage rate in order to get something which represents the distribution of erosion on the surface. So that's the example image got in the bottom left there, um, which is showing the sort of the distributed elements and also an increased kind of depth of erosion at that around about that seven degree point in this case where the erosion is initiating and then it advances outwards towards the um, in this case the bottom surface more but also towards the top surface too. Um, so this is a kind of highly adaptable as well. So you can change almost all of these inputs quite easily. So the amount of rain, the wind speeds, uh, for example, of turbine operating parameters, um, or the turbine itself, and that also the blade profile or the aerofoils, they're all relatively easy to just change in the model and then rerun re run it so it can be used for different situations, different ratings of turbines, different types, etc. Um, and then there's a bit of validation here as well. 
So the first of these is, is a span, so the radius of the blade from the root to the tip. Um, so this was done with access to inspection data uh, for, in this case, Horns Rev 2, wind farm over three inspection campaigns at uh, five, six, and eight, five, six, and nine years of operation um, on here. So the graph at the bottom left there is showing all of the instances which were quoted as erosion in the inspection reports. Um, and you can see there's quite clearly a velocity below which there's not really any erosion occurring. Um, and also gets more gradual as that velocity is decreasing. And that's because there's less kinetic energy from the impacts of the particles. And therefore, it's just not causing the materials itself to erode. Um, and then on the right side, there is some simulation results which um, were run here for a rain intensity of 1,000 millimetres a year and a mean wind speed of 9.5 metres a second, which are both quite representative of offshore conditions. Um, and you can see that for, uh, for well, further towards the root section, so 70% along the blade, so 0.7% of the span there, um, it's taking over nine years for any erosion to occur, and that kind of follows on with what you can see in the inspection reports themselves with the similar velocity that it's less likely that erosion is actually going to occur there because of the low wind speed. And then the other side of the validation is where, where along the cord of the blade is happening, so where along the distance of the airport section, for example. Um, and again, there's a sort of clear correlation in this one. So the images at the top right are in images from inspection reports again. Um, and it's slightly hard to see, but um, the erosion on these is all centered towards the lower side of the blade, um, which again, the model, as you can see in the example image at the bottom there, is also towards the bottom side of the blade there. So it's uh, quite well validated and also looked at the average coverage over the inspection reports along with this case which was for sort of a medium level of erosion over four years, uh, this was for, um, and you can see that there are quite close comparisons between the two. Um, yeah, so as I kind of alluded to at the start, um, a lot of the coverage in studies is taken really from assumptions and approximations. There's no real sort of modeling um, or incorporation of actual and representative distributions. And like I said, this has quite a significant effect on what the actual aerodynamic properties are and therefore the annual energy production uh, that is predicted for certain models. So a lot of models over predict the energy loss uh, because there aren't these accurate predictions in there in the first place. Um, so what's the use of this model, really? So there's two sides which could be followed on in my PhD, in my project. The first of these is the kind of experimental side, and that's shown, or the progression of that is shown in these images here. So to the left is the sort of output from MATLAB, and then there's a CAD model there, and then the third one is a 3D produced or 3D manufactured section with the kind of erosion parameters or the erosion geometry printed on that which was tested in the wind tunnel um, over here. Um, and then the second side of this will be the computational side used to um, look at more cases and lots of different erosion cases in order to produce a distribution of annual energy production so the amount of energy the turbine is producing over a year um, in lots of different erosion cases, so different velocities, different wind intensities, and this is incorporation of the erosion at different spans along the blade, and then that's put into a blade element momentum model, which effectively reproduces the blade and then simulates the power produced, and from that you can analyze the amount of energy which is produced from that one. So the idea of this is ultimately to assess what the profit loss, the monetary losses from the AEP reduction is, and then also be able to 
compare that with the cost required for repair and maintenance, and then find a sort of balance point where for operators it becomes uh, more profitable to go and do repair, so the optimal time to go and uh, conduct repairs on wind turbines. So, thank you very much. Um, Any questions? Um, hi, so what kind of erosion is it? Is it uh, chemical erosion? Yeah, so this is all taken from assuming erosion from rain droplets. So just, just rain and the high speeds of the blades as they go around is enough to uh, cause, cause erosion of the material. There are um, other conditions, less so offshore. But certainly onshore, you have more particular matter, things like soils and rain, and also things like insects, which can cause it. But offshore, generally, it's less than that. And maybe hail, which will obviously be much more massive, causes more damage. Uh, but this study, at the moment, is only really on rain erosion. Yeah? So I'm not sure if this has been covered in the school, but how would you repair that sort of erosion in a working bay? Um, so there are, there are different methods of repairing. So one, one of them for low levels is kind of a tape. So you put a tape over the area to try and cover it over effectively. Um, or you have more in-depth repairs, which will be someone going on there and then effectively filling it in and then smoothing over to try and get another, a smooth and kind of continuous surface again. But there are also aerodynamic effects with that because it's very hard to achieve that smooth surface and the integration of the original aerofoil with the repaired section. So there are aerodynamic losses still associated with the repairs, although it may improve it slightly, um, but that's something else that initially was planned for this study, but they're not really the time to go onto it, but it is definitely something which you know, could be looked at in the future. Yeah, any other questions? I was going to ask some questions, but they're out of time, so I'll ask them. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry, I'll see you. Oh, well, exactly, just quickly, I'm just wondering, because you were looking at Anne Holt's, Anne, was it Hornsey the other one? Anne Holt Wind Farm, um, yep. for the wind distribution, and the inspection data there from Hornsey too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's just like, Anne Holt is like one of the, it's got a really good, it's generally quite a good wind farm as far as I'm aware, with like quite high capacity factors, it's quite an effective one. Um, do you think that kind of with the rise and like how they kind of position different turbines in relation to each other with like you know technology with the LES simulations and how like they're setting up new ones for the distancing, not an aerodynamic person but I've read about this. Um, do you think that's having an a, like in trying to improve the aerodynamic performance? Do you think that that is and like reducing the weight and things? Do you think that has had an ad, like an adverse effect from what you've been doing on things like erosion um, via rain and other? I do wonder if it has an impact at times, if that's like made it worse or better at the same time, or it's had like yeah. uh, Sorry, it's a bit of a tough one. But. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so I mean, so, some of the studies will focus on trying to improve the power production, obviously, so the, the lift production, etc., through the blade, um, and I suppose, yeah, that could, that could have some adverse effects. Um, um, and also, well, the, the, generally speaking, the tip speed of the blade doesn't increase much. So even, even if they get bigger, the kind of rotational speed reduces, and that tip speed kind of stays the same-ish. So the, the levels of erosion themselves aren't getting potentially too much worse in that case. It's more the magnitude of the new wind turbines going up and then sort of costs sort of associated with the conducting repairs and more so hiring sort of ships and vessels in order to be get to go out and do the repairs. Yeah. yeah. Also sorry on, on the air dynamic side, so part of this is the particle impact. So around the airfoil surface obviously you have the streamlined which will carry the particles, uh, so the rain droplets. Um, so something could be done on the aerodynamic side for that. So you can 
adapt the streamlines in order to kind of deviate the particles more potentially, then you could um, you could reduce the amount of impacts there because you're deviating the particles more, which is another way that you could alleviate some of the erosion on there. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, keep that for All right, so I think we are done with the 10 minutes presentations. Uh, we're going to have a couple of three minute presentations. Uh, there will be no QA for three minute presentations, but obviously, if you have questions, you can ask the presenters later after the presentation. Okay, so the next presenter is Arisman Scholar. And the presentation titled Op Optimized Design and Analysis of Grid Connected Photovoltaic Systems for Power Quality Improvement. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Ashmat. I am a second year PhD student. I'm working on the power quality, uh, uh, power quality improvement of grid connected PV systems. So, in last few decades, with the advancement in technology and due to concerns about global warming and climate change, the demand for renewable energy sources has been increased. Uh, power generation from a uh, photovoltaic system is considered as a reliable and <coughs> effective source of energy. And uh, this image uh, shows the solar irradiance level uh, uh, all over the world that there is great potential for installation of these systems. Similarly, this graph indicates there is great, uh, there is exponential increase in the installation of photovoltaic systems in most of the countries all over the world. So, when it comes to the power generation from photovoltaic uh, panels, uh, the energy generated from PV panels is generally stored in batteries. But when we talk about the batteries, it comes with the issues of, uh, like when we do the manufacturing of batteries, it may cause the harmful emissions to the environment, and also it increases the cost of the system. <coughs> so to deal with this issue, the researchers came up, came up with a solution of grid-connected PV system. In grid-connected PV system, power generated by the PV panels is directly delivered to the grid, which is further delivered to the load points by using the conventional distribution system. So, for grid-connected PV system, uh, the input parameters are solar irradiance and temperature, which are highly dependent on the weather conditions. Moreover, the uh, renewable energy, uh, the energy generated by PV panels is in DC signal. So, the national grid basically operates in AC signal at nominal frequency of 50 hertz. So to make to convert this DC generation into the required form of AC signal, we require number of power converters. So a power converter is an effective device to achieve this goal of converting DC generation into required form of AC. Uh, power electronic converters, however, are potential source of harmonics, which are high frequency components. So these high frequency components harm or harmonics may be injected to the system and may disrupt the system performance. Similarly, as I mentioned that input parameters of the photovoltaic system are highly dependent on the temperature. So with the variation in these input signals, the output uh, voltages and current waveforms at the output side of the, of the power converter may also vary. So to deal with these issues, uh, in my PhD, I'm working. Uh, I'm working uh, to develop a novel control strategy for these power electronic converters. By using that uh, novel uh, control strategy, system would be able to maintain constant DC voltage at the output of the PV system, which is for the delivered to the AC grid without any fluctuations and irrespective of the variations at the input side of the PV system. Similarly, uh, the voltage quality would be maintained and uh, harmonics level would be monitored at the coupling point where the, this PV system is connected with the grid. So harmonics level would be monitored that if it's in within the range of uh, IEEE given standards, which is IEEE 519 standard for the power quality, 
and the range for the given uh, the harmonic level is less than 5%. So with the increase, increase injection of this system uh, to the national grid, it's important and crucial to work on the uh, harmonics uh, level monitoring and power quality of the system. Otherwise, rather than getting the advantage of a clean and renewable energy, we will be paying in terms of power quality and system dis disturbances. Thank you. All right, uh, our next presenter was supposed to be Heather Sanders, but she emailed me and said she got COVID, so I hope she gets well soon. Uh, so we go to the, our next presenter, Sam Armit. So Sam is going to talk about development of measurement sensors for large undersea power pumps. Hello, yes, so as I just mentioned, I'm going to be talking about um, the development of pipeline measurement uh, sensors for uh, for foam pigs. It's a lot to unpack there, so I'll uh, I'll try and run through that in a bit more detail. So uh, pipelines um, need a lot of maintenance um, uh, from to, to make sure that they're not being uh, clogged up by uh, various things like uh, damage or debris. Um, so to do that, they send down um, tool uh, pipeline inspection tools known as pigs. Um, these can come in a variety of different forms, but uh, the form that I've been looking at is um, roughly about, well, I've been f uh, working with the uh, partner company that I'm working with, uh, Pipeline Innovations, on their tool of the Pathfinder, um, as shown in the top right there. Um, and it has roughly the internal design shown there. So it's a, f a large foam body that, um, that inside the foam body there's magnets floating in a ring around the central uh, sensing logging system. So that as the, pipe, as the um, tool moves through a pipeline, if it finds a part of the pipeline where the, bottom, the, the diameter is slightly, uh, slightly uh, narrower, uh, the magnets are moved in toward the centers, and they can detect that slight change in, in bore diameter, which is probably a good sign of uh, either debris or damage. Uh, so this is quite a good design across the board. Um, it picks up all these things without, and it's able to pass through quite narrow pipelines and very heavy damaged pipelines. Uh, the main problem with it is that uh, there's a bit of a lack of sensitivity when it's only very minor um, changes in bore. So I've been working on a, a novel sensing system uh, to go inside there. Uh, rather than replace the whole system, I've been trying to improve the sensitivity of the, uh, the existing magnetic system. So I've been uh, to do that. I've been uh, ins installing some. Uh, well, I've been uh, simulating the installation of some permeable material in, in various shapes. Um, to try and improve the amount of the uh, flux, not only not only the raw flux getting through to the sensors, but also trying to improve the change in flux between um, the the out the non-expanded form, the, the non-compressed and the compressed form tool. <coughs> so as you can see on the uh, the diagrams on the right, um, with no with that's just a magnet in free space, and the sensor would be somewhere down here. Uh, on the the bottom one, when you've got some uh, material in, in the in the mix as well, you can see that, that channels the flux in, so you get a lot more flux in the sensor, which is, is, is a good start, but obviously uh, if I want to improve the change in flux from uh, the movement of the magnet, there's uh, a lot there's more work to be done in terms of the, uh, the shapes. So I've uh, been having a bit of an iterative improvement of uh, kind of shape designs, so a few notable ones are a concentrator design on the back, so that it channels the flux in towards the sensors rather than letting it escape into the far field. There's more of a kind of more of a classically funneling design that again channels the flux toward the sensor, uh, as you'd expect. Uh, but then I've also looked at some a lot of the complicated arrangements of these, mixtures of the previous designs with extra bits added in as well, like the, the diamond shown there. So in terms of the results I've been getting from that, um, so on the left shows the uh, kind of baseline. This is what the tool would normally produce. Uh, the interesting bit here is the, the gradient of the line that, uh, that corresponds to the sensitivity of the tool in, uh, mi in millitesimals yeah, per millimeter. Um, so the higher the gradient, that higher the sensitivity of the tool. Uh, so we're looking to try and improve that across the board. Um, so in the bottom uh, right here, we've got the, uh, some of the results from some of the simulations I've done, some of the more promising ones. So the, the purple line there is the uh, the combined system I showed of, of, of this one and uh, this one, so combining just those two together. Um, there's quite an improvement, as you can see, there's about four times the sensitive, uh, 
sensitivity there across the, the full uh, uh, compression range. However, you might notice that there's the, the, cur the line curves up a lot more towards the high compression range, which is not really of the, uh, well, it's, it's the rare end of where the tool has been compressed to. So ideally, we want a, a more a straighter line, a less uh, kind of exponential curve. So the diamond design there that's a lot more, a bit more complicated, uh, does a lot better in terms of that. Uh, so flatter curve with the, with the you can uh, vary with inflection depending on exactly the parameters of the design. So that's uh, yeah, that's what I've been working on. Thank you very much. All right, so um, yeah, so obviously if you have questions from Irish Uncle Sam, uh, you're free to ask them afterward. Uh, so the next presentation is from Shiksan Son. I, I assume that's the video one. Yes. Uh, so yeah, we were going to watch the video. Hello, everyone. Yeah, wonderful, yes. we can start. <laughs> My name is Shi Xin Sun. I'm a second student. Today I will talk about air pollution analysis and predict. Why I do this research? Because recently the air pollution could very harm impact on human health. This part is the research method. For the experiment, I, the experimental data were provided by the official monitoring stations. And I will using the data to analyze, analyze the changes of air quality during past 10 years and uh, I will make the predict models and I will using the tools like the Python and Excel. This part are some results of my research. First is the variation of pollutants in Beijing. This figure is created by Python and I use the method of Pearson regulation method. The data is from 2013 to 2021. It has the same main pollutants trends. Uh, through these lines, we can see the PM2.5, PM10, NO2, SO2, and CO has a higher volume in winter and has lower volume in summer. And only the O3 has higher volume in winter in summer and has lower volume in winter mm, and uh, the data has a slow degrade trend during these eight years there are the there are the results of two different models i will using the multiple linear regression and svm as the predicted model first i collect the 10 years date of Beijing and the status of training date and the testing date and 7 versus 3 and also I will in the weather and the pollutants of the train the, there are the results of these two different model you can see the SVM has higher accuracy rate precision ratio and recall rate so it's better than the multiple linear regulation so SVM is a good model for the air pollution predict This part is the conclusion. The analysis of air pollution data can give us an in-depth understanding of pollution and provide a reference volume for air pollution control and the, air, the prediction model of air pollution based on a large amount of historical data achieves ideal accuracy. And I will continue to work on air pollution prediction to improve the accuracy. Okay, that's all. Thank you for listening and uh, any questions.
individuals and uh, uh, weak features of incident flow around the polygonal cylinder. Companies now. I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm organizing or I'm presenting. <laughs> so uh, yeah. All right. Uh, my today's presentation is about uh, flow separation from polygonal cylinders. So first, let's define what flow separation is. Well, uh, we have when we have an object in front of flow, Floyd flow. Uh, there is a phenomena called boundary layer, which is actually the layer of the fluid that is in the immediate vicinity of the solid surface. Flow separation is basically uh, separation or the attachment of this boundary layer from the surface of that solid surface. So if you look at this picture, you'll see that when the flow comes to the circular cylinder, as an example, the boundary layer forms, but after, after some time moving on the surface, the boundary layer detached. One of the results of the detachment of this, of this boundary layer from the solid surface is the formation of a recirculation bubble in the back of the cylinder. So uh, this recirculation bubble is actually uh, is a result of the reverse flow velocities uh, from the separation point. So uh, the question now here is, assume that we have uh, free stream flow, free stream flow like wind, ocean, and then we have something in, in the way of it. Let's say circular cylinder has a very canonical form of any type of fluid mechanic problem. Then we want to see when the flow separates or where the flow separates. So, uh, well, someone can come up with an idea and says, hey, let's first of all calculate and see how fast the flow goes. So, yeah. Alvin Reynolds, uh, 1842, 1912, proposed the Reynolds number in fluid mechanics. Reynolds number is a very important parameter, which actually helps us to distinguish uh, turbulent flows from laminar flows. So, yeah, if we calculate Reynolds number, or actually if we define Reynolds number first, uh, we'll be able to maybe find these separation points. So, Reynolds number can be defined as this ratio. Velocity, velocity of the free stream times the diameter of the cylinder over the kinematic, veloc kinematic viscosity of the working fluid. Okay, so now we can calculate Reynolds number. Let's say if Reynolds number is 300, then where the separation occurs? Well, if you use experimental facilities or numerical simulation, solving Navier's Stokes equation, we'll be able to calculate that separation, and it will be 108 degrees for a circular cylinder. Then, yeah, the free flow stream will look like something like this. If you change the Reynolds number to 1,000, then the separation angle will be 95 degrees, so it decreased a bit, and the flow stream will look like this. If the Reynolds number is 10,000 or 10 to the power of 4, then the flow separation occurs at 84, and the flow stream will look like this. So, yeah, I know they more or less look like similar, but that's the case. So, all right, we have the numbers, then we can plot the variation of the separation angle versus the Reynolds number. That's great, right? Because that was a question. We wanted to know where the flow separation occurs. So for a circular cylinder, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have Reynolds number, and on the vertical axis, we have the separation angle. So as we decrease the Reynolds number, the separation angle increases, and as we go down, it's a logarithmic kind of function. Uh, the theta s, or the separation angle, becomes constant around 80. Okay, so you might ask, why is it, impo why is it important? Why are you talking about this? Well, think about two cases. In one of the cases, the separation angle is large, case number two. And in case number one, the separation angle is small. So we want to say, okay, why this flow separation thing is important, right? So this flow separation is actually change the main parameters of the recirculation bubbles in the back of the cylinder. If you compare these two, you can see that the wake width, I defined as dW here, and recirculation bubble length, or LF, are totally different in these two cases. Also, the shape and size of these recirculation bubbles are totally different. So these recirculation bubbles can change many things. So we define these two parameters. If you look at the literature, 
you realize that, okay, we have CD, and then we have a straw number. Just let's talk about CD because it's easier. Drag coefficient increases linearly with increasing DW or the wake width. So if you have more wake width, which means if you have less separation angle, then we'll end up with higher drag coefficient. Well, that's not a good thing, right? We can see one example. If you are a fan of the sport, uh, I've never played golf actually, but I really, I really like to do so. Uh, if you're a fan of sport, you know that golf balls are all people have dimples on them. So if you compare the actually the recirculation bubbles or the wake wake width, compare a dimple ball to a smooth ball, you'll see that the wake in the back of the smooth ball is much bigger compared to the dimple ball, and the reason for that is because the dimple ball makes the, uh, the boundary line to reattach the surface just because of the turbulent packages that artificially made by those dimples. So you can see here that uh, a golf ball uh, has, a much, has a much greater, let's say, uh, separation angle, and that gives us uh, much less drag based on the previous graph that we, that we uh, presented. And if you look at the distance that the golf ball can go compared to the smooth ball, it's more or less double. So now it's tangible. Now, now we can see why separation angle is important. Well, because a golf ball goes double times than a smooth ball. And that's not a good idea to use a smooth ball in golf. Don't use that. So yeah, so that's the importance of the thing. So my question was, OK, we know everything about, about circular cylinders. How about other type of cylinders? like polygonal cylinders in general, hexagon, uh, triangle, square, and stuff. So that was actually me there being like, hey, what about polygonal cylinders? I want to know about polygonal cylinders and separation angles on them. Uh, so that was our motivation to go forward and see, hey, we want to know more about polygonal cylinders. So we're going to study these type of cylinders as much as we can, as, as much as time allows. So we did some numerical simulations using Hamilton supercomputer and uh, we try to solve uh, an average sex equation using largely simulation. Uh, we used, as I said, each simulation for us took like 10 days. We used 240 processes or 120 based on the case. And uh, this is the result that I usually want to show about my students. Like, hey, look at this. All of the 24 cases of simulations that I've done is in one slide. So that's the flow actually moving around and doing some funny stuff over there but we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about uh, separation angles. So I found the separation angle based on the, uh, some principles, like say, looking at the mean fields, looking at the instantaneous vorticity fields, looking at the wall shear stress, uh, uh, changing sign of the wall shear stress. But these are too, you know, too deep for Floyd mechanics stuff, so I don't want to talk about that. But anyway, we have the separation angles. So what the funny thing there was that when we look at all of those results together, we found that all of those separation angles actually can be described in three scenarios. So we didn't need to actually go and like, hey, what about this incidence angle? What about that incidence angle? It was just all about three different scenarios. We defined two points, T0 and T1. T1 T0 is the point that has highest height. T1 is the corner of stream. So scenario number one is flow is separates from T0. Scenario number two, flow separates from T1, and number three, flow separates from T1, we attach to surface, and we attach again from T0. But that, that's something that we found. And after that, we were like, okay, we, ch we can check it for different type of cylinders, let's say pentagon cylinder, and we found that that's actually work. It doesn't matter what the instance angle is, we always follow the same scenario. It's always T0 or T1 or both of them. And if there is both of them, there is always a reattachment between the T0 and T1. So, okay, we have T0 and T1, and it's a geometry problem, so we can solve this geometry problem, can't we? So we define, or we provided these analytical equations that can give us the, uh, so theta zero is the angle between T0 and T1, and then based on that, we define theta s, which is the separation angle on polygonal cylinders, and analytically, there's a condition here which is kind of empirical, it was based on the observations that we had, and uh, that makes our equations semi-analytical. That can predict the separation angles on polygonal cylinders. That's the graph uh, if we plot the equations all together. 
So you can see here that, uh, well, we have top separation region, bottom separation region, and also the case of circular cylinder for this particular Reynolds number is also, uh, that, that, that's actually in the way. That it, it shows that the results are all converging to this particular point, which is actually really good for us. We also had some experimental data from the previous works that has been done, and we found that our formula can actually perfectly predict those separation angles, and well, that was good for us. I was, I was very happy with that. So, so that was the result. So, uh, so the thing that I was trying to uh, address uh, was part of my PhD thesis, which, which is basically focusing on uh, fluid-induced vibration. Uh, so fluid-induced vibration is a phenomenon that happens when a flow like wind or current passes objects in the environment and, and form vortex setting or warm common vertex street. So we can see some, some of the examples in the environment. Uh, when the clouds passes the island, the one common vertex street forms, or this is the, this is done. Or, or when the, uh, was it working? Oh, sorry. Uh, or the numerical simulations uh, that matches the, actually, the, what we see in the environment. And, well, beforehand, like, let's say, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it was catastrophic. Like, at Tacoma's Narrow Bridge catastrophe incident, that a bridge that has been built was destroyed one month after uh, they opened it. And uh, after a while they found that, okay, that's, that's partly because of the vortex shedding and other flow-induced vibration phenomena like flutter and galloping. And what we were trying to do uh, during my PhD thesis was to find a way to see, okay, can, can we take these vibrations and uh, change them to uh, renewable uh, sources of energies. Uh, so vortex bladeless wind turbines are new types of wind turbines that has been, I, I don't know if I can say recently, because it's been like 2017 or something, uh, introduced as an alternative to conventional wind turbine. Obviously, if you, if you look at figure 15, you'll see the comparison between a normal wind turbine and a vortex bladeless wind turbine. So both of them can be used in front of wind, but okay, the, the efficiency of, the, of these wind turbines are like 20% maybe less than the conventional wind turbines. So they are not as good right now to be mass produced and be, you know, be used in, house, in houses and stuff. But we think that we might be able, by studying the polygonal cylinders or afterward other type of cylinders, you might be able to find ways to increase the efficiency of these wind turbines so we can get to the point that make them actually economical, so they can be actually built in size and be used. And the good thing about them is that uh, they take less space compared to conventional wind turbines. They're, uh, I mean, the, uh, they take less, less space, uh, the uh, maintenance of them is much, much less compared to conventional wind just, just think about the blades and moving parts, all gone, only one like, some like stud moving around, that's a bit funny as well, like dancing stuff. Uh, and uh, we think that's a good idea. Uh, yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have a question, I'm here. Actually, the point. So, if if you want to put like four or five uh, turbines in one place, because of the blade, the, the, like because of the blades on the conventional wind turbine, you will not be able to do that. But here, you have more space to put those, and, and we know that the amplitude of the vibration is not that big. I mean, that's the purpose. We don't want the amplitude of vibration to go beyond something that we cannot control the thing anymore and become something funny and breaks and stuff. So we, we obviously try to control that, but not too much to get the energy from it, but at the same time, make it economical. Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, firstly, great presentation. I enjoyed that. It was like a nice refresh on a <laughs> like error, error mechanics and stuff that I haven't done in years. So that was very good. I really enjoyed it. 
With, yeah, I do find this interesting because I have seen about uh, the kind of bladeless ones before because obviously you have the helix style um, vertical axis ones and then these kind of seem better in a sense. I guess for me, I mean, I obviously think about, you know, you said the efficiency 20%. Um, do you know how much of that efficiency is wrapped up? It, it, is that in terms of the, uh, like... Oh, um, right foot. Yeah, right. yeah cause, because I guess for me it's the... With, when it comes to these things, that the, where you get a lot of the losses are in the drive. Well, you don't really have a drive train. You're working on imagine some sort of like we said, alternate system, linear generator. I guess that's where I can see a lot of the losses being taken up, rather than on the aerodynamic side of things. So, yeah. do you know how much the aerodynamic stuff is actually the problem, or is it just the kind of fundamental, more electrical problem? I, I think it's both, but I, I've never concentrated on the electrical part. But I, I know that there are aerodynamic obstacles, and the aerodynamic obstacle there is the damping coefficient of uh, these type of cylinders. So uh, we have dampings everywhere, and that, that prevents us to get the enough energy from the wind, particularly because wind has a very uh, air have, has l very low density. But in most of the experiments in this uh, type of uh, work has been done in water because water enables you because it's a high dense fluid enables you to get to that point and, it, and, and it, even if you have some sort of damping uh, that's not that important but if you as soon as you get to the air because the density is very low then even small damping can annoy you and prevent the even even the inside like the, the start of the vibration will be will be stopped like it will not be as good as it should be so yeah, I think I think the answer is, is both. I guess that's for me. I can see the, the limitation of it. Rather, even if you do kind of correct the kind of aerodynamic side, and having that, make sure you've got your vortex sh shedding whatever that you want from it. Is that the actual generation point of view? Because I guess as well, because they they still rely on quite linear flow, do they, or do they work quite well with turbulent air flows? These types. And it's basically turbulent. Uh, yes, it's not. It's not uh, uh, linear. As you so say. you could you could put it in a city because with the horizontal axis ones, they're not yes. great in turbulent. So the the good thing about these ones, you could put it in a city environment, and it would actually be useful rather than a horizontal axis, which would be useless. For, 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 yes. So, so yeah. yeah, one of the one of the major differences between vortex places wind turbines and conventional ones is that you don't you can't put a conventional wind turbine in your house, even if you put it doesn't work as well. Yeah. But uh, if you go to this company, you can buy one of them for your house, and they will they will support you, uh, and they will guarantee that it will provide enough uh, electricity to boil your water or or do some sort of stuff, you know, doing iron and stuff, and and that's how they are trying to market mark do the marketing. But as I said, it's not as efficient as it should be. But the good thing, yeah, you can you can use a couple of them in your house and use them to boil the water and have a good tea. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a quick question. What about the noise? Uh, the noise. I, I mean, I don't think if they have noise. I, I haven't heard anything about them making noise. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe there are some like okay, they don't make the environment as beautiful as it should be. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the answer is okay. Conventional wind turbine doesn't make the like the, the environment as as it, as it is. So. Uh, it's, it's, it, it doesn't have cons compared to a conventional wind turbine in that particular thing. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for breathing presentation and then now let's welcome Shi Chen with a uh, new, new, new uh, analysis of using solid solid phase change materials for battery Hello, uh, I'm gonna do a brief introduce about uh, one of my research projects it's about uh, forward. It's about uh, explosion of using phase material for thermal ma management of electric vehicle battery. Uh, 
My presentation contains four parts. The background, uh, aim and tasks, my uh, little experiment I did before, and uh, my, my lab simulation. Oh, okay. Uh, the cost of for the depletion of fossil fuels and the global warming, electrical vehicle and the hybrid electrical vehicle continues to be entrusted with important role in the coming future. And de development of electric vehicle and hybrid electric vehicle is gathering monument uh, in recent years because of its eco-friendly features. And However, uh, a high operation temperature would accelerate the thermal runaway and power fading of Leon Seal if uh, accumulated heat is not removed properly and effectively. Improving the thermal performance of the battery can be achieved by reducing the heat generation rate of the battery and incre increasing the heat dissipation rate. Well, under this situation, this change material has a cooling as a variable battery thermal management system with simple design and low cost has drawn intensive research attention. Uh, this, this project contains two parts, uh, the experiment and MATLAB simulation. Uh, the aim of the experiment is to analyze different PCM development and characterization. After that, some of solid solid PCM simple has been manufactured and the physical characteristic has been measured. And in my lab simulation part, I'm going to introduce the methodology of the module and some of the results of the simulation. Oh. And among the extensive research of organic PCMs, paraffin wax, that is the mostly made up by a mixture of street chain and alkaline has designed thermal performance which has also been demonstrated its popularity as a PCM in a better thermal management system. Uh, however, the linkage of muted paraffin when the temperature of paraffin is higher than the muted point needs to be prevented by certain containers or tanks, uh, resulting in more complicated structure in practice. Uh, many strategies are developed in, to address the linkage problem, like uh, micro-encapsulated PCMs and foam-stable PCMs. And solid solid is a kind of foam-stable PCM which you, is using high-density polyethylene, a supporting material. But another problem of foam-stable PCM is its low thermal conductivity, and it can be enhanced by adding extended graphite. Uh, and this slide shows the uh, manufacture process of foam stable PCM. Uh, we have a, a hot pot on the there, and we put PCM and high density polyethylene in there and mix them together, and then add expanded graphite to increase its heat conductivity. Uh, here's some uh, e experiment equipment I used before. I have Blender and heat pot, and I have a different shape of different percentages of uh, expanded graphite after added in there. Uh, and this is the experiment equipment we designed before. Uh, we got supplier, and we got uh, uh, the small wood case with full of. Uh, my PCMs in there, and this is the uh, it's the battery we used. Well, uh, but uh, because of some reason, uh, we didn't do the experiment, so we decided to do the simulation. And uh, this is the equation I used to calculate the specific heat of the foam stable PCM. The basic solid CP is different materials, CP times the Percentages and plus them together. Uh, because of the different CP between solid, solid and liquid, we use the proof equation at the bottom uh, to calculate it individually between uh, liquid and solid. And 
uh, uh, the, the simulation considered a two dimension heat a two dimension heat conduction process across the battery and PCM as shown here. Uh, battery and PCM have the same heat and the same metal sheet is used as a shield on the both top and bottom. And the temperature of every point, like at the center of TP, can be considered as the heat transfer from four direction, uh, north, south, west, and east, and plug them together. Uh, and here's the uh, different cases we designed. Uh, as you can see, the case one is batteries only, and we got batteries with PCS. And to compare the difference, we have batteries and add air blocks there. And we have uh, both battery PCS and air blocks. And here's some results. Uh, I, I got the the different uh, state of circle is use the uh, rated voltage to charge the battery and to see the temperature increase. And we can, as we can see here, like uh, the, uh, the PCMs with iron plugs can be better uh, performance than only iron plugs here. And uh, well, this is some of my project. That's all. Any questions? Uh, okay, I, I have one question about that because it's the first time I heard about that uh, you want to cool down your battery with so many methods and uh, um, it's um, a little bit curious about that. Uh, you use some phase change materials to uh, help you to cool down. And what if um, the heat you need to um, absorb is very high? And uh, what if your PCM melt? Um, is it uh, irreversible or not? Well, well, the the phase change process is a physical change. So. Uh, and the if, if the temperature is really high, like the the piston material becomes like gas. Yeah. Uh, but it's the it's like it need like four hundred degrees. But but uh, our our batteries is gonna yeah. blow like one hundred degrees. So it's yes, uh, my question is that uh, maybe uh, your PCM melt um, and uh, form some liquid and uh, something like a sugar that melts you can, uh, even even the temperature gets down it cannot be like the original one so is it affect your yeah but uh, yeah we, we, we do meet some leakage problem because uh, every time when it, it's a solid solid piece and we use it as a container like to each can contain a battery yeah. and and we we do have some liquid problem. It's like we every circle of charging, every circle of uh, battery charging, we lose like one or two percent of PCMs oh. like that. But uh, in this situation, normally it can it can work for like uh, in your experiment, it can work like at least for a couple of months and uh, it's not a question we really think about at this time. Yes, thank you. And, uh, oh, yes, please. How much space does it take up? Like, can it fit fewer batteries in the same area as a result of having the um, coating around them than you would do normally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you can see here, in our cases, we've got like we got like uh, several batteries here, and uh, what I'm doing now is I'm I'm containing. Uh, we can see here it's solid solid PCM. Uh, I'm contain both solid solid PCM and liquid liquid PCM together. So uh, here the air flux we see here is uh, at my 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 working now is contains a. Uh, Liquid liquid flow flux. 
through it. So uh, we got like two individual systems, and both of them can absorb heat. So uh, it, and the solid solid system can also be the container, like the pipe. No, not now, but it's we're working on it. But yeah, it, it can like reduce the space of our car. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Shi. Uh, and uh, and uh, next one is Abdullah Han. Um, his topic is about high gain DC DC uh, switch to introduce multi level boot convert. Oh, it's too long. <laughs> Enable transformer <laughs> three to connect it to four with any. Okay, that's fine. So like. So hi everyone. Yeah. So in this presentation, I will represent one of the interesting topology that I have been investigated and uh, designed and tested in our lab uh, that has the ability to achieve high gain voltage, uh, which is the transformerless uh, switched inductor multi-level boost computer uh, to enable the uh, transformerless grid connection for wave energy computer. So the wave energy conversion uh, technology uh, has been used to uh, convert the wave power into the electric power. Uh, however, the output voltage obtained from the uh, wave energy converter are usually low. Uh, therefore, the high gain DC-DC uh, boost converter uh, are needed to boost the output voltage obtained from the rectifier uh, with energy converter and feed the grid connected uh, inverter. So basically here, uh, this research or uh, focus on design high gain DC DC converter. The challenging here is to achieve high voltage gain in excess of five. Uh, however, it's difficult to attain it with conventional DC-DC converter due to the requirement of uh, duty cycle in excess of 80%, uh, which uh, actually results in the significant increase in the losses for the parasitic components. So, uh, uh, there are too many topologies uh, that uh, has been presented to achieve high voltage gain, uh, which are connected in cascade manner, uh, are not valuable solution. For example, the cascade boost converter here uh, is actually uh, cannot achieve high voltage gain due to the high stress across the switch, uh, uh, also the high losses. Uh, another topology also uh, has been uh, suggested to achieve uh, high voltage gain uh, is isolated converter with cable inductor uh, or transformer. For example, this circuit shows the cable inductor boost converter. Also, this would increase the voltage stress across the switch in addition to the uh, losses uh, and the uh, complex control from the switch. So, what's the best solution to achieve all of our common issue. Uh, of course, the uh, transformerless high gain DC DC multi level boost converter has the ability to achieve high voltage gain. So, the proposed converter here is the switch inductor multi level boost converter, uh, which compromises the switch inductor uh, structure and the switch capacitor uh, technique to generate high voltage gain. Uh, that maintain the same all output voltage level for the three level. Here we have built the three level uh, converter, uh, compromise single switch and two inductors and eight diodes and five uh, capacitors. So the we have here a control MOSFET uh, that block the voltage to match the uh, output voltage of the capacitor C1, rather than the uh, full output voltage, which is necessary for the uh, conventional boost converter. So the magic effectively here is to build the switch capacitor structure that can sit above it. So, what's the advantages 
of this computer. Uh, first of all, it has the ability to achieve high water gain without the need for excessive duty cycle, uh, which results also in the reduced voltage stress on each devices. Uh, what is more, it can be built in a modular way and more level can be added without changing the main circuit. Uh, also, it reduces the control uh, strategy by only requiring a single switch. So the operating principle of this computer can be described in two modes. Uh, one when the switch is turned on and the other when the switch is turned off. Uh, and this computer has been uh, designed and uh, has been operated uh, with continuous conduction mode. So basically here, uh, when the switch is on, uh, the diode S1 and diode S3 and diode 2 and 4 are forward bias and the uh, inductor 1 and the inductor 2 have a parallel connection. While when the switch is off here, we, uh, the diode S2 and diode 1 and the 3 and diode 5 are forward bias and the inductor L1 and L2 have uh, a serious connection. So, what we are interested here is the effect of the inclusion of the equivalent series resistance of the inductor. Uh, because actually we are not adding the, we, uh, we are not actually only stress the voltage, but we are add a lot of stress through the inductor. So, the voltage gain here of the proposed converter uh, is equal to N times 1 plus D divided by 1 minus D, where N is the number of level, and that is the duty cycle. However, a real converter, we have to consider the equivalent series resistance of the inductor. And the voltage gain uh, can be expressed in this equation. Uh, so we can see here is the voltage gain is plotted as a function of the duty cycle, and it's obvious that the inclusion of equivalent series resistance uh, of the inductor reduce the uh, uh, voltage gain. However, for the ideal computer, we can see it's, it's reach, uh, it reaches infinite. So, uh, the first topology that we uh, actually built and tested in the lab uh, was the multi level boost computer and actually also to achieve high voltage gain. So, the second topology and the modified uh, topology, which is the switched inductor multi level boost computer, which I presented now. Uh, actually achieve higher voltage gain with low duty cycle. Uh, uh, so, a comparison here has been made with the conventional boost converter and multi-level boost converter and the switch inductor multi-level boost converter. And we can see here the green line which is represent the switch inductor multi-level boost converter can achieve higher uh, voltage gain. For, for example here, uh, for the voltage gain of 10, the duty cycle for the switch inductor will be uh, 0.53, while for the uh, single inductor, uh, it's going to be like 0.72%, while for the conventional will be above 90%, which, which is, of course, not ideal. So, here actually, uh, the prototype that, we ha that I have built in the lab and uh, actually tested to validate the proposed converter. Uh, so this is the three-level uh, three boost converter. Uh, this is the main circuit. Uh, and they have like attached to the load of 10 kilo ohm. Uh, also, uh, we have in the lab that DC source can generate the input voltage up to 600. One thing here important to mention is that uh, I'm using the thermal uh, camera here to monitor the temperature of the silicon carbide MOSFET. So, here is the interesting actually result we uh, have been found that. Uh, so, the, uh, here the converter operates with the input voltage of 100 volts and can achieve the 1000 volts, uh, and which compared that the uh, converter has the ability to achieve. Uh, high gain voltage. Also, 
this waveform presents the voltage across the inductor and the uh, inductor current. So we can see that when the, uh, uh, for the input voltage, when the switch is turned on, the input voltage equal to the 100 voltage, which, the, which is the input voltage. And when the switch is turned off, uh, the uh, inductor voltage would be minus 233, which is the input voltage minus the voltage across the switch. And this is one of the greatest uh, advantage of this topology is to reduce the voltage stress on the devices. So, uh, if we just consider the conventional converter, this one in a state of having minus 233 volt, it's going to be 900 for minus 900 volt. All right. Also here, in this waveform we are going also to show one of the uh, advantage of the glucose compared to that it maintain the same output uh, voltage for all the output level here the waveform here shows the uh, output voltage of the capacitor c1 c3 and c5 which is the output capacitor uh, which are identical with the exception of the like uh, voltage drop across the diodes. Furthermore here, uh, again, this topology actually has a great features which is reduce the voltage across the switch. So here we can see the maximum voltage of the drain source is minus 333 uh, volts. So and this is open up opportunity uh, to uh, uh, generate high voltage gain or to uh, generate high voltage without the need for higher fits. In conclusion, this converter, which is the switch inductor motor for goes converter, has the ability to achieve high voltage gain uh, without excessive bad duty cycle uh, and reduce the voltage stress on the switch. Uh, furthermore, it can be built in a modern way and more lithium can be added without changing the main circuit. So the uh, three-level uh, comparator prototype uh, has been tested uh, operating with input voltage of 100 volts uh, to achieve 1,000 volts with the efficiency of 93.8%. Uh, 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 and it confirmed that the, this comparator uh, is suitable to use a wave energy comparator. Thank you for your attention. to your formula and your figure, we can see that there's a peak um, at the non-ideal situation. Could you please explain to us um, what does this peak mean and uh, is, is your experiment is under, uh, well, under the duty cycle at about 0 0.95? Okay. Yeah. If I'm not very... Professional about the yeah. electricity. Okay, no, that's fine. Uh, that's all right. So actually, it's a start that actually here the duty cycle that's actually proposed or that investigated this design is 0.53 percent. Uh, so and also this is actually uh, uh, reduce the uh, duty cycle because the first uh, topology, which is the multi-level bus comparator here, the duty cycle. Uh, is about 0.73 uh, to achieve a thousand volt with input voltage of 100. Uh, but here, uh, I mean, we can see this for ideal. Yeah. I mean, uh, as the duty cycle approaching one, so this is happen for all the uh, DC DC comparator with increasing the uh, power, uh, the maximum voltage gain uh, uh, in ideal mode is infinite. Uh, so what that means, that means that the uh, duty cycle approaching one, and uh, that means the, for, the, for the physical meaning, the uh, comparator 
that means the uh, switch is on for all the switching period. And what, what this implies, implies that there is no energy transfer from the input to the load, and all the energy will, st will be stored in the inductor. And the energy will not transfer to the load until the switch is off. So that means the duty cycle should, should be between zero and one, and should not be one exactly, because this is, will not happen in a real uh, computer. This is maybe the math, we can't I mean, uh, I mean reach one. But in real computer, no. Also, I mean, in the real computer, the duty cycle should be like less than 0.8% to have like a, a higher efficiency. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of losses uh, in the design and in the converter. For the switch, actually, uh, we can control the voltage and we can control the current. Both of them can be actually controlled with the switch because here I'm using the silicon carbide uh, MOSFET for the switch and by using the password modulation, so by changing the duty cycle, I can control the voltage. And you're using it so for wave, and I was just wondering, knowing like my requirements when I'm doing more like wind stuff, it's like much higher power and it tends to be like medium these days, but um, that we step up from rather than low voltage. But have you considered like looking at this jump? There must be quite, I imagine, quite a lot of cooling that needs to be done on this type of system. Has that been considered at all or looked into on the side? I know it's not like what you're researching, but just in the whole context of it. Would that be something that could risk this idea? All right, no, that's actually a very interesting way to mention here. So, I mean, if we, if we just see the experiment here, so of course, uh, right now I'm dealing with like uh, a medium volt. So, what I have generated right now with uh, 1000 volts, also I have to uh, reach the 3 kilovolt. The future, the near future is to reach the 10 kilovolt. And one concern that you mentioned is the, the heat. So one thing that we have an issue with the silicon carbide MOSFET. Uh, uh, because I need to, again, to design the thermal for the dissipate the heat from the MOSFET. Also, when uh, I think when I reach to test it with the output voltage of 10 kilovolts, also I need to use like a fan here to, for, the, uh, for the resistor to dissipate the heat. I see the thermal cameras there. Yeah, I hear. Uh, for the, this is the silicon carbide, so they have like thermal. We put like the heat sink is just down, down the circuit. And just for the extra thermal, I put one above the silicon carbide because at one time the uh, silicon carbide was exploded. So, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> And this actually happened with the practical the experiment. Thank you for your speech. And, and uh, next, uh, Matthew and uh, his to uh, topic is the hidden threat to carbon free flight. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Matthew, a fourth year PhD student here at Durham, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about my research on the hidden threat to come free flight. I'm sponsored by Rolls Royce, and this is part of their multi million pound research on looking at the next generation of electronics for aircraft. Every year, 9 million tons of CO2 are produced by aircraft. And even with COVID, these levels are going to exceed pre-COVID levels. Um, the, main, the main feature here is we are going to continue flying and we need to look at methods to 
ensure that these levels of CO2 don't continue to rise. Uh, the key way to achieve this is through the electrification of flight, and this is where we eliminate the hydraulics and pneumatics, and we really utilise the high efficiencies we get through this electrification. So a lot of people are already looking at this, and there's a few different methods that um, allow you to, uh, to do this. So there's a whole range of um, solutions to all of our different travel needs. So bottom left-hand image, this is what we're going to be seeing in Coventry in about 2025. Uh, it's going to start there. It's kind of the flying taxi. This requires the electrification of flight. Uh, bottom, uh, just here, the Bidero Island Hopper. This is going to be used for like the, the Highlands in Scotland and other places around the world where you need short trips, but uh, you're allowed to do quick recharging. So that's, that's that. Top right hand image here, this is the spirit of innovation. This is the fastest all electric aircraft. And top, top image there, that's the EFAN X. That's really a demonstrator to show what this technology can do. All of these aircraft are going to help us on our quest to achieve uh, carbon neutral by 2050. But in, able, but in order to do that, we really rely on semiconductors. And the only type of semiconductor that allows us to do this is SIC, as Abdul's mentioned as well. Uh, SIC is silicon carbide. It's a novel semiconductor in comparison to the traditional silicon that we've used for over the past 70 years. It gives you fantastic benefits. But regardless of the semiconductor that we use to achieve uh, and realize these aircraft, it needs to be robust. And there's a hidden threat lurking in the skies. Cosmic rays are the hidden threat. Cosmic rays are high energy particles which bombard the Earth of speeds of up to a million miles per hour. When they interact with the Earth's atmosphere, uh, they're actually also generated by solar, solar flares and also stellar explosions. But when they impact the atmosphere, they actually interact with argon and oxygen, and they create these cosmic ray showers, as you can see. These showers of cosmic rays, actually, the concentration of them actually reduce as you get down to ground level. But one key thing to notice is at flight altitudes of around 35,000 feet, the, the level of cosmic rays is quite high, so we really need to take this into consideration. It's actually been an issue before. In 2010, a Qantas flight actually dipped due to an interaction with due to interaction with cosmic rays with their control electronics on board the aircraft. They didn't realise this until later, but that's disastrous. Uh, the worst thing, worse is still to come. As for the aircraft we saw on the previous page, they need really high operating voltages, and with these really high operating voltages, this small deposited charge from uh, these cosmic rays can really result in explosive consequences. Uh, the devices can actually explode. They can lead to melting, and in a critical application to these devices, where you've got no redundancy, the aircraft isn't going to be flying for long. So it's really important that we understand how these devices respond to cosmic rays, and um, one of the key features is understanding the different material properties. So, so, we've hopefully all seen this before, but uh, what we're looking at is the top right-hand corner, <coughs> silicon and carbon. So as I've mentioned, we've used silicon uh, semiconductors and transistors for many years, and uh, silicon carbide has only really been used as a semiconductor uh, over the past uh, kind of 20 years, but it's kind of really started taking off over the past few years due to its increased uh, reliability. Uh, so, as we move on, uh, so comparison between the two materials. Key feature here is, is what, what are the benefits of SIC that people are using in order to achieve these new aircraft? We need high efficiencies, and that's shown on the next slide. So, the key features with SIC, the critical electric field. This is how much you're able to push the device the higher the critical electric field, 
the smaller the device can be and the higher the breakdown voltage of the device. Uh, another key feature of SIG, as we're going to see in a second, is the, um, its high temperature operation. Uh, thermal conductivity and high melting points of SIG are really handy for this. So, SIG is the ideal material on paper but to achieve these, these aircraft uh, through electrification. But one thing that we have not seen is, is SIG robust? against cosmic ray interaction. And this is a very uh, kind of uh, recent, uh, the, there's not many findings on this. The SIG, but there's a few on silicon, which doesn't look good. But anyway, here we go, on to silicon. So my research focuses heavily on simulation of cosmic rays on devices. The big benefit of simulation over going to the particle accelerator facility is that you can place where you want the cosmic ray, how much energy it's got, and at what time. Also, you can also choose the, um, the device operating conditions as well, so you can really get a good picture of what's happening. So what I have done here is, as you'll know, there's a whole range of cosmic ray energies. No two cosmic rays are the same, so you need to choose one to identify, uh, to understand how the device performs. What I have done here is I've simulated a cosmic ray with an, en an energy that it could be exposed to in the future. So this could be a real device. Uh, what we are seeing here, we are seeing snapshots of real semiconductors. So as, as you probably know, we've all got them on you, phones, computers. But these devices are designed for high voltage operation. So looking at silicon pre-impact, the temp uh, we're looking at temperatures here because temperature is the temperature response of the device is crucial. We're looking for high current densities and also high temperatures. So uh, the pre-impact silicon, 300 Kelvin, there's, there's no, uh, that's room temperature here, of course. Post-impact, this is uh, after a few blinks of an eye. <laughs> and you can see there's massive, massive temperatures within the device. 1,600 Kelvin, this is the melting temperature of silicon. So this device has really failed. Now if we compare this to silicon carbide, key feature to note here is this device is a lot smaller and that's because of the critical electric field difference between the two devices. Pre-strike, same condition, 300 Kelvin. Post-impact, a very small increase in temperature. These, these two devices could be with ever so slight modifications be used in the same system. So clearly, comparing the two, it can be seen that you'd want silicon carbide in your systems. It's far, it looks for this condition far more robust against cosmic ray interaction. So this is just for one condition. It's really important that we look at a whole range of cosmic ray energies and bias conditions for these devices, because that's what these devices could. Uh, operates under in real world conditions. So that's what I've done here. I have simulated uh, thousands of different conditions, a whole range of biases, a whole range of uh, cosmic rays. This is in line with uh, the guidelines from NASA. They use, that they do a lot of this kind of testing. They, uh, the upper limit here is beyond what they test but it's good to get a bit of an understanding for that. But this is all with respect to what they state the test lines of these devices should be. So we are looking at the sensitivity of the two different materials. Silicon on the left-hand side, the traditional material. Silicon carbide is this more novel material which you're looking at to understand its sensitivity. In an ideal case, uh, and also another thing to note, these lines show the charge multiplication within the device. So what that is, is the cosmic ray impacts the device with a small amount of charge, so that will be n equals 1, and depending on the bias conditions of the device, that would multiply that charge due to the internal electric field. So for small um, multiplications of 2 and 5, we're not really too concerned with those, they're just an identification of a system modification you can make, so a small tweak. But the purple, green, and kind of cyan lines, they are 
they, the mice should really take note, uh, note of. So the silicone, what we want to see, and either of these devices, we want to see a flat line, because that shows that these devices are robust against cosmic ray impacts. Uh, this isn't the case with silicon. It's quite bad, actually. Uh, if you look at the purple line on either side for silicon, uh, towards the right-hand side here, so high energies, it shows that 0.4, so that means that at that bias condition, you will result in a failure of that device. That device will fail. And in order to not achieve that, you need derating. Um, so in comparison to the sick device, the same purple line, it shows a 60% enhancement, uh, well, actually a reduction in sep sensitivity, so the cosmic ray sensitivity. It's far more robust, far more robust. That means that device, sick device, isn't going to fail for the whole range of cosmic ray conditions, whereas for silicon, it needs major derating in order to be uh, in order to be safe. All in all, I'd like the, uh, the SIG devices on my future aircraft. So to kind of wrap up, this is what we're going to see in the future. We, in order to achieve this, we need silicon carbide devices which are robust against the whole range of cosmic ray environments, and reliable SIG devices will enable the future of carbon-free flight. So in, in the bottom left-hand image, that uses SICK. They all, to my knowledge, use SICK. Yeah. They're, they're planning to be using SICK. Okay. Uh, and a couple of them are kind of concepts. So they haven't been used in like commercial like flights? Like. And so a couple of them are kind of um, kind of concept art kind okay. of thing. Okay. But the top right-hand one has, has happened. That's been in the news uh, a couple of months ago. But that uses SICK. Top left-hand one utilizes SICK as well. For the bottom two, uh, you sick but haven't quite got off the ground yet. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a very simple question about that because you said you use, uh, you want, you are planning to use the silicon carbon to um, on the air, aircraft. Could you please? Um, and share us with some details about um, specifically in which, which area is. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's it's used for the conversion of the power. So um, so it's so compared to traditional methods, which wouldn't use semiconductors at all. This is tearing out all the traditional engines, all the kind of fuel burning elements, and it's just replacing with that kind. So it kind of replace. Yeah, so, so kind of the motors there, it's all going to be electric for a lot of them. Okay, thank you. I have a question initially when you were talking about silicon and silicon carbide. Uh, in terms of to get the material, is it difficult uh, to get silicon carbide compared to, I mean, yeah, is it difficult to get silicon carbide compared to silicon? Or? And so, so silicon, uh, as, um, so silicon's been used over the past 70 years, predominantly as the main semiconductor material. And the processes to generate that semiconductor are so much, uh, there's been so much work done to make sure that the semiconductor, every time you produce that semiconductor, it's the same. Whereas with SICK, uh, that hasn't been the case over the past, uh, the previous, say, from the early 2000s, it, it's that, that kind of reproducibility of silicon carbide hasn't been the same. You don't want to be creating devices which have that kind of variation in performance. So only until recently, and we're getting that reprodu uh, reproducibility of the same <coughs> kind of standard of device, and that's that's why we're kind of starting to use SICK. Even though it's got all these better uh, beneficial benefits which we've known for years, we've been waiting for this uh, reproducibility of the devices.
And now I think we have uh, finished our 10 minute presentation and uh, uh, then we will start our 3 minute presentation and our first guest is Amor I think yeah. Hi, I'm Amir Bassemi. I'm a second year PhD student working under supervision of Mehdi and Dago. And the title of my PhD project is Development of a Reconfigurable Optical Metasurface. An optical metasurface is a 2D area of sub wavelength space nano resonators which are placed on a flat substrate which can interact with electromagnetic wave in order to control and uh, provide a specific optical performance. But the conventional metasurfaces provide predefined and aesthetic optical functions which are normally controlled by the shape, size, geometry, and the materials of the resonators. But today's technologies require uh, an active uh, control of the interaction between the light and the nano structure. That's why the concept of active or uh, actually reconfigurable metasurfaces has appeared in the literature, which refers to locating the resonators on a flexible substrate. So by applying any kind of mechanical force or other kinds of uh, stimulus, we can change the spatial position of the resonators and by doing so you can achieve a dynamic control of the interaction. But there is a, uh, actually a critical challenge that has limited the practical applications of these kinds of uh, actually devices. And this issue is also common in other technologies like wearable sensors and flexible electronics. As you can see uh, in this figure, there is a huge gap between the maximum strain, uh, a ma maximum elastic deformation of the rigid components, which are normally made of metals and ceramic, and the substrate, which is normally made of elastomers or uh, polymers. And uh, as you can see, by searching the device, there is an inhomogeneous stress concentration in the interface, which can adversely affect the maximum elastic deformation of the device. And that's why the maximum elastic deformation, which is reported in the literature, would be in the range of 20 to 30 percent, which is uh, by far below the maximum elastic deformation of elastomers. And in this project, we are trying to increase this range of searchability. And to be honest, the idea comes from this bubble. And as you can see in this uh, bubble, by applying any kind of mechanical force, stretching, bending, and twisting of this device, the top side of the pillars remain intact. It means that uh, you can place the rigid components on the top side of the pillars instead of placing the rigid components exactly uh, in the direct contact with the substrate. You can apply, uh, you can achieve a higher range of stretchability. And uh, actually, we have shown that by placing the resonators on the top side of the pillars, we can redistribute the stress concentration and moves uh, the stress concentration from the, uh, the top side of the pillars to the bottom side of the pillars. And these parts are uh, completely safe for us. And we can achieve to uh, actually a searchability as high as 120%, which is uh, very higher than the previously reported one. And uh, we have also benefited from this wide range of searchability in order to create a wide range of optical performance. And uh, we have designed a writable meta device. It means that you can create a pattern <coughs> or any kind of information on a piece of flexible electronics. And by stretching the structure, you can encode the information uh, because of the interaction, because of the actually uh, the, uh, changing the reflection of the pattern and when you release the strain you can remove or you can delete the information from the patterns. It is uh, one of the examples of our higher range of searchability. 
Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you. And uh, our next uh, presenter is Ricky Miles. I'm Nikki, um, and the focus of my research is on training a neural network to understand the geometric information within a 3D CAD model. Um, so, kind of existing solutions within the literature at the minute all involve some kind of transformation of 3D data before artificial intelligence is applied. Um, so, that might be taking multiple 2D images of a 3D object or creating a 3D grid um, for occupancy. So, what's unique about what I'm doing in my approach is that um, I'm working directly with a model file. So the file that I use is a step file, which looks something like this. Um, it's an ISO standard, so it can be opened by pretty much any CAD software, um, and it's very widely used within the manufacturing industry. Um, and what a step file is, how it's structured, is it's basically a tree starting from simple components and then building up to more and more complex features. So points combine to make edges, combine to make faces, etc. until you've got an entire 3D model. Um, and because I've got that tree structured input data, I'm using a recursive neural network. This is a neural network that is designed to work with a tree structured input. So we have um, these cells which are applied throughout the tree, starting at the lowest level. Um, and then at each level, a cell will calculate new outputs, which are then passed up to the next level of the tree. Um, and the entire input tree is worked through in this way until we reach a single top level node. Um, and this node has a single output vector, which will hopefully, if the model's been trained correctly, contain information about the entire step file that was the input. So you take a big data tree that comes from a step file, uh, apply the recursive neural network, and end up with a single output vector. Um, and the idea being that we can then um, put some output on the end of this encoder network, which will take that single vector and perform some task using it. Um, so the first task that I trained for is machining feature classification. Um, so I've got a data set that contains these 24 classes of simple machining feature, and I've trained the model to predict which class is present within a particular CAD model. Um, and this table shows my results compared to some of the existing um, more traditional models within the literature. And as you can see, uh, our accuracy is very high, and our training time is low compared to what is typical um, for other models that exist. Um, so this is really a kind of proof of concept for my approach. Um, we've demonstrated that we can be competitive at quite a simple task. Um, and then the next step is to build up to training for more complicated tasks and trying to get um, just the best representation within that single vector that we can for an entire capital. Um, so thank you for the time. Thank you, Vicky. And uh, uh, our next guest is um, Diana. So many of you, or I think many people, have um, faced the problem of when working with a time series, what approach, approach should I take? So here I'm comparing two of the well-known models, which is a probabilistic model uh, known as ARMA, which um, comes from autoregressive moving average, and a recurrent neural network um, called LSTM. This is the basic LSTM. So, here, the difference is that this is a probabilistic model, which assumes that the time series, um, the one with that working here is a uh, wind speed, um, should be stationary. That means that the mean and the variance are constant through time. 
but this is not true in nature. So we need to go through a whole process before generating the model, which is basically uh, breaking down the time series and just to see and observe uh, what kind of um, uh, transformation should we apply to uh, convert the, to make the, the time series stationary. So in my case, with one uh, with a first degree differentiation was more than enough. In the case of the long short term memory, it's more straightforward. We don't need to do that, but yet we still need to normalize our data um, so the model can perform well. And the architecture here is just a use two cells and and have an input layer and just the um, and a fully connected, which is just a uh, normal, uh, normal um, layer. The thing here is that the memory cell allow us to capture important feature uh, through the time. So this will allow us to generate a long sequence, um, such as for a year or for two years, with predictions. Here I'm trying to make predictions for daily, for 24 hours, through for a whole year and for two years. And the result shows that both of ARMA and LSTM performs well for the first for the first year, but during the second year, the ARMA becomes more more unstable, and the LSTM um, performs better. So this is not conclu conclusive because there's still some statistic statistical tests um, test um, required just to demonstrate that this data happens because of the model is is, is doing what it's supposed to do and not because of the selection of the, of, the type, of the type of data or randomness. So, but yeah, this is a, a good, um, a good um, a result for, for now. And yeah, further work um, will be to continue to test this, to prove this, and also um, try with multivariate models, which uh, will improve the accuracy of the, of the prediction and and based on the comparison of two, we can take a, a we can make a decision of which model should we use. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I think um, the, the text session three is finished. And uh, please come to coffee bar and have a refreshment.
Yeah, can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Can you see me? Hello? Yeah, okay. So basically uh, today, uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, attending today and sorry for not being uh, in person. Uh, my, my, my presentation today is about the project which is uh, uh, feasibility of solar energy in Libya and its ability to overcome energy crisis. Uh, the part of the today practical control strategy to enhance stability of a grid connected uh, solar system du during short circuit uh, fault. Uh, so basically, uh, first of all, the presentation will be uh, uh, sessions. Uh, will, first of all, the background. Uh, you know, day by day, the energy uh, become one of the essential ingredient and uh, the demand for energy is increasing. Uh, most of the energy nowadays is coming from the burning fossil fuel, which generate uh, greenhouse gases. As stated, uh, the literature: eighty percent of greenhouse gases coming from the BP, uh, from the sorry, from the uh, burning fuel in uh, energy sector. Uh, this fossil fuel has a, a destructive effect on the environment. Therefore, it becomes a priority the whole world uh, to rely on alternative friendly renewable energy resources to meet uh, the increase in the energy demand. Uh, integrating renewable energy systems to the grid becomes a crucial and challenging uh, like section uh, and uh, during normal weather conditions and uh, abnormal normal weather conditions and the human errors Short circuit fault may cure uh, asymmetric single phase to ground is considered as the most frequent fault, which represents about 70%. Uh, therefore, uh, therefore uh, renewable energy one of the solutions for the future uh, uh, and uh, can uh, greenhouse gas can be compiled uh, by relying on renewable energy. A huge amount of solar energy reaches the, the surface of the air and 6,000 times uh, greater than uh, uh, world consumption. In this content, many countries have uh, raised uh, their own strategy to uh, uh, reliance on uh, renewable energy resources. Uh, one resources. As you can see here, uh, in this figure uh, across the world, the installed capacity of renewable energy is increasing continuous. Uh, Libya is one of the country uh, which 100% nowadays uh, unfortunately relies on uh, fossil fuel. As you can see, the energy sector of Libya consists of gas turbine and steam turbine and combined cycle turbine. Uh, which needs a fossil fuel uh, to generate, uh, to operate them. Uh, Libya is one of the countries uh, which has its own strategy to increase uh, 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 the share of renewable energy in its uh, system. Uh, they are aiming for 10% of electricity from renewable energy uh, by 2025. This requires major uh, about the installation consumption in Libya and for other uh, research on feasibility of renewable energy resources. Here is a comparison between UK and uh, Libya. Yes, as you can see here, the North region and South region Libya receive about 2,000 kilowatt hour per meter square a year and for the South region about 2,600 kilowatt hour per meter square a year. Uh, on the other hand, the UK can be seen like uh, for the uh, northern east of around 800 kilowatt hour per year and around 1,100 kilowatt hour per square a year. Uh, a grid connected solar system is designed to 
connected to the grid, uh, uh, and also it's uh, made two parts. Uh, to uh, can be divided into about building integrated system and distribution generation system. This is the this system we have modeled. Uh, it consists of uh, five BV array connected in parallel. Uh, each BV array has uh, a total capacity of 400 kilowatts. Uh, these BV array are connected to a DC bus converter uh, to increase post voltage uh, to uh, a certain uh, level of voltage. Uh, which is 100 volt, uh, and then uh, this uh, this volt, uh, DC bus converter connected to the DC AC inverter uh, to uh, convert the signal from DC to AC, uh, and the output will be a dampier signal, which are uh, then connected to LC filter to uh, uh, get rid of the high frequency component in this uh, signal to be able to connect this signal to, uh, to this system to the grid. We have created, in this point, uh, a short circuit fault to study the behavior of this system in integration with the uh, side. Uh, here, as you can see, the IV and PV characteristic of the BVRA, uh, and here is the control uh, system we have used uh, to control the the system in two parts. First of all, the uh, control system, the post computer which mainly relies on maximum power tracking. Both of them algorithm have been used, uh, used here uh, to track the maximum power point and make sure that the uh, MPV uh, was extracted all the time regardless to any change in radiation and uh, uh, temperature. Basically, this uh, logarithm. The principle of this is by just to attract the power output and to compare it with a previous reading uh, and then work accordingly to increase or decrease the voltage by adjusting uh, the duty cycle of the to uh, hit the maximum power point. Uh, for the inverter, uh, we have used a control system uh, uh, with uh, two uh, parts, first of all, in control loop and out of control loop. Uh, DC regulator, as you uh, can see here, uh, we basically uh, compare the voltage, actual DC voltage coming from the DC, uh, DC bus converter with reference volt selected uh, before, which is was 500. Uh, as you can uh, see here, the output is the difference between, or we call it the error signal. This error signal will be fit to BI controller, uh, and this BI controller will generate uh, a control si uh, control signal. Uh, we call it uh, IP ref, and we set uh, we set the IQ to uh, zero because we are not considering the reactor for here yet. Uh, and then basically we for the linear controller we take the voltage and current coming from the BV uh, from the grid side. Sorry and uh, them to uh, from ABC to EQ node, uh, and then we will compare uh, these uh, these two uh, output uh, for the current, the previous one uh, we generated ready, uh, and create an error signal. This error signal also will be fit to the I controller. Uh, for the voltage from the BV grid, we use the voltage here, and we fit this output voltage. Uh, phase loop globe to generate the phase angle, which will be used as a, a reference uh, for the inverter. Uh, the output, the output here, uh, after we compare both uh, systems together, we generate control uh, signal. Uh, for that, we need to, uh, to convert them again from D to ABC again, and fit it to be a BWM uh, generator. After after we then uh, here we get the pulse uh, signal which will control the inverter. Uh, the system was uh, the result shows that the system was evaluated under two uh, main conditions: steady state condition and short circuit faults. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the output uh, power for uh, both scenarios. Uh, they are identical. Uh, that's because. 
the uh, uh, created uh, fault does not have an influence on the DC vol uh, DC like side of the system, uh, and uh, therefore the power will be the same. Uh, I will show you the uh, result that by here, as you can see here, that this voltage at the DC link pass bar, as you can see here, the voltage was like stable and following the reference uh, DC voltage with a scale than uh, 0.5 uh, uh, volt around the reference voltage. Here, as you can see here, uh, during uh, the uh, like short circuit fault from uh, second two to second three, the escalating around uh, short, uh, around the DC reference volt is ju just much much higher uh, and does not affect the output uh, power coming from uh, the BVRA. That's why uh, the system, the control system, we use prevent the uh, or protect the DC uh, the DC side from the uh, this system from the short circuit fault. Here is the voltage coming from the inverter at the terminal of the inverter, as you can see, here, the PM signal, uh, because we sit, uh, like fill this uh, with this uh, signal. Uh, here, because the three phase they are identical, so I just showed one phase, uh, and like opposite to uh, like a like a short take fault, as you can see here, the voltage is affected, uh, especially in the phase C because with the created for both phase C to ground, so therefore, as you can see, it's affected. For the for the voltage at the uh, coming coupling point, you can see here at the steady state, we have balanced volt with low, like, uh, dot, like uh, level of the harmonic distortion. Uh, during the short circuit, uh, during the short circuit, but as you can see here, the system responds quickly to the uh, fault uh, and the voltage was dropped down because as a result and predictable uh, result of this, uh, from uh, as a result of the short circuit fault. The main like advantage or the main feature we have achieved here is the system regained its stability after fault after the fault is cleared as you can be seen here uh, with a settling time very very small uh, which is equal to 0 0.02 seconds. Uh, also, this is the current, as you can see here at this state, the balanced current is uh, very low, uh, total harmonic distortion, uh, and for the voltage here, uh, for the current story here at the short circuit condition, uh, you can see here the current is some, it is uh, as predicted. Uh, as you can see here in these uh, two uh, fig uh, figures, as you can see here, here where the short circuit is like created and here where it is uh, clear. Uh, with a certain time this than 0 0.02 second. Uh, it's good here to conclude that the MPBT is extracted from the BPRA all the time because of the control system or because of the maximum power point used. Uh, stability on the DC voltage, as uh, you, uh, you have seen in the figures, uh, all the time, even during the short cycle fault. Uh, in terms of the total harmonic distortion, a low level was achieved at the common point and does not exceed 0.6 uh, percent, which is below the uh, like standard IEEE standard or the UK standard. Uh, the line to ground fault created on the green side does not influence the power output from the BBA. The, the most important thing is the system regains its stability when the fault is cleared with certain time uh, less than uh, 0.0 second. Uh, this all from me. This is the reference uh, I used, and thank you for your attention. All uh, any questions are welcome. Uh, uh, thank you very much for his, for your presentation. Is there any questions from the audience? So I do have a question. Can but, you hear? Salut, yeah, can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So can you hear from me? Yeah. Can you hear? Hussein? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that would be great. So how does the system regain stability? In your system, uh, how, uh, does it, how could it regain the uh, stability after 
Yes, yes, that's as I mentioned, the, the, the main feature of this control, control system, system is keeping, is keeping uh, like, uh, tracking the output power and the voltage and current. Uh, and uh, with the PI controller uh, and with this comparison, uh, with the previous three the system works accordingly to increase or decrease the voltage uh, extract the output power uh, and keep it as uh, expected uh, and we use in the uh, as we use the, like the sheet of the uh, the panel uh, which gave the uh, which gave the output power for this part each uh, radiation. So that's why the main the main thing is that the tracking of the behavior of the system many times in different and compare with together and work accordingly. Thanks. So the problem with the wind turbine is continual problem. is the failure of the converter system, and uh, because of that, a lot of papers have been written in this field, testing the difference between maybe the generator type or maybe the design of the converter. So comparing maybe defect to the permanent magnetic signal uh, synchronous generator, or three level to two level, or different parameters affecting. This one, however, is comparing or checking the control strategy, the effect of the control strategy on the converter reliability. So with current wind turbines, especially the megawatt wind turbines, companies or industry adopted two strategies. They are either field-oriented control or director control. And those both strategies, they are controlling the big wind turbines currently. So in this uh, uh, research here, I'm uh, comparing which of them is impacting the reliability of the converter. This is a brief uh, like comparison, the performance of them. Uh, both of them have been proven in the field, and their performance, both of them are very good. For that, because the reliability is a complex issue, the best thing to do this is by modeling. And of course by simulation, because we cannot wait the transistor to fail for so many years. That's why we do simulation here. In this model, it's based on a permanent magnetic synchronous generator, which is this one. And in, the, in this model, there are the two controls, FOC and DTC, switchable. So we can test each of one uh, at a time. And there is, this is the converter, the machine side converter. To do this, we need to calculate power losses, the thermal, and then the lifetime estimation. So we started with the converter itself. The selected one here is, this is very known, called two-level multi-source converter. And it's widely used in the wind turbines. And it's uh, maybe the simplest one, but very widely used. So the power losses is also simply calculated for like a power electronic losses, which is two parts, the conduction power loss and the switching power loss. And uh, they are both are combined to find the total losses. The thermal, however, here is using a Foster model. This model is used to uh, calculate the junction temperature uh, based on the losses. So that model provided the junction temperature for both the diode and this one for the diode, and this one is for the transistor. And for the lifetime, there is an equation called Koppen-Manson equation, and this equation calculates the 
cycles to fail, which means how many cycles, thermal cycles, the transistor or the diode going to fail. And for this, there are some parameters here. Mainly, this A and N are constant, they are actually empirical constant. So they came from the factory. The manufacturer telling us those numbers. The other are activation energy and Boltzmann constants. They are constants for the semiconductors. So while running the simulation, let's say on FOC, field oriented control, we apply a constant wind speed in steps. And those wind speed covering the operating range of the wind turbine. And when we run it, we'll see the, the, the junction temperature circulating or cycling, let's say, for the both, for the IGBT and the, for the diode. And for that, we can find the delta T, which is the range of the cycle, and as well as the average. Using this in this equation, and we'll find the cycles to fail, which means the lifetime of the semiconductor. Now, when this is done, we see this is the result, and this is very known result that the diode actually having much lower lifetime, almost 100 times than the transistor. However, by running director control, we see a, a very minimum or small variation here and here between these both two lines, especially at high wind speed here, 12 meter per second. Now to, to check this one, there's a, the best way is to uh, make a ratio to calculate this. So this is row. And this is cycles to fail with DTC to cycles to fail with FOC. And when we draw this one with respect to the wind speed, we see the IGBT lifetime drops to 74%, while the diode lifetime drops to 85%. Now, for completely for the converter itself, converter circuit, because it included uh, six, like in this case, six transistors and six diodes. We are using a, a miner's rule here, and we're finding the lifetime of the converter itself. And this is the black dotted line. It follows more actually the diode, because the diode shows much higher risk of failure than the transistor. So the conclusion of this simple simulation, that the first conclusion with DTC, IGBT's lifetime drops to 74%. The diode drops to 85%. Now, the main conclusion that converter control strategy and wind speed are likely to be interacting and affecting the reliability of fully rated converter and wind turbines. Yeah, thank you. And any questions, please? Losses actually, uh, we shouldn't have more losses. Uh, the diode or HPT. Yeah. Thank you. So for for the converter as a as a rectifier, machine side converter here it works as a rectifier. It's a uh, but it's active rectifier. The diode losses is much is higher than the IGBT. and that's why the temperature of the diode was higher. Um, I was wondering why is, do you think it's the diode that is having a kind of break that, like decay um, in its lifetime and the mean time between failure is reduced so much? Um, is it? Do you think it's to do with the type of generator and how the reactor power <coughs> flows are moving potentially? I don't know what exactly. What like why is that over an IGBT? Because I would assume it may be the other way around. Yeah, thank you for the question. So. The, the converter, of course, as, a, as an inverter, the loading more, mainly will be on the transistor. The diode will be working only for the reactive yeah. current. Yeah, okay? However, this is reversed for this one, which is the machine side converter. Yeah. Machine side converter, it works as an rectifier, actually. So the main load will go through the diode. Distribution and 
network comparison various EV aggregator characteristics. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi everybody, my name is Zorushan Adiniji. And um, I want to present this afternoon a part of my work. And uh, the title is Active Network Management Scheme for a DER Distributed Energy Energy Resources Rich Distribution Network comprising various EV aggregator characteristics. My supervisors are Dr. Bezad and Dr. Mahmoud. Actually, my area of work has to do with the future distribution networks. How you know we want to optimize the future distribution networks as you know uh, there are evolution there are evolutions in terms of new renewable energy being added into it and new EVs being added into it. So it's going to create a kind of other challenges. So I want to see how can that be done in result. So my outline is based. I want to look at the present challenges and the popular solutions and the proposed active network management scheme that I'm presenting the, um, the implementation. Some of the present energy challenges, energy supply challenges, and the power network. I mean, when I mean power network, because I'm focusing on distribution network, the, some of the challenges that are associated with um, present distribution networks and energy supply are the increasing greenhouse gases, greenhouse emission, the rising cost of fuel or fossil fuel, we all know the, co the price of gas is increasing almost every time. There's in insecurity of supply of fossil fuels. There's depletion that has been predicted that after some years, I don't know the specific years, but the truth of the matter is going to be exhausted, it's going to be depleted. And there's increasing demand in the network. In the distribution network. Then some of the um, data to support this argument is that, it, for example, in the UK, greenhouse gas emissions by sector, the, the uh, data that was released this year in February, it shows that the, the energy supply contributes 21% of greenhouse emissions. The transport sector also contributes about 24%. And then business, residential, and the percentages are there like that. And also, this is for the US. Sorry, I don't know what happened to So, also, in terms of um, greenhouse emissions, also, for the US, also, the transport is emitting about 25 to 27% of the greenhouse emissions. Electricity supply also contributes about 25%. Now, in terms of values, the absolute values for each year, comparing for 20, 20, between 1990, 2019 and 2020, in UK, the value of the CO2, the metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent that was released into the atmosphere decreased from 447 million metric tons of um, CO2 equivalent to 409, that's about 9.5. Also, in, uh, in the US, it reduced also by 11%, but that is just for some selected countries. But overall, I mean, overall, globally, the total CO2 emissions is increasing from the pre-COVID to the post-COVID. It's continuing to increase. And um, from the values available by, from IEA, the value increased from, from in 2020 it was 36.3 gigatons of CO2, and in 2021 it was 34. No, sorry, I think it's a mistake. It's, it, it's the other way around. Okay. In 2020 it was 34.2, and in 2021 it was 36.3. Okay, so now some of the popular solutions to these greenhouse emissions are integration of renewable energy and also bringing about electric vehicles into the distribution systems. And one of the additional advantage of EVs is that it provides what's called operational flexibility, whereby the system can respond, I mean the power network now can respond to increase or decrease in generation or in demand or in the system. Now, we, when we need to, when we want to integrate the renewables into the 
uh, and, the, and the EVs into the distribution network. We need to be very careful because we don't want to build an entirely new distribution network. We want to also maximize the use of the existing network. So there must be a kind of platform to actually introduce some of these additions, the renewables and the EVs. So in, um, so in, uh, in literature, the framework that or platform that has been suggested that can be used is the ANM and here or the active network management and it's a kind of platform that we can use to perform a real-time coordinated and intelligent control and management of different components in an active distribution network in an optimal manner within specified limit, not still going outside the limits of the network. And it's a, net, it's a solution that avoids reinforcement, that is building an entirely new or adding you know, in, or expanding the network. We are not expanding the network. We are still working with the existing network. About what we are actually doing is that we are controlling optimally or managing optimally what is coming in and all the components in the system. So this is what I'm actually pro uh, proposing. This is the network, the ANM network I am proposing. And uh, the network centers around the distribution system operator. Don't forget, I've said I'm working on distribution system. And uh, there's a kind of interaction between interaction of DSO or the distribution system operator with various key players in the system. It, um, for example, the DSO gets market uh, prices from the wholesale electricity prices uh, market, and also there's a kind of energy exchange between the TSO and the TSO. The TSO there is a transmission system operator and it also transfers energy to the load and it also gets energy from the DGs which are the renewable uh, energy suppliers and it's also there's a kind of interaction between EVs. EVs this time around they are aggregated by um, or maybe I, I can call them an, an intermediary between the uh, EV owners and uh, the DSO whereby they, they just aggregate all the battery capacity and then uh, it all does a kind of scheduling between them and then uh, all the arrangement. Now, it serves as an intermediary between the EV owners and the DSO. And there's a kind of price information that they schedule that, okay, at a particular point in time, this is how much I want to sell. At a particular point in time, this is the price I want to sell. So that's the kind of network and those are the flows there. And then what I want to do in this work is actually, because of an optimization problem, I, I want to focus on minimizing the operational cost, operational cost to the TSO by optimally scheduling energy exchanges between the key players that I've mentioned and then by also reducing containment. What I mean by energy containment is a situation whereby the system can no more accommodate excess generation, then it has to curtail what's actually coming into. It's a big discouragement and it's not going to encourage people to invest, I mean investors to invest in renewable energy. So as much as possible, it is often discouraged. So in that, in minimizing the cost to the DSO, there are three components of the cost there. And then the, the, ele the elements are the cost of transition with the TSO, the cost of transition with the non firm DGs, and the cost of transition with the aggregators. And then these are the other, these are the definition of the components and the times there. Now, in implementing, I'm, I'm working with an IEEE 33 bus system, and then these are the prices that are available. They are day ahead prices that are available in the system, whereby the buy prices is the price that the aggregator, the TSO, will buy the available power from the, the aggregators. And that, the, the sell price is the amount that they want to sell their own power to the aggregators. And the prevailing market price is what is there. So what the DSO does is that it looks at all these prices and finds a way to minimize the cost of operation to itself. Now, in implementing, I, these are the aggregator characteristics that are provided. And then 
I looked at four various aggregators. The aggregators are what I call the office, and then the pattern of the office, which is the blue, is that maybe people are just at home from the hours of zero to maybe around six, and gradually people are coming out, and then they come out and by around six, seven in the evening, everybody returns back home. And for the long stay, that actually typifies a situation maybe in the um, um, rail, train stations or even at um, uh, airports where people can park their cars there, this time around electric vehicles, for a very long time. Then they can use then the, electric, the residential and then the public. The public, maybe people just go out in the daytime to do shopping for tourism and for other stops. And then these are the results. Now, in this case, I did something. I created four scenarios. The, four, the first scenario, and these, these are the cases one to four. For the first, for all the cases, there are firm bridges and there, is a, and there are no firm bridges. And for, for, the, okay, for, the, for case one, there is, there is no aggregator and there is a penalty value to discourage containment. And then for case two, there is the aggregator and there is also the containment penalty. And for the case three, there is none of this. So the DSO can just um, interact. Now, these are the values of the result. In, in, um, for case one, 6.15, the total amount of energy in the system provided by the DGs and the non-DGs is 67.3, 67.3 megawatt. But out of these, for case one, 6.15 of these was actually curtailed. And then for the second case, 3.57 was curtailed. And for the third case, because there is no aggregator, there is no penalty. And then because of that, a large sum, even up to 67% of the energy that was produced in the system was curtailed. And for the last case, 11.3 was curtailed, where there is aggregator, but there is no containment penalty. And then this is the um, flow of the state of charge in the system. The starting point for all the aggregators, the initial SOC is 0.65, and that's why all of them started at 0.5. And as they are importing, as the TSO is importing power from the outside, then, I mean from the TSO now, this time around, is importing power from the TSO, then it's actually charging the batteries there, the batteries of the EVs, and the SOC continues to increase, and uh, it gets to a point in time whereby they reach their maximum. But because more and more EVs are coming into the system, the SOC drops, and then they continue charging, and then uh, that's just the pattern. Sorry, I'm trying to rush because of time. Now, the results, now, the first case I did was a case whereby I tried to change, I, I tried to put many uh, aggregators together. But this time around, I only used, um, or, um, only, for example, when I, when I wrote office there, I used four aggregators in the system. So all the four aggregators, they are office, they follow the pattern of the office aggregator. Then in, in the public, all of them follow the pattern of the public. And in the long stay, they follow the pattern of the long stay and the residential. In all of these, the best, the best in all of the aggregators from the result is that is the office. We are only 1.58 of the energy was curtailed, and the operation cost was just 641. And the, from the results, they are in terms of the curtailment. The curtailment took place during the excess generation, during when there was excess generation in the renewables. So that was when this is these are the curtailment of the non farm beaches. Now, looking that, that's for the cost and the, for the curtailment. I also looked at the, in, the the impact of all of these on the voltage. Now, for the voltage, for the first case, now it's just the Passive system, no DG, no aggregator, and this is the pattern of the voltage. Whereby there is a voltage dip towards the end of the feeders. For the I3 e 3 bus system, 
which is a radial system, then the 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 end of the bossing, the end of the feeders are towards the 17, 18 um, feed, uh, boss and then that's 23 boss. Now, for the second condition, where I've included the digits or the renewables only, no aggregator, then the pattern has changed because there is a kind of reverse power flow from the load side back to this. Uh, uh, there, is, there is a reverse, reverse power flow from the load side back to the source. Then, in that in that case, the voltage has increased drastically. The voltage has increased drastically towards the load side. And then, this is like the opposite of the first case, which there was no DG. Then, the last case is the situation whereby I, ha I now have the DGs and the aggregators in the system. In comparing that, I discovered that the voltage at times when the aggregators come into um, uh, play in the system, the voltage is very close to 1.0 per unit, which is almost perfect system that we are actually looking for. Then, this is a kind of deterministic approach that I've used here, whereby only one set of data is used. But because we are um, considering Renewable system and um, there is subject to uncertainties in the, uh, in, the, in the data. So, and I'm, what I'm working on presently is a kind of stochastic optimization of the system. Well, I'm going to consider a probabilistic approach using different scenarios in the system. And I'm going to get I'm almost that's almost done. I'm extending to a multi grid system. Well, I'm going to look at the distribution system. Sorry, thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> Questions, please. Questions, please. Okay, thank you. Um, your, your model, is it running in real time, or do you know all the data about the electric vehicles and renewable energy before you start modeling? Yeah, I got some, I got the data. Okay. I got data from Ethos online, to, uh, to actually understand availability of because it's uh, what in, in my model what I use was that it's for it, um, it's for just a kind of maximum of 200 electric vehicles actually for this model so the availability is actually showing how yeah, how, yeah it's actually showing how the electric vehicles are available over time we are zero shows no electric vehicles and one shows 200, 200 EVs here. That's exactly So it's not real time, it's just, I got the data from Ethos and Zapman. Thank you. Okay. With your consider the behavior of the EVs in your stochastic optimization? No, uh, for, because, yeah, what he's asking is, I'm, am I going to consider the behaviors of EV owners, because in this case, the behaviors of EV owners is assumed to be following this particular pattern, but it is not actually certain that's going to follow this particular pattern. But what I'm actually considering in my uncertainty model, or the stochastic optimization, uh, the uncertainty that has to do with the solar, the load, and also the um, uh, wind. So. Uh, Maybe I'll consider that. I also thought of that, but I'm not considering it for now. In the work I've done. Thank you. Any other questions, please? No. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. So let's go to the next one, which is Giuliano. The person here. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. It just, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Giuliano. I'm a fourth year PhD student, and I'm supervised by Professor Wilkins and Charles O'Carr. So, as you can see from the title, uh, the main focus of my research is about the anchor installation process 
and we uh, try to investigate this uh, via a numerical technique, which is the material point method. But uh, since I already uh, talked last year about this part of my PhD, and we didn't want to bore you, especially this time of the day, uh, today I'm going to talk about like a smaller part of my PhD, which is about a new stress-strain relationship, which is necessary to model biphase material under certain conditions. But allow me to go with order and let's um, um, let, let me frame the whole problem. So why are we interested in the anchor, anchor installation process? The real reason why we are interested in the anchor installation process is that we are interested in the power cable maintenance, in particular for the offshore industry. So as you can see, uh, oh, this cable can run from very long distances from the position of the wind farm to the mainland. And nowadays, this uh, distance can be between 100 to 120 uh, kilometers, and it keeps on increasing. Um, now, uh, the main threat to these cables is represented by the deployment of a drag anchor of vessels or ships passing in the area. So as you can imagine, the interference between the anchor and the cable can damage the cable itself. So it's kind of easy to understand that once we do understand how uh, the embedment process works, we can um, bury the cable enough to keep them safe and sound. And so going back to the first slide, I just mentioned you very briefly that we, do, uh, we uh, consider the material point method. So right now I cannot give you any detail about the material point method because, you know, just a minute. But um, um, just for giving you a flavor of it, the material point method can be a element method which works particularly well under uh, large deformation, which is exactly the same situation of the soil surrounding the anchor, if you think. Um, now, uh, now that the framework has been set up, uh, allow me to say why we are interested in biphase material first of all. And this is kind of easy. So if we go back to the previous slide and we do consider the seabed, well, it's, uh, we can understand that this part, the, the seabed, is made by two phases. So on the one hand, uh, the solid porous phase and, uh, and the voids of this porous um, porous material are entirely filled by water. So this is why we are interested in biphase material. Now allow me, so we said, I'm going to talk about the new stress-strain relationship which is necessary under certain conditions. So one of these conditions is the fact that most of the times uh, we do consider the solid matrix as incompressible, so we do not account for any change in the volume of the solid, the solid grains. And for those of you who are familiar like with the solid, the solid mechanics, this means that we can use Terzaghi effective stress principle. For those of you who are not familiar with the solid mechanics, uh, the, the main idea here is that we do apply to our sample a volumetric compression. So we do squeeze the sample by the same amount in, the, in, the, in all of the directions. We have only two mechanisms available to uh, allow for a change in volume. So one is the, like, a water flux. And these are usually three what are uh, named um, partially saturated or saturated condition. And then we have also a second mechanism, which is uh, uh, absolutely secondary with respect to the first one, but it's a, a compliance of the water phase. Water can be seen as a nearly incompressible material, so it can slightly be compressed. But regardless of this, uh, which one of these two, the idea is that the change in the volume is given only by the fluid phase accordingly to this hypothesis. So this was the first feature which we introduced. The other one is about the Eulerian porosity. So what is the porosity? The porosity is a ratio between two numbers, in particular two volumes. Uh, we have at the top the volume of the void, which in this case is exactly the volume of the fluid part, divided by the whole volume of the material. And by Eulerian, we're just referring to the fact that this uh, ratio is computed at the current configuration. This is for fine strain mechanics. Doesn't really matter, Eulerian. But the idea here is that this value of the porosity is bounded between zero, only solid phase, 
to one, which is going to show up, possibly. Yep, which is only fluid phase. Now, as we said, we do consider biphase material. This uh, inequality is without the equal, so we exclude the streams. But let's bear in mind that this value n, which expresses the Eulerian porosity, is bounded. So if we put together these two features, so we said the incompressible solid matrix is, uh, is incompressible, so it's constant. And we work a little bit of mathematics. We can create a relationship between n, the layer of porosity, and j, the determinant of the deformation gradient. For those of you who are not familiar with fine strain mechanics, this is just uh, a number expressing the change in the whole volume of our sample. And we said, OK, this value here is bounded, but now we do have this relationship. So we can express these inequalities in terms of j. And if we take a look at the second one, just remember that even this j is a ratio between two volumes, so it must be positive. This is always satisfied. We have no problem because n0 is exactly an n is bounded. And it's constant in the simulation because it's the value at the very beginning of the simulation. The second one, the second inequality, which I'm going to call the incompressible limit, is not always respected. So we have to enforce, we, make, we have to make the model aware of this inequality. And by the way, uh, this inequality is related to this one. So every time we do violate the incompressible limit, we are going to end up with negative porosities. And again, porosity is a ratio between volumes, so the finite volumes. So the negative is, does not make any sense, absolutely. So we are saying, OK, how can we enforce this inequality, which was the incompressible limit. And I'm going to, instead of watching this inequality, I'm going to watch this one. So, so for those of you who are familiar with fine strain mechanics, this is the volumetric uh, logarithmic strain. For those of you who are not, it's just a mathematical trick. So we pass from uh, quantity to its log. And in particular, so how can we enforce that? So on the left-hand side, we have a linear Henke uh, material which I know for those of you who do deal with uh, soil mechanics, is gonna, they are going to be horrified by the fact that I'm using a linear hank material. But it's just for giving you the idea, because most of the time this is used for, uh, for steel or something like that. Here you can see that the free energy function, so the function governing the stress-strain relationship, is given by two parts. So that by the sum of two parts. So the first one, dealing with Kate, is just how the sample change in volume. The second one is how the function change, uh, sorry, how the, um, um, the sample change in the shape. And we said that this inequality affects the volume, so it's kind of easy that we understand that we are going to modify only this part to have a new incompressible compliant stress strain relationship. And in particular, if we plot these two quantities just for this part, so here we have the free energy function, its first derivative, the effective pitch of uh, stress, or the second derivative, so the tangent moduli. You can see that when we consider a linear Henke material, the linear Henke material is not aware of this inequality, so it's defined on the whole domain, while the new incompressible compliant material know about this inequality and it presents an asymptote for all of this quantity. So, okay, we set up everything, but just let's try to understand what are the consequences of this. And uh, let's study it for this case of our biphase uh, column material, where uh, the gravity load is applied, so this sample can move only horizontally, in particular from the left to the right. Only this surface is uh, permeable, so flux is allowed only here. So here we have the two simulations. At the top, we have the linear Enki material. At the bottom, the new one. And allow, let's allow the simulation to run. You can see that both of the columns are compressed. But here, and we are plotting N, the porosity, you can see that at the very bottom of it, we start to have negative value of the porosities. And you can say, OK, fine, maybe it's just you know, a bug, but we can fix that. If we allow the simulation to go further, you can see that the, pretty, the, the top column goes pretty much ballistic. It doesn't make any sense. This is like a compressed sample. While the second one goes on being compressed with positive values of the porosities. So very briefly, we can draw some conclusions about this new stress-strain relationship. The first one is that 
if we want our simulation to be physically meaningful, we have to respect the inequality. There's no way around it because as you have seen, the, f the first simulation just didn't make any sense. The second one, but you can tell me it's not true, is that as, uh, as far as we are aware, this is like the only model which is uh, respectful of that incompressible limit. And the last one, especially for those of you who are familiar with soil mechanics, is that it respects the Terzag effect and stress principle. So this is kind of easy to implement. So thank you very much for your attention. Here is uh, the open source code, the code uh, written by Will and Charles, uh, which is uh, available for those of you who want to familiarize with the material point method. And possibly we are gonna, you know, gather all of these ideas in a, an article. So if one of you is interested, just take you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I realize now I wasn't using the mic, but <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering how does it match up to experimental data? Well, this is, you know, uh, this uh, should be like a follow-up, I think, of this uh, method. But you, um, so it's a, uh, it's how can I say, way down the road. Uh, I think that overall, what we can say is that if we go back to this, sorry, okay, here. So if we do say that the grains do not compress, we know that this is like common Terzaghi effective stress principle, which we know is valid until certain limits. So possibly this is going to be true, but as you can imagine, we have to come up with something which is, in order to fit, I think, the experimental data, which can be, must be, at least, way more sophisticated than only this part. But how can I say, this is like uh, the first model respecting that, so can be like the first of many, but yeah. It's a fair question, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again for the talk. <laughs> so the last one of the 10 minutes presentation is Jen Zhou, which is also a virtual presenter. So we're going to connect him in the Teams meeting as well. Hello, can you hear me? Jan? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah? Yeah? Oh, we can't see you. Uh, are you on the on the camera? Ah. ah. We only see the virtual background, but not you. Oh, now we see you. Perfect. <coughs> so, so, sure, sure. Can you, see? Can you see the screen? Okay, can I start? Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Jen Zhu, and um, my project is about seasonal solar thermal energy storage using thermal chemical absorption for space heating. And uh, you find some of them too. Is that better for you to? Look, yes. Okay, so for the background, uh, in the United Kingdom, the heating consumes are probably 45% um, of gross fuel consumption in 2019, and around 74.5% of the heating consumption is used for space heating and hot water. Uh, over 70% of this energy consumption is provided by natural gas, uh, which will result high carbon emission. And for my project, I just want to reduce this carbon emission for uh, domestic heating. And uh, energy con conservation and emission re reduction policies have been um, advocated by governments all over the world, both in China and uh, uh, UK and uh, American. So. I, I need to find a, a way to reduce that carbon emission. So I've, I want to use a subsumed material, like the water subsumed, 
and uh, what is option is a clean and a promising technology for thermal energy storage and space heating. And uh, the method is when when in summer we use we use the material to do the desorption and the matrix with with water will be released by the heating and uh, we will storage uh, for the matrix and separate with the water. So for this for this storage processing, no heating will be loose. So that's, that is a good way to storage the, the heat. And in the winter, when we use the energy, we can use the absorption, and then the metric, metrics and the water will be mm, combined together and to release the heating. So this is a great way to, to do the domestic heating and to reduce the carbon emission. The absorption mm, mechanism between the water and the solvent is isn't it in this figure? And uh, for this for this mass methodology, so the first way is selection the heating storage salt and the metrics, then characterize the materials. Last to find a, a material is a is a, a significant uh, step for all of this research. So find the materials with the best qualified value and. Um, is the first step, and for this, for this photo is the test rig, and is the design of the test rig. The fan from right to follow to the left, and the here is a humidifier will be combined the water vapor and the air to the to the reaction. The material will be contained in the reaction, and um, the lower com lower uh, temperature. Air comes from the right, and it will be have a higher temperature from to the left. And the temperature and the humidity fire sensor, both in the income way and outcome. So we will record record the temperature changes automatically. Also, we have a flow meter to um, according the flow meter and uh, the press difference. So we we need to use um, oh sorry we need to use some. Um, uh, machine to to fi to find why this material is better or is is not good. So the TSC, TG, XRD, SEM, also the BET should be used in this research. Um, I did uh, two materials. The first one is a magnesium sulfate with zeolite. Um, I tried different types of the zeolite. So. The magnesium sulfate zeolite composite was prepared by impregnant method, and uh, the the surface mor morphology was observed by SEM and the magnesium sulfate times of 2,000 and 20,000. This figure exhibited the SEM photos of the composite magnesium with 3A, 4A, 5A, and 10X, and 13X, with solution con concentration of 10% and 20%. Uh, why we choose the 10% and 20%? Because over 20% concentration, the zeolite will be broken because uh, it's it's too high for the zeolite, this matrix. So at the mechanism, uh, mag magnification of 2,000 times, as shown in this figure, uh, with higher concentrated magnesium sulfate solution impregnated, the composite surface presented uh, several crystallization phenomena. For example, the net shape of the fiber in B and uh, the crack rock like the shape in D and um, and all the the thin needle needles figure in F. It should be noted that even though higher solution concentration in pregnancy may stand for higher absorption capacity as the noted magnesium sulfate uh, cell theoretically increase, but the, the the mass transfer may be concentrated treated due to the crystallo the uh, crystal crystal crystallization uh, issues so it will be just like the self block and um, higher magne <coughs> magnification of 20 times photos were taken for eds analysis and uh, it's this one i separated to here and the mag Magnesium and uh, sulfur element mapping of the composite ma material using magnesium sulfate ten percent with three A zeolite as as showed, and uh, 
it displayed the contents of magnesium sulfate in the propelled composite solvent, which uh, demonstrated that the higher impregnant concentration result in the higher content of magnesium sulfate covering the surface of the uh, composite zeolite samples. The highest content, 74.75% 70 of the whole dedicated sample surface, was observed to be with the utilization of three types of zeolite in infiltrated by 20% um, solution. The smallest co covered surface was found to be uh, magnesium 10% with 10x zeolite. Um, it it's not good, so um, we just choose the first one, and then it's com compared to compared to the magnesium sulfate. We uh, I tried another another one is um, uh, lithium chloride and lithium bromide. This two salt was um, tested by a lot of people. They did a lot of research, but they. They, they do the research is uh, separate for the two two types, but I want to to combine them together. So you can you can see in the picture there, uh, five percent uh, lithium chloride, and uh, also is also like the M is five percent um, lithium chloride and twenty five percent lithium bromide. So it shows the figure um, of all prepared composite sample given. Uh, it's, it's the same, it's 20% times as shown in this figure. And um, mm, the metric shape of the 3A zeolite seems like the greenness with a small portion of flakes. And uh, mm, I, um, there is a problem for, for this material is that we cannot to find too many uh, shape needles of the Thought, but but it's but the capacity of the absorption is better than the magnesium sulfate. Um, <coughs> then um, then I want to to solve this problem. I just to I just want to find the EDS. So the re EDS um, solve this problem. Result the EDS result scanning and the comp corresponding twenty times SEM photos. Is uh, presented the mapping of elements, and and uh, it shows it's really very high covered the surface of the uh, the zeolite. That is uh, that is why um, this um, this material combined um, two salts is better than the magnesium sulfate. And uh, the the next is the BET result of the mechanism surveyed with zeonite and um, it's isn't it the nitrogen absorption and desorption curve of the virus propelled composite materials. The result shows high constants y, um, with type 1 for the nitrogen which has based um, of on the IU pack uh, definition. They were also in good accord accordance with the pores material, for instance, the active carbon and the common zeolites, according to the nitrogen absorption curves, uh, in essential pores characterized, for example, the pore volume, surface area, and the average pore diameter of the test sample were de determined. So this this picture this picture present the pores pore size distribution co corresponding to nitrogen absorption and the desorption. It was de determined that the impregnated impregnation con concentration could affect the pore volume of the pores competitive. When the concentration of magnesium sulfate solution was higher, the pore volume distribution on the same pore diameter was reduced which can result into the smaller um, water vapor transport channel and uh, thus negatively influence the mass transfer and absorption performance. The absorption average pore diameter of the measured samples range from approximately uh, 13 nanometer to 25 nanometer and the 13 nanometer is 20% uh, magnesium sulfate with 4A zeolite and the 25 nanometer is 
20% magnesium sulfate with 10x zeolite. The desorption average pore diameter vary from the uh, about 9 nanometer to 17 nanometer. Even even though a tail was found in the in the magnesium sulfate 10% for this uh, 10% with 13x zeolite, the result might be. Uh, Uh, my uh, no, I I don't know why why my my laptop was was closed. I don't know. I I used my um, phone. I I don't know why it's it's just closed. And I, I try to reopen it, but it, it, ah, it works. Um, one moment, I, it, it shows that the battery was not working. Okay, do, do, you, do you have my PowerPoint in... Sorry, I I don't know why 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 the computer was was closing. It's it's so strange. Ah yes. Uh, could you could you move? Uh, can you can you move it down? The next the next. Uh, I think it's page 7 or page 8. Page 7, please. Um, no, for, for, for me, I just see you are stay at the first page. Ah yes, and uh, uh, and could you move move for?
afternoon I'm Chen Jue. This is my presentation, sorry, uh, which is about combined PVT system with phase shifting materials, thermal storage tank for uh, decarbonizing buildings. All my discussion is based on the simulation result from Transys. Transys is a flexible software that allows transient simulation. The main parts of the simulation in this study, including a house model, a solo uh, energy supply and storage system based on the Lucaso weather condition in typical years. Uh, and uh, the first is energy consumption analysis and the modeling of a conventional domestic house. Mm. This house is two-story conventional um, house in Lucaso. And according to the actual energy consumption, uh, like the domestic, daily domestic hot water consumption, um, gas boil operate, uh, operating schedule of the conventional house, uh, this modeling of the house can be made. And, uh, and uh, the no division between actual and simulated gas consumption uh, shows the energy consumption of the house model is reliable. And uh, this will be used to the further, uh, further uh, simulation. And uh, the second is about design of a dual tank photo thermal uh, PVT soap and the heat pump system. The PVT is based, um, this PVT model was built based on the uh, commercial PVT panel and uh, its experimental data. This study selected uh, these two highlight model from the transit model library and built a simulation to compare them. After comparison, they, because of the lower deviation of total electricity and thermal generation, this study chose tap 50A as the PVT model. And uh, this is the mm, configuration of the entire PVT system. Considering the lack of solar radiation in winter, this study plans to couple the PVT with heat pump in the heating season to cover more thermal needs and maintain PV sales at low temperature. And uh, this is the uh, model. Finally, uh, when we use the second design, we can say the uh, system can meet 24 to 120% of the thermal demand and the annual power generation exceeded their total demand, but only meet 5% of the house demand in winter. Um, this can be solved by use some battery boxes. Finally, to discuss the floor tank size and the decouple heat production from usage, this study tried to investigate a first change materials tank in the PVT system. And uh, this is the design and the simulation about the uh, in-house system, and maybe discuss next time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's welcome the next one, Lydia. Yeah. Let's welcome the tent. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, thank you for sticking around this far. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about silicon carbide field effect transistors uh, under short circuit for aeronautical applications. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to start off with the background of this. Why, what am I looking at and why am I doing this? Uh, so short circuit is a type of fault which you may see in any uh, system. And you basically have a very high voltage and a very high current at the same time, uh, put a lot of energy in the system. Uh, so I'm looking specifically at for aeronautical applications, similar to Matthew earlier. Uh, so in aeronautical, oh, aeronautical applications, uh, it's really, really important to have rugged devices. So at the moment, um, there is a drive to electrify aircraft to support the net zero carbon emission goals. So that means uh, creating more electronic actuators and eventually moving on to electronic propulsion as well. And electronic actuators would make the aircraft a lot lighter and more efficient. Um, but obviously, if you get a fault and you're all, all your planes electronic, 
uh, that may be an issue if you can no longer steer your plane or if your engine no longer works. So having rugged devices is incredibly, incredibly important here. So silicon carbide, uh, you've probably seen a very similar diagram to this in Matthew's presentation earlier. But the things really to note here are the critical electric field is very, very high in silicon carbide. And that means you can make your devices very thin. Um, also, the melting point and the thermal conductivity are very high. And this is useful uh, because you're putting a lot of energy into the system, so it gets very hot very fast. The higher thermal conductivity and the higher melting point means it a lot less likely to fail than traditional silicon devices. Now, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see uh, what's called a MOSFET, which is a type of transistor. Um, what we found is that it's the gate oxide which is the real limiting factor uh, when you look at the failure of these devices. So, to turn the device on, you have to put a charge on the gate. And what happens when you can short circuit these devices is this gate fails. So you can no longer put a charge through it, you can no longer turn the device on. And this is what is really limiting um, the times of failure of these devices. So in the future, what I want to look at is a different type of device called a JFET. Now this doesn't have an oxide on it, so it means it should be a lot more resistant to failure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, let's work on the next one, which is the last one of today's presentation, which is Gregorio for the So, uh, okay. Most of you know the serious problem that is uh, generation of electricity to fossil fuels. You know, lots, lots of greenhouse gases are uh, going to the atmosphere causing serious problems like uh, the global warming, um, environmental disturbances like floods and droughts. Uh, so, among the Amongst the main solutions uh, to tackle this issue, um, we have the transition to renewables energy resources such as uh, solar, wind, and bioenergy, and put them in, in the distribution networks. Um, uh, however, we cannot just put a bunch of them in our distribution networks just like that. The distribution networks were, ma were, were not made for this originally. Uh, the use of the resources imposes many challenges and opportunities for us. Uh, among these, uh, um, these challenges are regarding the uncertainty and the uh, variable nature of the renewables, which leads to voltage variation and low system inertia and low use efficiency. Um, uh, in our project, we intend to give solu technical solutions applying a set of controls to the distribution networks with high penetration of renewables. With this, we intend to improve the performance of renewables within the network, addressing uh, problems associated with uncertainty and um, flexibility in our distribution networks. Um, early results suggest that with Active network management, reconfiguration, and network reconfiguration for dominant schemes, demand side response, and a deterministic um, a scenario based optimization, we can improve the performance of the network and uh, the operational and, and the operation of the network in terms of uh, reducing cost and voltage voltage profile regulation. Mm. So finally, our our main aim for this is to 
uh, improve the performance in renewables in our current systems, addressing the current challenges, uh, so we can have a smooth transition uh, to renewable energy resources as, an, as our main energy supply, so we can reach next year and in, in, the, in the near future. Thank you. Welcome Professor Charles to give us a closing remarks. Hi, hello, hello, hello. Hi everyone. Well, I'm aware that I stand between yourself and some fermented grapes and curd. <laughs> not to be too long. Um, but I am waiting for the prizes. I'm really just the filler. I'm the warm-up act for the, the prizes here. So if you, don't, if you don't know me, I'm Charles Ogart. Um, I've been here since a very long time, for, for a very long time. And from August, I'll become the head of department, succeeding the stupendously successful Simon Hogg. Hi, Simon. Good, good. Thanks for doing all this great stuff that I can claim credit for. Um, so let me just, uh, is, it, is it on this one? Yes. Do you have the pointer? I have the pointer. Great. Okay, so I just want to make a few comments. Um, I thought today was really good. I thought, um, you know, well done to all involved. I really like the, well, the fact you call it a conference. I mean, in previous years, we called it a research day. I think it's much better being a, a PGR conference. I liked all the publicity, which seemed to go up a very long time ago, but that's a good thing. You know, we've got QR codes. My goodness, this is amazing. Um, we've got slick organisation, and I think it's the first time I've ever had gherkin and chips. <laughs> <laughs> a new one on me. So I really like that. I like the format of the sessions. I think it's really good to keep it all in one session, because then you get decent audiences, and you, uh, you, know, you, you, you play to our strengths, which is general engineering. So you mix it all up together. So one minute you're listening to material point method, next minute you're listening to something to do with electronics that I don't understand. But this is really good. All sorts of things can be picked up, even if they're not technical, it can be presentational uh, or, or other. I think another good thing to, to point out was that the sessions had lots of questions. That's always a good thing. The worst thing is to travel across the world to a conference, give a 15 minute presentation, and uh, all you can see are the backs of laptops in the, in the audience, and no one asks you any questions. So I think that was, that was a really good sign. Um, I think the posters are great. I think we need to display them around the department. I don't know if there are any plans to do that, but I think the new head of department will certainly help you out there, uh, wherever <laughs> he or she may be. Um, I think uh, you were very, very polite, perhaps too polite, with some of your speakers, and allowed them to go on way too long. Um, but this is a thing that, that affects all conferences and is, is politically very difficult to deal with. I've been to conferences where there have been bulbs on the, on the desk, which are like traffic lights. So they tell you that you are, you're green, you're fine, you're fine, and it goes amber, and then it goes red, and eventually they, they um, make you, they turn your microphone off, I think. <laughs> so I think that's, that's a very difficult, that's a very difficult thing. So, you know, there I've got the classic uh, Durham feedback, which is highlights and areas for improvement. But overall, um, you know, I really don't want to take away from the fact that it was a, a really good day and I enjoyed the sessions I was able to come to. So I think we all ought to properly thank the uh, Student Organising Committee. You did a fabulous job. Um, so Yingjia, Esmail, Kai, Kevin, Michaela, Martha, Ji Chao and Xing Yu. Let's all clap that. <laughs> Great, and there's uh, a few other people to thank. So we have the administrative staff, the technical staff, and the very important coffee bar staff who've <laughs> chopped up all that fermented curd uh, for you, um, and who've helped the committee. Uh, to the judges of the presentations and the prizes, uh, and then finally to Professor Hong Jun Sun, who is our academic staff lead on that. So maybe a, 
and clap for those those people. Okay, so just before we get on to the prizes, I just wanted to say a, a, just a very short thing about you know what's down the line for Durham Engineering postgraduate researchers PGRs. And there's going to be more of you. We're expecting 20 or 30 to join us in October. And that will be a number that will increase considerably over the next few years. Uh, this is one of our major goals, is to uh, attract and fund properly more postgraduate researchers uh, to build critical mass to make, uh, I think, a, a better uh, community. Postgraduate researchers' community isn't just about numbers. It's also about what we do. But numbers certainly help. So I think you'll see that that's, that will be something that will change those of you who are just starting out with us here. Now, to acknowledge the fact we will have more students, and in fact, we've got more things that we do, like the training courses and the credits and things like that, we uh, will have a new deputy to the mighty Will Coombs, who's our director of postgraduate studies, and we'll have a deputy from October, and this will be uh, Marty Lorette Cabot, um, who will uh, be taking over some of the roles here, particularly um, looking after or being the academic lead for whatever this event turns into in future years. So he has various other focus activities that he's going to be responsible for. We have some other things happening. So Will tells me about the 10-week training course for new PGRs, which is open to all PGRs, which is in Michaelmas term. And we have, the, uh, in Epiphany term, this coming academic year, we have the three-minute thesis competition. So the idea of this is that we get engineers into that university competition, because we think we could you know, swipe us, clear the board, uh, and win everything. Um, but we need to perhaps look at training and some, some prep for that. And as I say, next year's PGR conference, you don't have to call it a PGR conference if you don't want, you could call it George or a research day or whatever you want. Um, <laughs> It's up to you, okay? It's really up to you. The academic lead there is to is, is actually not to lead, but is to sort of nudge and to remind you you need to be doing things and you need to be taking decisions. So there will be another organising committee next year and uh, maybe you need to think about what you'd like to do in advance of that. So that's the end of me. Let's get on to the prizes. I see the prize committee coming down the stairs here. And then people will get to the wine and cheese. Okay. Poster. Okay, shall I do the poster first? Yep. Yeah. Although before you award the actual winner, Charles, I think it's worth just, it was a very difficult decision actually in order to make a decision on the poster in the end. And I think it's worth mentioning Lauren Miller's poster, we thought was outstanding. But the overall winner is Charles? So the overall winner is Ted O'Hare. <laughs> and now Ted is sort of inversely proportional to his second supervisor, who happens to be me. <laughs> so there we go. Ted, is someone taking a photo? We smile. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Well done, Ted. Thank you. Okay, so the next one is uh, the Three Minute Thesis Award, uh, best presentation, and this goes to Lydia Robinson. Again, for the you know the ten-minute presentation, it was a, a very difficult decision, and uh, we agonised over this one for the approximately thirty seconds we were allowed. Um, <laughs> and I think it's worth mentioning, so honourable mention to Giuliano Preti for his presentation um, this afternoon. But the overall winner is is Esmail Masudi. Yeah. Okay, well thank you all, thanks to the organisers, thanks to the audience, thanks to the speakers.
Now sally forth if you wish over the bridge again and uh, take part in your fermented goods. I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.